Let me reset the, the meters up there, change the clock. Oh, that's right. I didn't mute them here. Interesting. nostalgic sound, isn't it? All right, that's enough. All right, now we're added to the clock. Let's, uh, let's hear, it's time to hear some, some deep stories. The ancient lore. I'm gonna throw in some other Doom music though. Uh, 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 uh. Always got to start with this. I like a mechanic in this overlay where I get more bloody as I read lore. So I do have a Doom helmet, which would make this this look perfect. I guess he didn't actually wear his helmet in his, his little portrait down here. But uh, Last subathon, I watched the whole stream and somehow dodged a gift sub. Just got one in the first hour. Yes, yes, yes. Enjoy your, uh, your ad-free viewing. Okay, Doom Endgame, a novel by David Abhugh and Brad Linaweaver. Let's read the back here. Can we get a quick rundown of the story? Well, I'm going to read the, the two very short paragraphs on the back and see if that catches us up. Endgame. They left behind everything that mattered to them. Friends, lovers, country. To journey to the stars. Now Flynn, Fly, Taggart, and Arlene Sanders, USMC, have reached their destination. The homeworld of the demon invaders who destroyed Earth. But there, they find a scene of destruction that rivals any they have already witnessed. And suddenly, Fly and Arlene find themselves face to face with an even deadlier enemy than the nightmares they came to fight. The war for Earth is over, but the battle for the stars has just begun. So yes, the good news is that they basically wrote out most of the plot at the end of the third book. It didn't end in a dumb cliffhanger with Arlene going, I've got it, because that's how every, the two other books ended. The third Doom novel ended with Doom Guy, Flynn Fly Taggart, and Arlene getting on a spaceship to do a, like, borderline FTL flight to the edge of the universe to fight the demons. Um, and that meant that since they were going alone, everyone else was just going to, like, age and die. So they're basically out of the, they're basically out of the story now. So now it's just Flynn, it's Doom Guy, and Arlene flying through space to kill demons. So we, we brought it all back. We started with Doom Guy running around and shooting things and being a weird incel. And now it's Doom Guy and Arlene alone, probably shooting things. Okay. We got a little prologue here. The alien ship was splitting apart. Arlene stared out the porthole, ashen faced. Jesus, fly! She slid her hand along the deck and pointed. I just and pointed, semicolon, I just barely saw a huge piece of the ship below us tumbling end over end, shattering into splinters scores of meters long. The alien ship, strong as it was, was never intended to burn through the atmosphere like this. It was fractured along heat seams, separating into components. Forward, I shouted, nearly blacking out with the effort. It was getting hard to talk. We needed all our breath to bear down, force the blood back into our heads. Thank God we were lying down. Sitting up at six G's, we might have passed out. Forward, I shouted again, starting to crawl. Nav room one. If any component of the ship was to survive the fiery re-entry, it would be that one. Besides, if the section went, there went the navigational controls, and we would all die anyway. Nice. Just right in the action. Ship disintegrating on re-entry. All right, doom. From Pocket Star Books. This is actually like the nicest printing of a Doom novel I've had so far. So I really appreciate this one being good. Yeah, okay. Let's see here. First Pocket Books printing June 1996. Cool. Sale of the book without its cover is unauthorized. Don't worry about that. Did they find the flood? Mm, not yet. All right, chapter one. I think they're going to find it now. 
The ship was 3.7 clicks long and I walked every damned meter of it, trying to find where all the creaks and groans were coming from. I wasn't surprised to hear the haunting noises. I expected nothing less nightmarish from the Fred aliens. Oh yeah, they're called Freds for some reason. I think they got close to explaining it, but then never did. <sighs> Whatever. It's also capital. Capital F, Fred. They came to us as aliens in demonic clothing, playing to every Jungian fear that panicked the human race from deep inside the collective whatever you call it. Arlene would know. Now their ship sounded like it was tearing apart at the seams or like the entire universe was finally winding down. I walked down moist, fungus-infested passageways that were too tall, too narrow, and too damn hot listening to the universe run down. Oh, so they got vagina hallways? Nice. Down and out. Mostly, I walked the ship to keep some sort of tab on Lance Corporal Arlene Sanders, my ghost XO, who was falling apart on me. Nobody goes off the deep end on Sergeant Flynn Taggart, not without my say-so. But there was Arlene, sitting cross-legged on the observation deck, the mess hall, at the stern of the Fred ship, staring at a red-shifted eye of light that was all the stars in the galaxy swirled into one blob. A sort of relativity effect. She sat, unblinking, peering down the corridor of time to Earth today, which was probably Earth 200, which was probably Earth 200 years or more ago. Okay. Christ, but that sounds melancholy. Arlene hadn't changed her uniform in three days, and she was starting to stink up the place. I didn't want to interrupt her grief. She had lost her beloved. In a sense, by the time we hit dirt at Fred World, kicked some Fred ass, and they got them to turn us around back to Earth again, about 200 years would have passed for the mud hoppers. Corporal Albert Gala Galatin. That's such a weird last name. I thought we were done with it, but no, we're not. Cor <laughs> Corporal Albert Gallatin would be a century in his grave. He was as good as dead to her now. Space is a lonely place. Don't let anyone tell you different. The spacefaring surround themselves with friends and squadmates, but it only holds the emptiness of deep space part way off. You can still feel it brushing your mind, probing for a weak point. We tried playing various games to stave off the loneliness. I came up with the favorite, Woe is Me. I th the author must have just discovered new punctuation because this sentence has a semicolon and a colon in it and it ends in an, it ends in an ellipsis. Okay, this entire fucking paragraph is one sentence. We tried playing various games to stave off the loneliness, semicolon. That should be a period. I came up with the favorite, comma, woe is me, colon. We, t we competed to see who could spin the most depressing tale of woe, me or Arlene, dot, dot, dot. Listing in endlessly expanding detail all of the different reasons to just open a hatch and be blown into the interstellar void, period. Ugh. He was like, what? Wait, there's more than colons? There's more than commas and periods? Ooh. We got some deep literature. Oh, we got an M dash too? I always won. M dash. Not, the, not that I had that many more reasons to despair than Arlene, but because I had more practice complaining about things. I left my true love behind, she would pine. At least you had one, I retorted. I, just by the way, I do the dumbest voice for Doom Guy because he's a dumb asshole. Just FYI. It's try I'm trying to go du Duke Nukem, but I'm not as good as John St. John, of course. All I ever had was a fiance, and I'm not sure even. I'm not sure I even knew her middle name. Sears and Roebuck are normally jovial, binary clave pair. Clave is their, is their race, by the way. They're. Uh, they were no help. Semicolon. They locked themselves in their cabin and wouldn't come out. They couldn't even be coaxed out for a game of woe is me. But lately Arlene was winning by default. She was too depressed to play. She just sat and stared out the rear window. The Fred ship was roughly cylindrical, spinning, spinning for a kind of artificial gravity about 0.8 G at the outer skin. In addition, during the first days, we had a heavy acceleration pulling us backward as the ship got up to speed. This was a godsend. I always hated zero G. Always. I always blew. Semicolon. I always got vertigo. Semicolon. 
I never knew which way was up because there was no up. This, this author has got to chill out with this shit. Ugh. I guess I say that a lot. I say that a lot about most things this author writes about. Ugh. All right. It was 3.7 kilometers long and about 0.37 kilometers in diameter, I reckoned. I had some mild dizziness from the spin. My inner ear never really adjusted to that sort of crap, but it was a damned sight better than the floating pukes we rode from Earth to Mars or up to Phobos. For the last 24 hours, I had followed Arlene up and down the ship when she went wandering through blackness and flickering light. The whole place tasted vile. Semicolon. Most of taste is smell, and the stench got back and the stench got on the back of my tongue and stayed there. Arlene probably knew I was there, but she made no attempt to talk to me. Occasionally, I heard weapons fire. Semicolon. I thought she might be shooting up the dead bodies of the Fred aliens. I couldn't believe it. She knew they could still feel... Hold on. I gotta turn off my power saving. My monitors don't flicker. All right. So Arlene's just shooting dead aliens over and over again? Okay. I thought she might be shooting up the dead bodies of the Fred aliens. I couldn't believe it. Semicolon. She knew they could still feel pain. She, she knew they could still feel the pain of the bullets. Then I caught her discharging her shotgun into a man-shaped chalk outline she'd drawn on a bulkhead in a stateroom that once belonged to the ship's engineer. A Fred who was deactivated up on the bridge. What the hell are you doing, A.S.? I demanded. Shooting, she said, staring dully at me. She slid her hands up and down the barrel of her piece, getting gun grease on her palms, but she didn't notice. You're shooting a steel bulkhead, you brain-dead dweeb. Where do you think the bullets are going to go when they bounce off of it? Arlene said nothing. She hadn't been hit by a ricochet yet, but if she kept shooting at steel bulkheads, it was only a matter of moments. Two minutes after I left, I heard the shooting start up again but she denied later that she had fired her rifle again. I returned to the bridge for a long face-to-face -face with the dead Fred captain. They're not like us. Rather, we're not like them or the rest of the intelligent races of the galaxy. A Fred alien and everyone else except a human can never die. Even when you shoot his body to Swiss cheese, so his blue guts and red blood dribble out of the holes onto the deck, his consciousness remains intact. Blow his head apart, and it floats as a ghost, drifting like invisible smoke, still thinking, hearing, and seeing, feeling, and desperately dreaming. You can talk to them. They can actually hear you. The Freds and other races pile their dead in fantastic cenotaph theaters where they are entertained, where they are entertained day and night by elaborate operas and dances of great beauty, all to keep the dead vibrant and interested until such a time as they're needed for revivification. Assuming there's enough left of the body and enough interest on the part of an animate Fred to pay for it. I'd shot the captain nine days ago as he lay back on the floor, reaching up to implement and lock. Reaching up to implement and lock in the pre-programmed course for Fred World. Despite the best efforts of me and Arlene and our contractors. Oh my god. Despite the best efforts of me and Arlene and our contractor advisors Sears and Roebuck, M a clay binary pair who each looked like a cross between Megilla Gorilla and Alley Oop, M dash. So that's in a positive, and a positives are usually set apart with commas, but you can use an M dash, it's just why. Anyway. Yes, Sears and Roebuck, a clay binary pair who each looked like a cross between Magilla Gorilla and Alley Oop, we couldn't figure out how to change course or even shut off the engines. I picked, a, I picked the captain up and set him in the co-pilot's chair. Poetic justice. He had died bravely. Let him see where it was going. Now I stood directly in front of the bastard so his dead eyes could drink me in. God, I wish I could repair your wounds and bring you back to life. I said, so I could kill you all over again and again and again and repeat the process until you told me how to turn off this piece of crap ship around. Or how to turn this piece of crap ship around. But I promise you I'll obliterate your brain before I let you be recaptured and revived by your Fred buddies. 
I blamed the captain for Arlene's psychosis. I would never forgive him. I would never forgive him for it, and I would kill him again if I ever got the chance. Wait, why? What did the captain do? Maybe this will get filled in later. I thought Sears and Roebuck just had a ship, but apparently they're like stowing away on an alien ship that they've commandeered? Or a Fred ship? Uh. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Jesus Christ. Christ, where to jump in on this thing? I never know where to start to bring everyone up to date. Okay, great. Good. These books have a terrible habit of jumping forward and then explaining in reverse what happened. You could just write forward. Like, it, it, it did that in the second book, and then somehow in the third and fourth, it decides to jump forward and then explain in reverse. But it uses unreliable and bad narration to do it, so I'm not sure what the point is. Uh, Sears and Roebuck had locked, locked themselves in their stateroom, the double entity shouting that we were all doomed, game over, pull the plug. God only knew where they picked up the expressions, but the sentiment was pretty clear. When we got to Fred World, the most logical outcome was for us to be burned into a nice warm plasma by the batteries of heavy particle cannons that the Freds obviously had ringing their hellish planet. Ringing. Yes. In a, a, okay, in a ring. Got it. I'm not a big fan of logic. Logic predicted that Arlene and I would be smoked during our last encounter with the Freds. They had everything except the home court advantage, and even that was dicey. The way they could change the architecture of Phobos and Deimos at the drop of a flaming snot ball. That's a weird sentence. Okay. I had to read it like three times. and it. Uh. When this Donnybrook first started... Arlene and I both thought that we were dealing with actual honest to Lucifer demons from hell. They sure looked like demons. We battled the sons of bitches deep, deeper into the Union Aerospace Corporation facilities on Phobos and Deimos, the two moons of Mars. Uh, on Phobos and Deimos, the two moons of Mars. Okay. All the rest of Fox Company, Light Drop Marine Corps infantry were killed and some were reworked into undead zombies. That was the worst, seeing my buddies coming at me, brainless but still clutching at their weaponry. I mowed them down, feeling a little death every time I killed a former friend. Man, Doomguy really is the most tragic, isn't he? But as we faced far more dangerous foes, imps or spinies, as Arlene liked to call them, who hurled flaming balls of mucus, pinkies, two meters of gigantic mouth with a little pair of legs attached, we faced down goat... Oh, semicolon, sorry. Colon, and then semicolon. We faced down ghosts we couldn't see. Minotaur-like hell princes with fireball shooters on their wrists. Dot, dot, dot. Even gigantic one-eyed pumpkins that floated and spat lightning balls at us. But worst of all were the steam demons. Fifteen feet tall with rocket launchers, it was virtually impossible to kill the SOBs. On Earth, we discovered that the Freds were genetically engineering monsters to look and act like human beings until they suddenly opened up on you with machine guns. They had a few failed attempts that were horrific enough. One, a walking skeleton. But the whole mission turned on a fundamental misunderstanding. When last the Freds contacted us, we were at the dividing line between the medieval and renaissance periods, like the late 1400s, and they somehow got the idea we still were. They never realized how fast we evolved socially and technologically. No one else did it that fast. They came screaming in with demonic machines and genetically engineering f and genetically engineered fiends thinking we would fall cowering to our knees and conquest would be swift and brutal. They weren't prepared for a technological society that no longer believed in demons. They weren't ready for the light drop Marine Corps infantry. Semicolon. They weren't prepared for Arlene and me. That is actually the first appropriate and correct use of a semicolon. Good for you. Only the 20th one in six pages. Oh, all right. We triumphed and I got another stripe, but now I was willing to bet a month's leave that we were driving into destruction. No matter how long you, no matter how long your hand, the dice eventually turn against you. At least let me take a few. At least let me take a few dozen of them with me, I prayed. 
But without Arlene, I didn't have much of a chance, let alone much of a reason to go on. Earth was dead to me now. Semicolon. When we got back there, if we got back there, what would be left after three or four centuries? Would there be a United States, a Washington Monument, a United States Marine Corps? For all we knew, the Earth was already a smoking burnt out cinder. Already is a relative term. We found out. By the time we get back, it will have happened a certain number of centuries in the past. Semicolon. That's all I can say. Close parentheses, period. Good God. Stars rolled past the porthole beneath my feet. Actually, it was the ship that rotated, but everything was relative. I followed Arlene as she traversed the ship. She set up her shooting range in the aft cargo hold, a ways outboard or down from the mess hall. 70 meters high and wide and nearly half a kilometer long. I was desperate. I had to snap her out of zombie mode. I had to do something. So just as my redhead Lance Corporal Babe raised her M14, I stepped out of the shadows directly in front of her. It was an incredibly stupid thing to do, but I had no choice. No other way to get her attention. She almost squeezed off a burst anyway because she just plain didn't see me. As Arlene, scree as Arlene squeezed the trigger, she realized the range wasn't clear. She screamed like a woman. Woman is italicized. And there's an exclamation point after it. And then an M dash. Christ. And jerked the barrel to the left. What does that mean? Also, somebody has got to chill this dude out with his punctuation. This is getting... I don't think I've ever seen an itali... Hold on a minute. I don't think I've ever seen an italicized exclamation point followed by an M dash before. Like a woman. What the fuck is an M dash? Oh, it's EM. So it's an emotive dash. It's a longer dash. Most people, when they want to do an M dash, they just hit dash twice. Um, and most... Most text editing programs will swap it for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a handy thing, but as soon as people figure it out, they use it all the time. Because it, like, it feels like a long pause in a sentence, and it's not as, uh, it seems a little more classy than an ellipsis. Jolly Rancher, thanks for the, the ten roses there. Appreciate that. <laughs> yes, virus. 24 hours of Doom Eternal and reading the fourth Doom, Doom novel. Okay. So she just screamed like a woman. Ah! <laughs> the titties! <laughs> no, wait. Uh, menstruation! That's what women scream when they scream like women. Pay gap! A single three round burst escaped anyway. One of the bullets creased my uniform. It felt like she had whipped me across the arm with a correction staff. It hurt like hell. Fly! She screamed, slinging her rifle aside and running up to me. I sank to one knee, holding my arm. It wasn't bleeding bad, but I was knocked off balance by the blow and by the knowledge that Arlene had reacted a... F by the knowledge that had Arlene reacted a fraction of a second slower... I would have been stretched out on the steel deck plates, coughing up my own blood. I mean, he did step in front of her gun right as she was about to shoot. I don't know how that's her fault. Corbidalis, thanks for the sub. And Virus, thank you very much for the, the sub as well. Uh, completely calm now. Arlene Sanders unvelcroed my marine recon jacket and gently slipped it off my arm. When she saw the wound was just a crease and I would recover in a couple of days, she let loose with a string of invective and obscenities that was core to the core. Oh my gosh. So that doesn't work, said out loud. Capital C-O-R-P-S to the C-O-R-E. Core to the core. Got it. They echoed off the black, saw-toothed walls and rattled my brain pan. She shook me viciously by the uniform blouse. You dumbass bastard fly! What the hell were you thinking jumping into the line like that? Don't answer. You weren't thinking. That's the problem. She let me sink back to the deck, suddenly nervous about overstepping the chain. Ah, uh, that's the problem, Sergeant. She lamely corrected. I set up, wiping away the tears on my good sleeve. Arlene, you dumb broad. I was thinking thoughts as deep as the starry void. I was thinking, now how can I finally get that canatotic zombie girl's attention and snap her out of her despair over Albert? 
Jesus fly, is that what this is about? I put my hand I put my hand on my shoulder, massaging the muscle gently through my t-shirt. Lance, I was about ready to hypo you into unconsciousness for a few days to let you work it all out in your dreams. God knows we have enough time. Two hundred years to Fred World, or eight and a half weeks from our point of view. I was just about ready to get out, give up on you. Arlene stared down at the deck, but I wouldn't let up. I finished what I had to say. I can't afford to lose you, A.S. Those binary freaks Sears and Roebuck are a great source of intel and sardonic comments, but they can't fight for crap. I need you with my back, A.S. I need the old Arlene. You've got to come back to me and work your magic. She turned and walked away from me, leaning against the hot bulkhead and swearing under her breath. She couldn't really say anything out loud, not after I'd made a point of dragging her rank into it and called her Lance to drive home the chain of command. But nothing in the UCMJ said she had to like it. J? Whatever. She didn't. She wouldn't speak to me the rest of the day. And all of the next. She took to sulking in the big lantern lit cabin we had dubbed the mess hall. Since that's where we took our meals. Well, used to take them. Semicolon. Sears and Roebuck were still holed up in their own stateroom, cowering in terror at the upcoming brawl with the Freds when we hit the dirt stride. When we hit dirt side, excuse me. When we hit dirt side, semicolon. And Arlene ate anywhere but there, so she wouldn't have to eat with me, semicolon. When I entered, she left by another portal, so I ate alone. Period. Finally. Then when I left to return to duty, staring out the forward video screen, wondering when something would happen, Arlene snuck in and hid away from me. I barely saw her anymore. Hmm. I barely saw her any more often than I had before, but I felt a thousand percent relieved because now she was angry rather than desolate and apathetic. Anger. Now that I have a good... Hmm. Now that I have a good handle on. I'm a Marine, for Christ's sake. What I couldn't understand was despair. Angry, mari hmm. angry Marines don't stay angry for long, especially at their NCOs. Sergeants are buttheads, semicolon. We'd both known that since Paris Island. After a while, Arlene took to haunting the... Mess. Hmm. After a while, Arlene took to haunting the mess hall when I was there, sitting far away. Semicolon. Then she sat at my too tall table, but at the other end. Semicolon. Then she got around to eating across from me. Dot dot dot. But she glared a hell of a lot. It's the shortcut to intelligence. The noble semicolon. I waited patiently and quietly. Eventually, her need for human company battered down her fury at me for risking my life like I did, and she started making snippy comments. I knew I'd won. The best way to start any... Stop being so depressed. There. I won. I won over your depression that you're missing your stupid husband. I knew I'd won when she sat down four days straight after the shooting incident and demanded, All right, Sergeant, now tell me again why you had to do something so bone-sick stupid as to step in front of a live rifle. To piss you off, I answered truthfully. Arlene stared, her mouth hanging open. She had shaved her hair into a high and tight again, and it was so short on top it was almost iridescent orange. Her uniform was freshly laundered. Sears and Roebuck had showed us how to use the Fred washing machines when we took when we first took over the ship two weeks earlier. Okay, so they took over the ship. We're admitting that now. And I swear to God, she had ironed everything. She had been working out too. She looked harder, tighter than she had just a few days earlier. And it just it wasn't just her haircut. Now I was the only one getting soft and flabby. Two days of exercise doesn't do shit. What the f whatever. He's a Marine, he knows. To piss me off? For God's sake, why? A.S. I said, leaning so close we were breathing each other's O2. I don't think you realize how close I came to losing you. Despair is a terrible, terrible mental illness. Semicolon. Apathy is a freaking disease. 
I had to do something so shocking, something to give you such a burst of adrenaline that it would jerk you out of your feedback loop and drag you, kicking and screaming, back to the here and now. I scratched my stubbly chin, feeling myself flush. All right, maybe it was pretty bone sick stupid, but I was desperate. What should I have done? I don't think you know just what you mean to me, old girl. <laughs> old girl? That's like the worst thing. I can't think of a thing to call a woman worse than old girl. It's like the two worst words for an adult woman. What the fuck, man? Oh shit, what's up, Koosh Dracula? Love the channel, Bruce. Yeah, Inside Games is awesome. I'm having a really good time with it. I feel like we've hit a good stride lately, too. We have really good energy on those videos now. Uh, he better die at the end of this book. I really hope. I hope. Yeah, old girl's what you call your Chevy. Yeah. Or like a... Like an old dog? No, oh, come on, old girl. Like a, like a hound that has, like, back hip troubles, so she can't really climb into your car anymore. Like Lady Bird. From uh, King of the Hill. How about sugar tits? I mean, that's like... That's demeaning, but at least it doesn't... Like, it doesn't infantilize, but also... Uh, like, it's... Bo anyway, did I hear Brian was joining on Inside Games? Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's helping out with writing now. And he can... When he has availability, we, we can have him on as a host, too. What I would love to do is just get a roster of, of guests... So we all always have a third person on Inside Games. Yeah, he's got kids. Uh, so, but yeah, he's, he's been helping out with the writing in the past couple of weeks, which, uh, which has, has helped me a lot too. It's given me more time to sort of dial up the script and punch in some more jokes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kush Dracula. Let's see. Where was I? Fucking Christ. Old girl, right. Ugh. She slid up to sit cross-legged on the table, staring around the huge empty mess hall. No officers around and no non-coms non but me. Why not? Fly, she said. I don't think you know just what Albert meant to me. Means, meant. Is he dead or alive now? Probably still alive. It's only been about 20 years or so on Earth. Or will have only been a... God. This author is so infatuated with understanding relativistic time. <sighs> Probably still alive. It's only been about 20 years or so on Earth. Or will have only been by this point when we get back there. Which... <laughs> fucking Christ. There's three M dashes in this paragraph. <laughs> when we get back there. By which point, it'll have been two centuries. It's weird. Semicolon. It's confusing, semicolon. It's not worth worrying about. He's telling her it's not worth worrying about the man that she left behind? Is, oh, fucking Christ. I ate another blue square that tasted somewhat like ravioli, M dash. Crunchy outside and stuffed with worms that tasted half like cheese, half like chocolate cake. It sounds dreadful, but really it's not bad when you get used to it. A lot better than the orange squares and gray dumplings, which tasted like rotten fish. The Fred aliens had truly stomach-turning tastes, by and large. Fly, when I first joined the squad, you remember Gunny Goforth and the William Tell Apple on the head duel? You were my only friend then. I remember the incident. Gunny Sergeant Goforth was just being an asshole because he didn't think women belonged in the Corps. Not the Corps and definitely not the Light Drop Marine Corps Infantry. And no way in the Nine Inches and the Nine Circles of Hell... Not by the living God that made him, living God, G-A-W-D, that made him, was Gunnery Sergeant Harlan E. Goforth ever going to lead some pussy into Fox Company, the machoist fightingest company of the whole macho fighting light drop. I have a feeling the author's about to pat himself on the back for being feminist. Yeah. Nine inches is a little, is a little generous, isn't it? No, nine circles of hell. Whatever. He decreed that no gal could join his company unless she proved herself by letting him shoot an apple off her head. And Arlene did it. She stood there and let him take it off clean. She stood there and let him take it off with a clean shot from a 30 nine 
or a three, a thirty, uh, whatever. A thirty-nine-nine bolt action sniper piece with iron sights yet. Then, with a little malicious sneer on his l fucking Christ. Then, with a little malicious sneer on her lips, she calmly tossed a second apple to go forth and made him wear the fruit while she did the William Tell bit. We all loved it. Semicolon. To his credit, the gunny stood tall and didn't flinch and let her pop it off his dome at 50 meters. After that, what could the grand old man do but welcome her to Fox, however reluctantly? Back in the Fred's mess hall, Arlene continued nibbling at her own blue square. You're still my best and first fly, but Albert was the first man I really loved. Wilhelm Dodd was the first guy to care about me that way. So am I going? But I didn't know what love meant until... Oh, Jesus, that sounds really stupid, doesn't it? I climbed onto the table myself, and we sat back to back. I liked feeling her warmth against me. It was like keeping double watch, looking both ways at once. No. It would have sounded dumb, except I know exactly what you mean. I felt that once, too, young girl in high school, before I joined the Corps. Oh, man. Doom guy has a, a high school sweetheart that he left behind? Oh, we're getting the real Lordell. God damn. I know he ruined it. I know he ruined it. He was like, babe, just let me stick in the tip. And she's like, no, just you slut. Get out of my car. Ugh. And then he tried to shoot fruit off of her head. No, that's not true. He didn't have a car. <laughs> Get off my bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You never told me, Sergeant M Dash. Fly. We got as close as you could in a motor vehicle not built for the purpose. She swore she was being religious about the pill, but she got pregnant anyway. Holy fuck! Oh! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're going to an alien planet. What? Why? Why hold anything back? But okay. Uh, I offered to pay either way, and she chose the abortion. <laughs> After that, well, it just wasn't there anymore. Semicolon. I think they sucked more than the fetus out. To be perfectly grotesque about it. <laughs> they suck. What does he think? Like they just put a plunger over the vagina and turned on a shop vac until they sucked out like a ball of stuff? Excellent. Excellent. <sighs> we stopped pretending to be boyfriend-girlfriend when it just got too painful. And then she and her parents moved away. She just waved goodbye and I nodded. Arlene snorted. That's the longest rap you've ever given me, Fly. Where'd you read it? God's own truth, A.S., really happened just that way. Arlene leaned back against me, while I stared out the aft port at the red-shifted star blob. The mess hall was at the south end of a north-going ship, 1.9 kilometers from the bridge, which was located amidships, surrounded by 100 meters of some weird steel-titanium alloy, and 3.7 kilometers from the engines, all the way forward. Forward. There's like an apostrophe there for some reason. Sitting in the mess hall, we could look directly backward out a huge, thick, plexiglass window while traveling very near the speed of light relative to the stars behind us. It was a fascinating view according to astronomical theory, dash, which I'd had plenty of time to read about since we'd been burning from star to star. M dash. At relativistic speeds, the light actually bends. All the stars forward pressed together into a blue blob at the front, all the ones aft pressed into a lead red lump at the stern. I wasn't sure how fast we were going, but the formula was easy enough to use if I got really interested. See, yeah, this author read like a, a page and a half on interstellar travel and was like, I can make a whole book out of that. Uh, I just had a horrible thought. More horrible than... Remembering your casual abortion? Whatever. We only brought along enough Fred pills to last a couple of days. 
We didn't plan on spending weeks here. Arlene didn't say anything, so I continued. We'll have to find the Fred recombinant machine and figure out how to use it. Maybe Sears and Roebuck know. Fred pills supplied the amino acids and vitamins essential to humans that Fred's lacked in their diet. Without them, we would starve to death, no matter how much Fred food we ate. Fly, she said, off in another world. I'm starting to not care about the Freds anymore. I know why they attacked us. They were terrified of what we represented. Death and an honest-to-God soul. Maybe, and maybe the God of the Israelites is right, huh? Maybe we're the immortal ones, not the rest of them, the ones who can't die. Is she talking about, like, Christian afterlife? Like, going to literal heaven? As a Jew, I'm very confused about what the fuck you just read. Yeah, that's all I can figure. This person has, like, a... It's like skimming a Wikipedia article-level knowledge about all these topics that they're writing about. Anyway. So are you thinking that Albert exists somewhere? Maybe in heaven? I was trying to wrap myself around her problem and not having much luck. She shrugged, semicolon. I felt it roughly. How's that for a sentence? She shrugged, semicolon. I felt it roughly, period. So he himself believed, semicolon. I would never contradict an article of my honey's faith, especially when I don't have any contrary evidence. Translation into English? I've just stopped caring about the Fred aliens, Fly. They're frightened, desperate, and... Pretty pathetic. And they're soulless. I mean, two humans against how many of them? Even when Albert and Jill joined us, we were still just four against a planet full. And we kicked ass. Maybe it's just the Marine in me, but I'm starting to wonder why we're bothering with these dweebs. Oh, Zidonia, no. The, the background gameplay is not mine. It's just a long play from YouTube. Well, we've got about 45 days left to get our heads straight. For what's probably going to be the final curtain for Fly and Arlene. Not to mention poor old Sears and Roebuck. They may be soulless and lousy soldiers, but put enough of them in a room shooting or put enough of them in a room shooting at us, and we're going down, babe. Arlene reached into her breast pocket and pulled out two twelve gauge shells, which she tossed over her shoulder to land perfectly in my lap. I've saved the last two for us, Sarge. Semicolon. Just let me know when you're ready to Hemingway. Ah, Ah! Ah! How... How horrifically tasteless. And that ends the first chapter. Gosh, it just goes, doesn't it? It's just fine, and then it's not. It's utterly not fine. Ah, where did I put that? I had a Chili's gift card that I was using as a bookmark. Oh, there it is. There we go. The Chili's gift card that I won from... Uh from hang time. This is the fourth book, Fully Zour, the final book. Yes, just one chapter. That was actually kind of a long chapter, so. Oh, good way to get started. All right, let's get back to Doom. And just FYI, if you're watching on TikTok, I'm about to close down the TikTok stream. But this is a 20 up to 24 hour Doom Eternal stream. So if you want to keep watching gameplay and book readings, join us on Twitch. Sir Lar on Twitch. And I'll probably be live on TikTok later too. So. Okay. I'm really curious to see how this how this works out. Chapter 2. 45 days is a hell of a long time when we knew we were dropping into a dead zone even for the light drop. Then again, it's not really that long at all, especially when it's probably our entire life expectancy. Arlene snapped out of her despair because she didn't want to spend her last few weeks in self-imposed hell, I guess. She had me, I had her, that's how it was in the beginning, that looked to be how it would end. Except that we had Sears and Roebuck, and that's where everything started to break down. Is he ever going to say why he blamed the captain for Arlene going psychotic? Uh -huh. We're Marines above all, and we're programmed like computers to protect and serve, you understand. 
Oh, uh, Puppy Dog, I am reading the fourth Doom novel. So I'm taking breaks from playing Doom to read the Doom books that came out in like 1995. I've read all of them, so we're up to the fourth one now. Uh, Doom Guy and who is basically Vasquez from Aliens. Uh, a cool hot girl that's not like the other girls because she's a Marine. Um, Arlene. Arlene Sanders. Who like every weird... Like every weird Reaganist dude has this dream of like an alabaster skin, red haired, green eyed girl from the British Isles who like just looks at them and adores them. Uh, it's a weird thing. It happens a lot. I've seen like, I've read a lot of like weird Reagan y books where the, the female lead is always green haired, or sorry, green eyed and red haired. The trad wife? That, yeah, I think it's like part of that. Uh, okay. We're Marines above, above all, and we're programmed like computers to protect and serve, you understand. That means we couldn't just lock and load, stand back to back, and prepare to go down in a hail of Fred fire when the ship cracked down and the cargo doors opened on Fred world. We had this crazy idea that we had to protect those two. That one? Alley oop, Magilla Gorilla lookalike clave. Or at least try. Boy, that sentence probably made no sen sense to anybody. Anybody with a still functioning brain. Step one was to coax it, him, her, or them out of the damned stateroom. We tried the direct approach first. Arlene and I climbed up towards the central axis of the ship. The acceleration decreased to 0.2 G at the level of Sears and Roebuck's quarters, barely enough to avoid my old problems with vertigo. I sure didn't want to go any farther inboard, that was for damn sure. Arlene didn't look bothered, though. Various parts of her anatomy floated pretty free under her uniform. And she looked like she was loving it. Actually, having anti-grav titties might be nice for some ladies. I could see being relieved. I tried not to look at such temptations. M dash. 58 days left. I wanted to spend it with my buddy, not trying to force a relationship that had never existed and never ought to exist. He's totally cool with it. Her breasts breasted boobily, yeah. They tittered tittily. They nipped nipply. I like how every time the author goes out of his way to talk about Arlene's tits, he's like, but I wouldn't do that. I would not, no. I, I respect her too much. Always that check. Make it fine, you see. The upper corridors were like sewer pipes, corrugated and smelly. The Freds breathed slightly different air than we, but it didn't seem poisonous. Sears and Roebuck swore we could breathe the Fred air. Very tall corridors to accommodate the Freds when they were in their seed depositing stage, like gigantic praying mantises. I couldn't reach the roof even by jumping. Arlene and I slipped and slid down the hot, slimy passageway. It took me a few moments to realize that the slime was decomposing leaves from their artichoke heads. You know, said my Lance when I told her my insight. We don't even know whether these bot... Wait. We don't even know whether these are discarded leaves or whether it's the decomposed bodies of the Freds themselves. What happens to their bodies when they die? Do they have to put some preservative on them, like Egyptian mummies, to prevent this from happening? She kicked a pile of glop in which were still visible the ragged frame lines of Fred head leaves. All right. I shook my head. I suppose we can keep an eye on the captain and see if he begins to deteriorate. We figured out that slithering was the easiest way to move along the passageway without falling. It was like ice skating through an oil slick, but we finally made it to the Sears and Roebuck stateroom. Stateroom was an apt description. It was pretty stately. Because they had to accommodate the constantly changing size of the Freds, the rooms were built to monstrous scale, but with a nice mix of furniture styles. My own, next to Arlene's down toward the hole in a heavier acceleration, had a couple of sit kneels, a table that I could only reach by standing and stretching, and a donut-shaped bed couch. I had, that's hyphenated, by the way. Bed couch. All right. Uh, Jed Cougar, thanks for gifting a sub. 
Weird. I had no idea what was inside Sears and Roebuck's quarters because they had not allowed Arlene or me to sneak, to even sneak a peek. I stood outside the door and pounded the pine, as we used to say at Paris Island. Then I thought better of it. Sears and Roebuck had been acting awfully weird lately. I stepped off to one side in case they decided to burn right through the door with a weapon. Silence. After the second pounding, their shared voice came back with a carefully enunciated, Go to away! I have no idea what Sears and Roebuck are supposed to sound like. And I'm not... I didn't think they were going to talk as much in the last book as they did. So I'm going to try to dial back their weird, annoying voices. <sighs> Open up, Sears and Roebuck! shouted Arlene, exasperated after just ten seconds of dealing with their intransignant... Intransigence. Intransignance. Intransigence. There we go. Intransigence. 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 Just because you know a word doesn't mean you have to use it. Anyway. I think the only time I've ever ever heard that word was in a KMFDM song. Ah, oh, thanks. Thanks, Jack Cougar. I appreciate you. <sighs> Jeez. You'd never make it as a therapist, A.S. I followed the flashlight pounded into the head school of psychiatry, she said, and for the first time, it almost sounded as if her heart were in the joke. Go to elsewhere. What are you? I demanded. Afraid of dying? Why? You can't die. During a long pause, I heard furniture being shoved around. Then the door slid open a crack and two heads, one atop the other, pressed two eyes to the crack. We once had our spine broken, they said. They didn't have spines exactly. Their central nervous system ran right down the center from what I had seen in their medical records. But it was actually more easily severed than ours because it wasn't protected by a bone sheath. You recovered as soon as someone found you, Arlene pointed out, right? We lay for 11 days into the jungle on... on it actually says in brackets, unintelligible planet name. It wrote it out in brackets. Okay. We lay for 11 days into the jungle on... The Freds will slay... Jesus. The Freds slay us, will kill us, and display. Put us on for eternity and throw head leaves at us. This robot speaks in broken English, which is really bad because the writer also writes in broken English. Sears and Roebuck still had a hard time with English despite ambassadorial status. Ambassad ambassadorial status. God damn. Come on, SNR. I tried. Get a grip. You don't see me and Arlene cringing. And if we die, we're gone forever. They said something too quickly to catch. Semicolon. It sounded like, wish we could. But it could have been, the less you could. SNR, Arlene and I need your help. We need to make a plan for when we hit dirt side on Fred World. Fred pills, added Arlene into my ear. And we need you to show us how to synthesize enough Fred pills to keep us alive to Fred World. We need about, oh, 270. Sears and Roebuck did a fast calculation. 45 days times two people times three meals per day. You admit we have no plan for to live past landing time. Touche, Arlene admitted under her breath. Crap. What? For now, we need 400. We'll need more, lots more, for surviving on Fred World until we can figure out how to work one of these damn ships and hop it back home. And you need pills too, Sears and Roebuck. The two alley oop faces stared at us for a moment. Then the claves slid open the door with their long limbs which grew like Popeye arms from below their necks. We are doomed inside the cabin as out the side, the cabin. So you may as well enjoy your last days of life with freedom to move around, I urged. After you die, you'll see and hear only what they choose to show you, if anything. Yes, you are the right about that. You must enter. They stepped out of the way like Siamese twins. Ugh. 
and I entered their quarters for the first time, followed by Arlene. The cabin was so amazingly bizarre that I could barely recognize it as being essentially the same in structure as mine. All of the furniture was pushed into a huge snarl in the middle of the room, and every square centimeter of wall space was covered by something. Whether it was an abstract artwork with real 3D effects or a mop head nailed into the wall, it looked like a homicidal maniac's idea of interior design, making the room look like the inside of their disordered minds. What the hell? asked Arlene, staring around at the walls. Sears and Roebuck stood in the center of the room next to the pile of junk, watching us narrowly. The weird part wasn't that they put stuff up on their walls. I confess to the nasty habit of putting the occasional girly pic or Frank's tank action shot on my own walls when I had something to put. Like the phrase girly pic. Uh, does it look like that? It sounds like it looks like that. Those are the walls. It's like brain texture. You talked about it. it's like a mop head nailed to the wall. Sometimes I like to think that uh, whoever, like whoever wrote this, just took random inspiration from Doom, which means they probably wrote in stuff. Like you, it's pretty literal sometimes, but other times I'm like, okay, they're like trying to apply a whole story to this one little game mechanic, which is kind of kind of interesting. Uh, Frank's tank is the member of a male strippers member, really. So Frank's is the only thing that's capitalized in that. Frank's tank action shot. Oh, CD, thanks for gifting five subs. 10% of the way to the next chapter. Look at those subs. He put six though, Jack Cougar. Bonus sub, I like it. Oh, Christ, we're okay. But Sears and Roebuck had covered literally every smidgen of bulkhead as if their terror at the pending landing on Fred World somehow transferred itself to a fear of Battleship Grey, the color of the metal behind the pictures. They figured out how to work the printer in the room and dumped every image they could find to plaster on the bulkheads. Then when they ran out of paper... They started attaching domestic Fred appliances with Stycro. They even turned a table on its side and pressed it against one wall. The overhead was the color of cooling lava, black with red crack highlights, and it didn't seem to bother them. I rather liked it myself, and I wasn't a fan of the wall color, but still. I looked around. Do you, uh, do you all want to talk about this? I tried to sound casual. No, <laughs> said Sears and Roebuck without a trace of emotion. And that was that. They never again referred to the wallpapering. They'd never explained it. And we never found out what the hell they thought they were doing. I think Arlene and I learned something very interesting about alien psychology on day 13 of our trip into Fredland. Semicolon. Now only if we knew what we found out. Okay. Sears and Roebuck came out of their hole without looking back, took a new stateroom, and made no effort to cover the walls. We began rehearsing for our last stand when we would hit dirt side and the doors would slide open. We even knew what doors would open first. Sears and Ro Roebuck went to work on the Fred computer and cracked it, or part of it at least. The sequence display of the mission was unclassified and they displayed it on a 3D projector in the room we had decided to call the bridge, where the captain's body still sat in the co-pilot's chair without decomposing, although his head leaves had ceased to grow, leaving in place the atrocious orange and black Halloween combination that he wore when I killed him. Probably a sign of the emotion of desperate terror. The timeline was precisely detailed. We knew the very moment we would touch dirt, three days earlier than I guessed, and which systems would operate at what moment. The door open sequence began about 75 minutes after touchdown, and the first door to open after safety checks and power down was the aft ventral cargo bay. Semicolon. It would take 11 minutes to grind backward out of the way. Over the next 50 minutes or so, 11 other doors would access por portal... Wait. 11 other doors and access portals would release, and all but two of them would open automatically. We would be boarded by an unholy army of monsters. The only question was whether the Fred captain had gotten a damned message off before we overwhelmed his defenses. Probably. The final combat took nearly an hour. 
Would it have done the Fred any good? Like on the ship? Oh yes. Thank you, White Rabbit. Uh, this is not going to mean much for the VOD. Actually, it might. If you live in the US, please vote. Um, please look over your ballot, research your candidates, see what they... See maybe what they've done in the past and maybe how much they believe in fundamental tenets of democracy and then maybe vote. Actually, definitely vote, but maybe do that other stuff. Maybe vote for candidates that are, are just like fundamentally pro, pro this country's system of government. Just an idea. Just an idea. Ugh, you voted yesterday? Nice. Get that free sticker. Yeah, I, got, I have mail voting, so I got to fill it out and drop it in the mail, but. <laughs> also rank them tallest to shortest. Yes, that's important. We all know that the taller you are, the more God has smiled upon you. Uh, and you want God's favor to be running the country, right? Don't you? It only makes sense. That's what makes sense. Nothing else. <laughs> all right. Back to, uh, back to Doom Guy and Arlene on a mission to kill God. Uh, da, 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 da. yeah, here we go. Talking about all the doors that are going to open. Okay. At first, I thought it would give them 200 years advance notice that we were coming, but Arlene hooted with laughter when I mentioned it. <laughs> uh, what? You think their message travels at infinite speed? What do you think this is? Science fiction? I wrecked my neurons for several minutes. Oh boy, he's going to go into the shit again. Physics was never my strong suit, especially not special relativity. Then I suddenly realized my stupidity. Any message sent by the Fred Captain could only travel at the speed of light. It would take 200 years to reach Fred World. So how much of a head start did it have over us? Uh, 20 years, I guessed. Arlene shook her head emphatically. If our time dilation factor is eight and a half weeks or say 60 days to 200 years passing on Earth and Fred world, the planets are barely moving relative to each other compared to light speed. Then we have to be moving at virtually light speed ourselves relative to both planets. Hang on. She poked at her watch calculator. She has a watch calculator. This dude is dorking out about understanding time dilation and... Arlene is fucking wearing a watch calculator. Doo, 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 doo. Those came back for a minute though, right? I remember like the like the LMFAO days in like the mid 2010s. It was like there was like one year where it was pretty fashionable to wear like a Casio watch calculator. Uh and then and then it's gone. That's about that's about as long as I think the go around deserved. Anyway, Arlene's going to bring it back. Ah. <sighs> Fly, we're making about 99.999996% of light speed relative to Earth or Fred world. At that clip, we would travel 200 light years and arrive only 35 minutes after the message. I jumped to my feet. Arlene, that's fantastic. They wouldn't have any time at all to prepare. Barely half an hour. Maybe they can mobilize a few security forces, but nothing like a... Whoa, whoa, lover boy, slow down. Arlene settled back pulling her feet up on the table, narrowly missing her half-eaten plate of blue squares. If it's actually 61 days subject to time... If it's actually 61 days subjective time instead of 58, or the planets are really 209 light-years apart instead of 200, that half-an-hour figure is completely inaccurate. And much more important, that was assuming we achieved our speed instantly, but we didn't. It took us about three days to ramp up, and it'll take another three days to decelerate. During most of that time, we're going to slow down enough that there's hardly any time dilation effect at all. So, you're saying... So, the Fred should have, what, six days advance notice we're on our way? Uh, basically, yeah. The biggest factor is the acceleration-deceleration time when we're not moving at relativistic speeds. So let's assume they have six days to prepare, I said. That's a hard figure. Hard enough, Fly. I mean, Sergeant. Best we can do in any event. Not entirely sure Sears and Roebuck is giving us good intel on the Fred units me of measurement. Getting a little lightheaded reading this. Hold on. You had a TV watch remote? Damn, Luthbox. Probably never had any time to use it. 
All that pussy you were drowning in. I just realized I can't control my my TV with my phone. The fuck is that? There's got to be TVs must have apps now that are remotes, right? Like smart TVs. Weird. Oh, okay. Are you TCL as a Roku remote app? Okay. What are you, some sort of loser? <laughs> they're usually dog. I figured. I figured they're trash. Smart TVs have the worst software. So I wouldn't expect their apps to be any better. Okay, all right. Ah, uh, where the hell was I? 6 days for the enemy to mobilize wasn't good, but I could live with it. It was a sure of a hell lot better than 2 centuries. I devised a plan. As the senior man present, though Arlene had a few good ideas for booby traps, if the Fred had six days to prepare for our arrival, we had eight weeks. We made good use of the time, practicing a slow, steady retreat down the ship, sealing off segments behind us and activating homemade bombs to wreck the thing. We wouldn't win, of course, not in the long run, but then, as someone once said, the trouble with the long run is that in the long run, everybody's dead. Well, the bastards would pay for every meter. That was my only goal, and the staff, and at the staff meeting, Arlene and even Sears Roebuck regularly agreed with me. I kept us hype by unexpected alarm drills. Sears and Roebuck figured out how to rig the ship's computer to ring various emergency sirens and kill power in different parts of the ship. I did the timing myself, keeping the others on their toesies. Actually wrote out toesies. Toesies. Did you ever think about Doom Guy saying the word toesies? Then Arlene got tired of dancing like a puppet on a chain, and she conspired with Sears and Roebuck to simulate a general catastrophe 101. All the power on the ship dies, except for faint warning horns all the way forward in the engine room. The computer, on a separate circuit, announces the self destruct sequence. Started with 19 minutes until vaporization. Sound effects of a raging hurricane and the enviros blow enough air across me to simulate a massive hull breach somewhere down south. Scared the bejesus out of me. By the time the ship was down to 30 seconds to detonation, I still couldn't find the blessed breach. Or the, yeah. I was reduced to running in circles like a chicken with its head cut off, screaming and shouting like a raging drunk. When I recovered my normal heart rate and respiration, I clapped Arlene in irons for the rest of the trip. No, not really, but I threatened to do so. And had she stopped laughing long enough to hear me, I think she would have been terrified. Sears and Roebuck had a weird sense of humor. They went in for the bizarre practical joke, like somehow attaching sound effects to our weapons. That's pretty funny, actually. Extra V Dreams. Thanks for the prime. I visited our makeshift rifle range, an unused manifest hole with 500 meters of jagged sawtoothed corridor and brightly colored markings at the far end, but every damn round I fired went to its doom with a long piercing scream of HELP! Okay. God only knows where SNR sampled the sound effect. HELP! Just imagining Spool screaming help. That's where it's from. I was stunned when Sears and Roebuck told me and Arlene that the practical joke was the only universal form of humor throughout the galaxy. Not farts? Uh, it was a sad day for me. I had hoped that galactic civilization would have progressed somewhere beyond the emotional level of a 13-year-old. That's the emotional level of this entire book, dog. They're in your universe. Oof. But it brought up an interesting point. Was it possible the Freds were simply playing an elaborate and unfunny practical prank on us when they invaded first Phobos, then Mars, then Earth itself? Maybe they considered the humans who fought back to be a bunch of humorless bastards who couldn't take a joke. No, that's without sane, said Sears and Roebuck. The practicals are unallowed to damagiate the victim or they lose their wisdom. Their wisdom. Sears and Roebuck looked at each other. They put their Popeye-like hands on each other and gently pumped each other back and forth 
A mannerism that Arlene and I had decided during the trip was their way of displaying frustration in our language. What it is, they lose their cleverness. They are in funny, is how you say it. Okay, I get it. Well, joke or not, we didn't like it, and the Freds are going out, and the Freds are going to find out just how much we didn't like it when the cargo door begins to grind open. All right. Four days before landing, the Fred ship began its automatic deceleration. All of a sudden, we had more than a full Earth's. All of a sudden, we had more than a full Earth gravity four ard, once again giving us a weird double heavy vector towards the outer corner of the room. Arlene did some calculations and figured that the ship was actually accelerating at about 96 Gs. That's what it took to decelerate from our velocity relative to Fred World to match orbit in four days. So there must have been the mother of all inertial dampening fields to dissipate that force in the form of heat around the ship. We would probably have appeared star white to an infrared viewer. A big blazing flare warning the Fred of our imminent arrival in case they'd forgotten. All good things must come to an end. The night before we were to land, when we still had not been hailed or attacked en route by the Freds, Arlene spent the night nestled in my arms. It wasn't the first time we'd spent the night in the same bunk stripped to our skivvies. Semicolon. Some people in Fox Company had never believed us that we never had sex. M dash. But it's true. I loved her too much to push for something that she would probably give me. Even though she didn't want to. Just out of friendship. Man, tell me you tell me you've never you've never interacted with a woman in a real adult way without telling me. Fly, we're such good friends that I'll jerk you off. I mean maybe. Why not? It's a bro job. Are you telling me girls can't give dudes bro jobs? Awfully cis of you. Okay. But it's true. Okay. Just out of friendship. But that never stopped us from cuddling up when the crap got too scary or when one of us was hurting from a failed affaire de coeur. This would actually be rad if Arlene weren't a woman. Like, fine. Doom guy's cuddling up to his, like, marine bro. He's like, I'm scared, bro. Bro, I'm scared too. It's okay to be scared. Hold me, bro. Okay, I'll hold you. Only if you hold me, bro. I mean, who's there left to judge? But you know, like, it's one of those where you know. Of course that, that's not what it is. Because it's 1995. Anyway. We held each other tight the night before landing. Arlene's beautiful high and tight pressed hard against my blue shaven chin. As core as we could possibly be for our last day. But still needing the warmth of that one human who made it all worthwhile, even in the end. And believe it or not, we actually slept well. We had no doubts or nagging fears because we knew we were going out in a blaze of Marine Corps glory the next morning. Ah, Medic, thanks for the sub. Didn't think I'd make it, but I had to call off work on homework. Hope the subathon is going great. It's going great. So far, yeah. Been a lot of, uh, a lot of support, and this book is already... This book is already just ramped. It's uh, it's it's bananas. Usually, like, had to wait a little while, but the, even the first chapter had some had some lore megatons. Uh, tomorrow came, nice. Ooh, and Fred World loomed on the forward TV monitor. I really wish you'd stop doing that. Assuming no color correction, it was mostly brown with straight black lines crisscrossing it at odd angles. With no visible continents, water, or weather, but tons of gunk orbiting around it, sparkling in the sunlight every now and again. Jagged red streaks might indicate intense volcanic activity. Oh joy, I said when Arlene suggested the possibility. We should stay on aboard the ship, said Sears and Roebuck, as if we'd rehearsed for anything but for the last eight weeks. Strap down, I commanded. The atmosphere is getting thick enough to measure. 
We might be in for some heavy buffeting, according to the timeline. The Fred computer was no liar. We were shaking around something fierce, and I got seasick almost immediately. I didn't blow, but I sure felt green as Sears and Roebuck looked. Even Arlene wasn't comfortable, and she never gets motion sick. We hadn't bothered to strap down the captain's body, and he was bounced right out of his chair. <laughs> oh well, I'm sure as hell- I sure as hell wasn't about to unstrap to go fetch him. His corpse bucked around the bridge, dropping artichoke leaves in its wake, as if leaving a trail for us to follow. I hope he felt every blow, the worthless bastard, however dead aliens feel anything. Jeez. I love the random animosity that Doom Guy just throws towards... Just casually throws towards randos. All of a sudden, I heard God's own crash of trumpets and drums, and the ship wrenched so abruptly, so violently, that I think I passed out. I blinked back to awareness sometimes later, don't know how long, and immediately felt a head-splitting agony, like some Fred or Fred monster was repeated, repeatedly jamming its claw into my skull. The searing pain only lasted for four or five seconds, and then it was gone. But it was a few heartbeats before color rash... Uh, but it was a few... Damn it. But it was another few heartbeats before color rushed back into my vision. I hadn't even realized I was seeing in black and white until the view colorized again. Oh, see you, Novark. Ooh! Yeah, hopefully you have a good time. Hopefully I see you again after a couple of brews. That reminds me, I gotta stick my brews in the fridge! Alright, hopefully, hopefully after I finish this chapter, I'll stick my brews in the fridge. It's, a, it's gonna be a brew-pounding, doom-playing Saturday. We can, you gotta get spooky. You gotta have some brews. I think I have a couple of beers. Mostly it's gonna be seltzers, because that's, that's, that's what I have sitting around and I kind of want to get rid of them. All right, all right, back to it. Every muscle in my body ached, like two mornings after the world's toughest workout. My stomach lurched. We were at zero G again. What the hell? I looked to my side, where I could see just a portal. The planet loomed below us, barely moving, drifting up slowly to greet us. I didn't hear the engines humming. Were we in free fall? What gave? Arlene and Sears and Roebuck started thrashing around, finally coming around to consciousness again. I had no idea what had happened or how we appeared to be landing without engines. The only ones who might have known were the clave, and they weren't talking. Arlene started looking around, coming to the same conclusions I had a couple of minutes earlier. Semicolon. We looked at... I've, I've been skipping a lot of semicolons, by the way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop doing it, but... I just want you to know they're still there from time to time. Yeah. We looked questions at each other, then I shrugged, and she narrowed her eyes. I didn't care, so as long as we made dirt side, but Arlene would stew over how we landed for days and days until she figured it out. Unless Sears and Roebuck decided to get a whole hell of a lot more garrulous than they had been to date. Unless her serene contemplation were cut short by Fred, Ray's, and machine guns. For the moment, at least, a long moment, we ran silently and at peace, probably our last moment of calm before the firestorm of combat. Then with a groaning thump that sounded as if the entire Fred ship were tearing itself in half along the major axis, we jerked to a stop on some sort of runway. We had arrived on Fred World, shaken but not stirred. Wait, the prologue talked about their ship like splitting up and burning into re-entry. Now they're just there? Well, shouldn't get ahead of the book. Get ahead. <laughs> Quickly, I got my troops unstrapped and we hustled along to our stations just in case the Fred fooled us by cutting their way inside without waiting for the doors to open. Nothing happened, and we waited out the landing sequencer. Then, 75 minutes after landing, and right on schedule, the cargo door began to roll open excruciatingly slowly, making a noise like all the Fred monsters in the world screaming in unison. We braced for the impact of the first shock troops. We waited. Semicolon. We waited. Semicolon. Nothing came. Semicolon. Nothing pounded, rattled, or thumped up the gangway. Period. We sat alone, each in our assigned spots, ready for action that never came. The war never fought. Oh! Alder Irish. Thank you very much for gifting 11 subs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's... Oh, did you get... 
Yes, Jack Cougar nailed it. <laughs> hey, Scribbles. Here. I held my breath as long as I could. Also, yes, I think I heard the news, Scribbles. Congratulations. If I'm if I'm assuming appropriately, if not, that's fine. I said something generic enough that it doesn't matter. It could be congratulations for anything, right? <laughs> uh <laughs> All right, never mind. But uh I waited another 15 minutes querying every 2 minutes. Arlene responded every time with the same combination. Click click click. Huh? Or is it Arlene? I thought with sudden trepidation. I visualized the monsters overwhelming her before she could signal and could signal engagement or fire a shot, subduing her or even killing her. Behind my eyes, I saw a scaly fungoid finger clicking on the mic, repeating the all clear over and over. I gave with a rapid fire series of clicks running through nearly half the Marine Corps signal code. Almost immediately, my correspondent responded with the other half. Either it really was Lance Corporal Arlene Sanders or one hell of a smart Fred Captain. My muscles started to cramp. I stood up cautiously, keeping an ear cocked and an eye trained on the gangway. After stretching, I returned to my position. Many an ambush has been blown by impatience. But after an hour of plenty of nothing, even my patience was exhausted. If I knew they were coming just late, I, would have wait I could have waited a week. But more and more, it began to look like we'd been had. End operation gather at final rendezvous spot. I clicked to my corporal. Ten minutes of quick walking later, we all met in the engine room. Arlene stared at me as if it were all my fault. She kept clenching and relaxing her thumb gun hand. Wait. She kept clenching and relaxing her gun hand, rubbing her fingers against her thumb like she were trying to start a fire the hard way. Okay, buddy boy, sergeant dude, what gives? I shrugged. There's no boarding party. Gee, you think so? If sarcasm could drip, I had... I just had a puddle of it dribbled onto my shoes. Ugh. Ugh. I scratched my chin. It was already starting to get rough. In another few hours, I'd have to shave again. <clears throat> I'd have to shave again. Funny, I thought the last... <sighs> Damn it. Funny, I thought the last time was the last time I'd ever have to do that. You, uh, want a recon? Arlene turned to look back over her shoulder as if she'd heard a noise. I didn't hear anything. Recon? Yeah, recon, that's when you go outside and... I guess we better. We're never gonna sleep again if we don't. I turned to Sears and Roebuck, but they were shaking so hard they were blurry. We'll stay here, they said. We'll be out right. We'll follow you in later time. We'll stay here until you come back, but we'll follow you in later time. I was a little shocked when I realized that they were speaking separately. I had never seen such a thing before among the clave, and... Never even knew it was physically possible. I guess that was their equivalent of multiple personality dis disorder, or in this case, a feedback loop. They could neither advance nor fail to advance. I expected smoke to come out of their ears at any moment, but they disappointed me. Arlene and I found the emergency engine room access panel and laboriously hand-cranked it open. Then we dropped lightly through, landing with a crunch on Fred World. Okay. It's the end of chapter two. End of chapter two, almost halfway to the next chapter already. So thank you all very much for that. All right, they made it. They made it to Alien Prime, except no one cares, I guess. We were almost going to get some action, and then the writer was like, nah. Gotta still have to fill out a whole book, huh? Let's see what happens next. All right. Thank you very much for your support, for supporting the arts. We're into chapter three, this goddamn book. Chapter three, as predicted by the timeline program, the ground and air were quite hot and very humid, but we didn't sink into lava or inhale a lung full of hydrogen cyanide. The ship, which evidently had no name, just a number, was so monstrous that it looked like 
that shopping mall in Tucson, used to be in Tucson, that advertised as the world's largest until the Fred bomb. Is this book written before the Mall of America exit? Anyway, Ains J, thank you for the sub. Best 22 months of my life. Thank you for all your amazing content. Thank you. I'm just glad you enjoy it. I'm glad you get something out of it. I'd be doing this stuff regardless, so. It's just, uh, it's just great that everyone seems to benefit out of this relationship. Anyway, yeah, name dropping a dead mall, but not actually name dropping it. Referencing a dead mall. Jeez. The beast that had carried us a couple hundred light years hulked high above our heads, stretching on out of sight in a genetically sunward direction, or generally sunward direction, shielding us from the terrific heat. Oh, Marzard with VIP or ban. I have added it to the scene. Great. Let's see what we get. Ooh. This is not great. This is not good. Two bands in a row? So sad. Yes. Casey, thank you. This is, it's very sad. Sad is what this is. Marzard, I'm very sorry. I'm so sorry right now. You, sorry. You've watched the stream so much and accumulated so many points. And I have to ban you now. I have to. I'm stealing these seconds now before you're banned. Knowing when the world... Like, this is a time when the world's fair. And as soon as I ban you, which I will do, the world will immediately become non-fair, unfair. So. Ah, all right, that's it. You're banned. <laughs> you're banned now. All right. I probably won't think about this ever again. Uh, all right. Should be 65% ban? No, I'm running out of VIP slots. I think I only have like 20 more or something. It's got a, it's got a really like, yeah, the non-fairest of action, exactly. It's going to get less fair. The less VIP slots I get, it's going to get like down to fractions of a percent at the end. Uh, because I, if I run out, then I have to get rid of it. I can't like... Maybe I could find P like VIPs that haven't been in the stream in three years or something. Maybe they maybe there's a way to do that. Slim Bach, thanks for the sub. When are we gonna get to 99 to 1 percent ratio? Probably the last 10. The last 10 are gonna get real mean. I'm, it's probably like 5 percent for the last 10, and then down to 1 percent for the last five. And then if it's like the last two, then it's gonna have to be like one one hundredth of 1 percent. It's gonna be like it's gonna be stupid gotcha odds. Is VIP for life? As far as I know, you know, is Turbid a VIP? I did not make anyone a VIP that didn't earn it in this. Wait. I don't remember. I don't think. I don't think I, uh. I don't think I handed out VIPs. Just restart the whole thing. Un-VIP everyone. Yeah, I should. I need to look over my founder's badges. Uh, I thought they took it away when they started blasting emails to people. I don't, I guess they restored it and I just wasn't paying attention. Uh, yeah, Turbid's a mod. I did make mod, like in the first month of me streaming a little more regularly, I, I modded like pretty much all of the old Funhouse GTA crew. All right, let's see. Yes, there's a book here. Sure is. Terrific heat. All right. Sideways past the ship were a series of squarish buildings seemingly built on something soft that had collapsed. They all leaned one way or another at crazy angles like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The whole arrangement looked like a demented version of an Earth spaceport. In the other direction was a monstrous condo complex erected roughly like a human graveyard, like headstones arranged in concentric circles. The reddish sky added to the charm of Fred World, its ground that glowed in spots covered with eight centuries or eight centimeters of black ash. There was not a single artichoke head to be seen. A spongy walkway encircled the ship encircled the ship's berth. We cautiously moved onto it, expecting the Fred to come out screaming 
Hmm. Expecting the Fred to come screaming out of the buildings at any moment and fully prepared to instantly retreat to our defensive positions aboard the ship. For the next 11 hours, we searched that damned compound, nearly two-thirds of an 18-hour Fred day. How does he already know how long the hours or the days are? Whatever. We found sludge from decomposing leaves littering half the buildings. Either they liked walking through sludge or a bunch of Fred were slain so suddenly that no one had time to sweep the place. But then where were the corpses? I'm getting a real bad feeling about this. I muttered to Arlene. OJ, dude, a Fred is a demon. A Fred is an alien demon species, like one of the aliens that's invading Earth. They're all Freds. Capital F. I don't know why, and I'm not sure that the book has ever fully explained it. I think the book said that another character called him that, and that's why the book started doing it. I think that's the closest it's ever gotten. <laughs> I could be wrong. There might be like one, there might be like one sentence somewhere. Yeah, these, are, these books are something else, OJ, dude. He's got to roll with it. Oh, we're in ads. We're in ads. That's fine. I'll use this time to drink some water. This is like that weird. I don't think it happens on broadcast sports. Maybe if you're in the arena when like an ad break is happening on live TV. But I always remember watching esports matches and then I would have like the no ad service for any given uh, platform. And so it would just be like just a hold card for 90 seconds. I guess why invest any money in producing content for the part of the show that's showed to people that are not generating any money for you, right? Yeah, short and spicy. You're not getting ads because you're subbed. Um, reminds me, I should plug, plug it more. CK, thanks for gifting five subs. See, that's kind of why I, I think like gifting subs is the way that it's settled on Twitch when it works, because some people unfortunately have been subbed and still been getting ads was that I like the idea of it's like giving somebody no ads for a month. It's a, it's a nice sentiment. I, I think that the pairing of those things is, is nice. Oh, you usually get ads even though you're subbed. Okay, good. Then it's, I think they're erring on the side of like, they're erring a little too far and being paranoid about showing people ads that they're starting to serve ads to people that are subbed. So I don't know. They got to stop that. Uh, Co, JP, and Zeke had a good interview with Twitch Marketing Head. It was a good talk on ads. Okay, I'll have to check that out. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty, um, pretty germane to my interests. Didn't the streamer used to control whether to air ads or not? Yeah, you could turn it off for your channel. No, you can't. The closest you can do is turn off ads for subs, which is what I've done. You've been getting them too? Man, that's bullshit. Bleh, bleh, bleh. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I'll, I'll write to Twitch. I feel like they're just not going to tell me anything. It's going to be like, oh, just tell them to clean your, re-log in, clean your cash cookies. I'm like, oh, God, shut up. Anyway, I apologize, but I try to, I try to uh, take a little break whenever it's ad time. Eight to two. Thank you for, thank you for subbing. No ads on mobile is fucking great. Yeah, I mean, I, I have Twitch Turbo. It's still there. And it's great. It's really good. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Getting a real bad feeling about this. She said nothing. Just tugged on my body armor and pointed back at the ship. After 11 hours, Sears and Roebuck were finally poking their noses out, sniffing the winds to figure out why they were still alive. I was so beat. I didn't even go over and tell them. Let them figure it out on their own. I angrily decided. I'd been on my feet forever, and I wasn't in the mood to deal with them. Arlene was bad enough. As soon as it became obvious there were no Freds anywhere around, hence probably why very few Freds, if any, on the whole planet. Oh, hence probably very few Freds, if any, on the whole planet. Else they would have stormed our ship, even if they were, or even if they had to send for troops. Arlene reslung her weapon of choice, a 12-gauge semi-auto riot gun made by Krupp Remington, the RK-150, with a 150-round drum magazine. That is one sentence. <sighs> she set off in a spiral search pattern to see if she could figure out what the hell happened. I stood in the shade, panting in the burning heat. 
Bread world, at least, at least this part of it, was hot as hell. 54.5 degrees centigrade according to my wrist therm. Sweat poured down my face. The perspiration didn't evaporate in that humidity, especially not under a helmet. I wished I had a standard issue pressure suit with air conditioning, but we hadn't made any plans to stow away aboard a Fred ship, so we didn't think to bring them along. Spacesuits we had, courtesy of Sears and Roebuck, but they didn't help with planetary temperature, I asked. Sears and Roebuck cautiously approached. As usual, they didn't seem the least affected by the heat or anything else. They peered around anxiously. Are they all dead? They asked. I shrugged. Dead or gone, I don't see any bodies. Sanders is doing a sweep. We'll, she we'll see what she says. I poked around a little. What I thought was a condo complex turned out to be a series of interconnected buildings, like the Pueblo Indians used to build in caves up a cliff, but these were built into the natural hollows formed by cracks in the ground. I saw what might have been molded furniture, but nothing of a personal nature. Of course, we didn't have a freaking clue what, if anything, a Fred would consider personal. The buildings were bleached white, like all the color was burned out of them leaving a pockmarked surface like pumice. Arlene's voice jumped at me through my ear receiver. Lie, I think... Wait. Lie, I think you better come over here. I got a live one. Live? I asked, flipping up my dish antenna and homing in on her signal. Standard armor issue, very useful. Oops, I mean a fresh dead body. Maybe we can fix it and revive the bastard, figure out what blew through. What, what? demanded Sears and Roebuck, obviously hearing only my end of the conversation. Come on, boys, I said, setting off at a trot. Need your magic over here. I jogged across the compound, turning as necessary to keep the beeps loud and fast. I found Arlene in two minutes, just half a click distant as the fly flies. Ugh. She was gr crouching over a collapse of pumice stone, out of which stuck one part of a Fred hand and foot. Evidently, it had been unlucky enough to be caught in a building when it fell, thus not getting out in time to be disintegrated or kidnapped or whatever happened to the rest. Alas, the head was crushed to a pulp. Damn, I griped. Even if we can somehow revive its body, it can't tell us anything if its brain is destroyed. Sears and Roebuck knelt to examine the body. The brain appears intact. They said, poking at the chest. Duh. I mentally kicked my butt. Semicolon. I knew they didn't keep their brains in their heads, but it was hard to remember. Clave didn't either, as I recalled. Can you fix it? Asked Arlene. It'd be icy to know what the hell happened. It'd be icy? Yes. Grislamic bearerism. Their name... Because there are two, but they talk like in unison. Or they alternate words or something. Their names are Sears and Roebuck. Yes, that is correct. It's some weird alien dude. And he's like really slow. He, he kind of reminds, like, I think conceptually he's supposed to be like the Ents from Lord of the Rings. How they like, they have really long lifespans so they do everything really slow. That's, humans are the only thing that die in this entire universe, according to the Doom novels. Nothing else ever dies. So they don't like move very fast. They don't innovate very fast. So they like their sense of time is, is pretty stretched. According to our human time scale. Just so you know, you know, just so you know the lore. I don't want anyone confused by the doom novels here. We all have to be on board for all of this. <sighs> okay. Okay. It'd be icy to know what the hell happened. Sears and Roebuck held the body down and drew a cutting laser, casually slicing away the head, legs, and arms. I nearly lost my lunch. The clave were pretty cold from our point of view. Even so, carving up a dead body just for laziness to avoid hefting heavy stones off the limbs, that was a bit much. Saracen's Lament, thanks for the sub. They dragged the torso out of the rubble, knocking over a few stray stones with it. I winced with sympathy, even dead. I knew I could feel the pain of every blow. 
With the body tucked underneath their arms, Sears and Roebuck humped back towards the Fred ship, Arlene and me forming a goddamned parade behind the macabre clave pair. What a phrase. The Freds didn't divide their ship into separate departments as humans do. They used something more like an old object-oriented approach to spaceship organization. Different sections, like different countries, each had their own essential services. Food, water, navigation engines, and medical equipment. God only knows how they divvied up the workload. Maybe they fought for it. But Sears and Roebuck wandered around with the Fred body until they found a batch of machines that they claimed were Medgrams. Tossed the torso inside and began poking blue and red buttons on a control panel. Like into a cylinder, just dunk it in there. A couple of hours later, I watched, but Arlene went to sleep on one of the beds. The torso was flopping around, trying to move its non-existent arms, legs, and head. Great, I said. But now what? It has no mouth. How can it tell us anything? Oh, Coder, said Sears and Roebuck, speaking for the first time since finding the body. They clipped a few more leads onto the chest of the Fred, palmed the touch plate, and a mechanical voice sounded through the speakers. Okay, hold on, actually. We gotta do this right. That's perfect, all right. I don't know if, do I have to type this in all caps? Maybe not. Okay, we got it. That was it, by the way. I can see. Can I make it louder? We'll go. We'll go one more time. Sears and Roebuck turned it off. They fiddled with the settings and played it again, this time all in a weird language that made my teeth ache. Presumably Sears and Roebuck, Roebuck's own language. Oh, almost. Oh, it's 420 somewhere. Crap. Um, hold on a minute. I'm turning this thing off. All right, a headphone warning. Oh. Is there really no Bert? It's not Bert anymore. Maybe my uh Ooh, there we go. Yeah, I know, Nick. It's fun to be coy though. I'm a little disappointed you didn't do the soul stream in a sonic costume. I have a red velour bodysuit that I'm gonna put on later. It'll make me look like cool Satan. Uh, okay. Arlene had jerked awake at the first noise. She stared wildly, trying to cold boot her brain and figure out who was shouting. Pretty impressive, I said. How did it know English? Sears and Roebuck st stared at me as if I were a particularly slow child. Why, you and Arlene have been talk around English for eight weeks now. What? You did think that CompuNets were doing. I got a creepy feeling in my gut, like a couple of poisonous centipedes had got loose in there. You mean that thing has been listening to every word we say? Jesus. Arlene looked around nervously. Has it been watching us too? Sometimes. Even when during my private moments? In the bathhouse? Sometimes, admitted Sears and Roebuck adding nonchalantly, 
We spent time observing you two, too. We are curious how you mates, if you will demonstrate use of your mate apparatus. Uh, man. It's got to go there all the time, doesn't it? Yeah, Paul, that's that's the point. My Doom guy. I am trying to sound a little bit like Duke Nukem. But, uh... I'm not as good as Duke Nukem, obviously. But that's okay. A bad imitation can just be a different voice. Arlene turned as red as a radish. Semicolon. I'm not kidding. For years in the light drop, she had showered around men, used the toilet or the ground in front of men, and even had sex with Dodd in front of the guys when she got drunk once. Ugh, fucking Christ. And here she was flushing fire engine red at the thought of an alien and a computer having seen her naked. I couldn't help laughing and she glared M14 rounds at me. Need to find tuning, muttered Sears and Roebuck, fooling with the buttons. I stared, reminded of about a thousand and one cheesy sci-fi movies that Arlene regularly made me watch while she gave running commentary about which star's sister was the mistress of the head of Wildebeest Studios. Jeez, it's Dr. Mabius, whispered Arlene in my ear. What? Try question them now, suggested Sears and Roebuck, pretending for their own peace of mind that they were really two Fred aliens instead of one. As a double entity, Sears and Roebuck never had been able to deal with beings other than in pairs, pairs of pairs, and so forth. They had no trouble dealing with Fly and Arlene, but when it was Fly and Arlene and Captain Hidalgo, Sears and Roebuck threw a fit. I cleared my throat. State your name for the record. I began, just trying to provoke some response from the Fred. Oh, hold on a minute. This is going to be a little difficult to transcribe, but I will try. Okay. That's, yeah, it's... Hold on, one more time. I will be Rama Kapith Duraga Naz Difler Rama Kanor. Got it. <laughs> God fucking Christ. You will henceforth be designated Rumple Stillskin, I decided. Damned if I were going to try to repeat that horrible squabble of sound. <laughs> Rumpel Stillskin, I am Taggart. You may also be questioned by Sanders and by Sears and Roebuck. You will answer all questions, or will leave you immobile on the planet's surface forever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow this down, I think. I think it's going too fast. Slow. That's pretty good. Okay. You'll be disintegrated. You'll be disintegrated and your spirit will be sent wherever it goes upon disintegration. What if he answers questions from the Taggart? I don't... No, isn't that good? I don't understand that exchange at all. Like, not at all. Whatever. I'm gonna go very slow for this one. That's exactly what it's saying. Rumple, bumple, mumple, humple. Hold on. Just in case y'all think I'm making this up.
Do you accept the terms? Hold on. That's the next line. I sighed. I had to keep reminding myself we were peering directly into the brains of a Fred. A Fred that had lain dead for God knows how long, slowly going mad. In fact, that was a good first question. Rumpelstiltskin, how long have you lain beneath the rubble? Rumpelstiltskin will answer the question. A lot of sons. Arlene tapped at her watch calculator again. This planet rotates 412 times per orbit, so that's 47 Fred years plus 28 Fred days. What's that in dog years? I asked. For us, that's about 40 years, six months. Jesus. Rumpelstiltskin, were your people attacked 19,000 sons ago? I don't know. Who attacked you? Was it a new species? Rumpelstiltskin, how did you meet your attacker? Fun. I closed my eyes, sorting through the Fred's tangled speech. Arlene whispered into her throat, Mike, so I heard her al mm. so I alone heard her speculation. Why? Think they found a new species on its own planet? And somehow it ended up attacking and destroying the Fred home planet? I grunted to affirm. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> that was what I had figured out from the yammering. But there were some real problems here. Sears and Roebuck made it pretty clear that most species took millions of years to get from civilization to spaceflight. Humans were such an exception that we, were, that we caught the Fred by surprise. They first discovered us about four or five hundred years ago, while Spain and Portugal were still sailing out in wooden wind-driven ships to map the New World. The Fred confidently assumed that we were tens of thousands of years away from being able to offer any effective resistance. They didn't like us. They feared us because we, of all the intelligent races known in the galaxy, could die. They decided to exterminate us. Another move in the Magenia long chess match for control of the galaxy. Wow, they're throwing back to this. Okay. The, like, philosophical difference that has led to a galactic war. Yeah. This is, like, kind of the more heady part of the book, which I actually don't mind. It's kind of, it's, it's like, borderline interesting. <clears throat> in the battle between the hyper-realists and the deconstructionists, we played the role of Kafiristan, the poor, unsophisticated farmer in whose backyard a minor skirmish is fought. Yeah, 
Kafiristan, reference to the first book. Where Fly bravely refused to gun down a bunch of civilians in not Vietnam. Hyperrealists, deconstructionists. The terms were courtesy Sears and Roebuck, who searched long and hard through Earth philosophy and decided that wacko, effeminate, limp-wristed literary critics in New York were the finest, most refined philosophers of the bunch. What a kick in the nuts! This great grand political war between two mighty empires turned on a doctrinal difference of aesthetics between two competing schools of literary criticism. Billions of lives hung in the balance between one dumbass way of dissecting 11 fragment stories and another, both of which missed the point entirely, of course. That much Sears and Roebuck told us, but no more. I had no idea what the hell that meant. 11 story fragments? But try telling S and R that. So, I think it's actually kind of a fun, fun idea of like, when people are immortal, what, how does their value system change? Well, I think we're already seeing like an overinvestment in the meaning and value of, of culture and especially pop culture. Maybe it's always been there. Maybe it's always been like that. When people are eternal, you mean? Yes, that is what I mean. If people could watch MCU movies forever, would they start, would they start wars about how to interpret them? His species, the Clave, were members of the hyper-realist Tong. The evil Freds represented the slimy, dishonorable, deconstructionist Tong. Someday, somehow, I was going to beat those sons of bitches Sears and Roebuck into explaining the whole damn thing to me. In the meanwhile, I just shrugged and thanked God we weren't... I just shrugged and thanked God we were soldiers and didn't have to understand politics in order to follow orders. Anyway, the Freds miscalculated catastrophically. When they returned to Fred World, raised an invasion force, taking about a century to do so, then returned... A mere half a millennium had passed, but to the Fred's shock, they found not a plan planet full of ignorant, superstitious farmers and sailors, but a technologically advanced planet-wide culture with missiles, nuclear weapons, particle beams, spaceflight, and a brain trust unfrightened by horn and fang, scale and claw. Even after Arlene and I kicked their asses when we left Earth, humanity was on the ropes, just like the old heavyweight Muhammad Ali. We played rope-a-dope with the demons, and if Salt Lake City and Chicago were nuclear wastelands, so were the Fred bases on Phobos and Deimos. That's not what rope-a-dope is, by the way. That's not what rope-a-dope is at all. <laughs> rope-a-dope is pretending to lose so that your opponent burns a lot of energy trying to, trying to beat you, and then once they're tired, you reveal that you've been fucking with them. That's the rope-a-dope. That was what, Ali and Foreman, I think? Anyway, mutual destruction, something else. Okay. Worse, the last remnants of Fox Company, not only me and Arlene, but Albert and our teenage hacker Jill, had managed to rescue the former human, now cyborg, Ken Estes. They're just recapping the... Oh, whatever. Which gave us the potential to tap into the Fred's entire technology base. The Freds were genetically engineering human infiltrators, but we were training... Ugh. Einsatzgruppen? Oh, come on, bro. Bro, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Google this, and if that, that is some Nazi fucking shit. <sighs> yeah. Einsatzgruppen were Schutzstaffel paramilitary death squads of Nazi Germany that were responsible for mass murder primarily by shooting during World War II. Oh, okay. That goes into bad, bad territory. Fuck that. God, this fucking writer, man. Yeah, that's just delightful. That's just good. That's good stuff. Always tasteful. He just, he talked about vacuuming out a baby, and now... <laughs> He's comparing himself to Nazi death squads. Good shit. God only knew what was going to happen since we left Earth, r Earth right at the exciting part. Or what had happened already, actually. I had to bear in mind 
that by the time we could return to the mother planet, 400 years would have passed. The Freds made a critical miscalculation when they assumed humans evolved at the same rate as everybody else in the galaxy. Was it possible they made the same mistake again, this time to far more disastrous consequence? Oh, excuse me. Time to get a bit more specific with the Rumpelstiltskin. Or with Rumpelstiltskin. All right. More good. Great. More dialogue. When you found the newbies, what was their technological level? Were they industrial or agricultural? Rumpelstiltskin will answer. Were the newbies technological? Herded? Harvesting? Nomads? Farmers just discovering animal husbandry? I prodded the undead Fred for another half hour, eliciting little other information. The best I could tell was that the newbies had evidently just discovered, agri <clears throat> just discovered agriculture and ranching. They were just... <clears throat> <clears throat> agriculture and ranching. They were just settling down from their nomadic life when the Fred's scout ship observed and studied them. They made contact with the newbies and fought a few skirmishes, just probing them. <clears throat> Sorry. The Freds returned to Fred World. This was probably 300 or more years back, just around the time the first Fred expedition returned from contact with Earth. The Freds horsed around for a while, not long. Then they returned to the newbie system just a couple of hundred years after they left only to find that the newbies had gone from the beginnings of agriculture to a heavily armed spacefaring culture in just two centuries. <clears throat> and that's where Rumpelstiltskin started to get hazy. The rest of the interrogation was long, tedious, boring, tedious, dull, and tedious. Even Sears and Roebuck lost interest and started monkeying with the navigational system, which was unlocked now that we'd reached the pre-programmed destination. I figured Sears and Roebuck had never got or had never interrogated a prisoner before. It's not a process for the impatient. I got a story, but I had no idea whether I got the story. This is what Arlene finally, or this is what I finally dragged out of the old rump, with me and Arlene making a lot of intuitive leaps and filling in the background as best we could. When the Freds arrived at the newbie planet, ready to take the empty square in the giant chess game between the hyperrealists and the deconstructionists, they discovered a weird unknown piece on the board. The newbies must have accelerated evolution that is as fast compared to us humans as we are compared to the rest of the galaxy. The newbies were so stellar that they tore through the Fred fleet like a cat through a fleet of canaries. Yeah. And then, this was the part neither I nor Arlene really bought, though it was such a lovely thought it was hard to resist. The newbies backtracked the Freds and invaded the Fred world itself, utterly annihilating it in revenge for trying to conquer the newbies. What a delightful picture. The Freds in a panic, desperately defending their homeworld against an unknown foe who had been herding sheep and building twig and wattle huts just two subjective centuries before. Arlene and I laughed long and loud at that one. Sears and Roebuck must have thought we were loons since the clave have nothing remotely like a sense of humor defense mechanism. They just look at each other. The last part of the story I got was the creepiest. Rubble Stillskin insisted over and over that those damned nasty newbies were still here. But where? And thus since chapter three of this stupid book.
Why am I reading it again? It's a different book. There's four different novels. So we're still moving through the Doom literary universe. God damn it. All right. Chapter four. Sears and Roebuck begin yanking their heads back and forth again, expressing some sort of emotion only a clave could understand. What are you on about? I demanded, still stewing about the missing newbies. We have faxed the engines, declared our compatriot. To where would you like you to go? So, I hate making this correction, but it's not engine. It's, it's actually like a... It's a slur, right? It's like a it's Tom Sawyer slang for Indian. Which is, uh, itself not so great. So, thanks. Thanks, Clave. Another hour had passed, and neither Arlene nor I had gotten another intelligible word out of Rumpelstiltskin. What do you think? I asked Arlene. Has he filled, fulfilled his part of the bargain? She pursed her lips. I can't think of anything else to ask. We've hit a brick wall in every direction now. Arlene inhaled deeply, then swallowed a nutrient pill. Yeah, Fly, I guess he's done what he agreed. Are you gonna burn him? I shrugged. I promised. Deal's a deal. Gingerly, I reached across and pulled all the connections from the torso of the Fred. I looked across at Sears and Roebuck, but they had completely lost interest, their long arms reaching all around the Fred navigational unit, the one in this district of the ship, and disconnecting and reconnecting fiber optic cables. You, uh, know where there's a Fred Ray? The Fred Ray was the last-ditch weapon that they had used against us when we rampaged through their base and later their ship. It was some sort of particle beam weapon, much better than ours. Arlene had inventoried the weapons of the Fred ship, including 74 Fred Rays. She took me to the nearest one, leaving me to drag the torso behind. Turning my head away, praying to avoid vomiting and completely humiliating myself in front of my friend and subordinate... I balanced the torso on a neutron repellent backdrop, the only thing that would stop the beam. The body fell over, and I set it up again. Then I stepped back and cranked the weapon around to point at the Fred's chest, where it stored its brain. Man, I don't like doing this, I muttered. Why, he's been trapped, dead, underneath that rubble for 40 years. One eye was open, remember? So... So for four decades, Sergeant, Rumpel Stilskin stared unblinking at the ground or the sky or the sun, knowing his entire species had been wiped out in the wink of an eye by an alien race they were going to enslave. Well, he suffered enough. Don't trap him inside that corporeal bottle. Gick Rhymes. Thank you for the sub. A good day to sub. And yes, Chaim is, is reminding us that it's nearly 420 somewhere. I guess this would be Hawaii? What's west of Pacific time? I don't know. My hands started shaking as I inserted a jerry-rigged pair of chopsticks into the holes to press the levers, simulating a Fred hand. Oh, Alaskan and Hawaii time. All right. Word up, Alaska and Hawaii. Shoutouts. Shoutouts to Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, Arlene put her hand on my shoulder. You want I should do it? I shook my head firmly. No, A.S., didn't you read Old Yeller when you were a little girl? No, I was too busy reading Voyage to the Mushroom Planet and The Star Beast. When your dog has to die, Arlene, you've got to shoot him yourself. You can't get someone else to shoot Old Yeller for you. I pressed the lever, completing the connection. As usual, we saw nothing. That was the part that bothered me most. As destructive as this neutron beam was, you'd think you'd see something, for God's sake. A blue light? A lightning bolt? Fire and brimstone? Something. But the beam was as invisible as x-rays in the dentist's office, and as quiet. All I heard was a single click, and suddenly there was a huge hole through Rumpelstiltskin's chest. Within three or four seconds, its body was boiling, the flesh vaporizing instantly wherever the beam touched. I slowly burned away the entire torso. 
The Fred Ray was a gigantic eraser. Everywhere I pointed, flesh simply vanished. A minute after turning on the beam, I clicked it off. Nothing remained of the Fred but an invisible mist of organic molecules and a hot ionized plasma state. My guess was the interrogation was pretty permanently over. Okay, kiddo, I said to A.S. Let's go newbie hunting. We suited up for combat, and for the first time in God knows how long, I found myself getting the shakes. Somehow I thought the Freds would have burned all the fear out of me, leaving nothing but a cold husk of sociopathy. Not true. At the thought of going up against whatever it was that plowed the Freds into the dirt on their home turf, my hands trembled so much I couldn't even sty crow my boots tight. Stay here and keep the engine running, I told Sears and Roebuck. You want to start me the engines? They asked, confused. Just a figure of speech, you doofoids, Arlene explained. D-U-F-O-I-D-S. Doofoid. Cool. Better run through the launch sequence up to just before engines start. We may have to book it if we stumble onto a whole nest of them. Sears and Roebuck looked at each other, alley -oop and his mirror image. They seemed perfectly content staying aboard the ship and letting the marines do the dirty work. I sealed up the helmet and pressed the other seal, uh, the other armor seals tight. It wasn't a pressure suit, but in a pinch, we could survive a few minutes in hard vacuum. I noticed Arlene's face was whiter than its usual English pale. She must have figured out, or she must have figured the odds the same as I. Fucking knew it, man. British Isles. Hey Enzo, I'm doing pretty good. I'm reading some, uh, some fine literature here and having a great time. My breath sounded loud in my ears as we edged down the gangway onto the surface of Fred World again. The landscape looked eerily alive through the night viz flip downs, tinted green, but combining infrared radio emission and visible light enhancement. I turned slowly with a microwave motion detector. Nothing moved around us unless it was over the jagged mountains on the horizon. This isn't good, I said over a shielded, encrypted channel to Arlene. Shouldn't there be some life, even if the newbies killed all the Freds? Maybe they couldn't tell which were Freds and which were the animals, so they fragged everything. Maybe they used a nuclear bomb or some kind of poison or a biovector. I grunted. Ugh. Doesn't seem likely they'd manage to get absolutely every living thing, does it? There's another possibility, Fly. Maybe there are living animals, but they're just not moving. Animal means moving, Arlene, like animated. She didn't answer, so I started a spiral sweep, mainly watching the outer perimeter. After three hours of retcon, I was starting to regret being so nice and burning Rumpelstiltskin's mortal coil, setting free his soul. If that bastard lied to me. Yo, what? Came Arlene's radio voice in my ear. Resurrect him and kill him again? Maybe we should resurrect the Freds on the ship. Whoops, don't correct me. I just figured out how stupid that suggestion was. I managed to catch her while she was inhaling, or else she would have quickly snorted that the Freds on the ship knew even less about the newbies than we. We had already killed them before we left for Fred World, 160 years before the newbies landed. I, I don't... Sometimes sentences in this book just make me lightheaded. Ah. All right, let me I put on Doom 2016 soundtrack. Very good. Uh <laughs> The weirdness of the place was starting to get to me. I kept seeing ghosts in my peripheral vision, but there was nothing when I whipped around with a motion detector. Damn that Rumpelstiltskin, he swore they were still here. Maybe he just meant they were here when he died. I paused a long time. Arlene, if that's all he meant, then we're in deep, deep trouble. I don't think you realize how deep. I don't get you. If we can't find them, we'd jump back in the ship and return to, to Earth. She didn't say it, but I know she was thinking to a dead, loveless Earth. With no Albert Gallatin. A.S. If we don't find the newbies, I can almost guarantee they're gonna find us. 
They'll find Earth. We were almost wiped out by the Freds. We barely hung on. And only because we evolved so much faster than they. We were so much more flexible. Because they underestimated us. What the hell do you think would happen to humanity if the newbies found us next? Jesus, I didn't think. And if they can go from stone plows and oxen to, to this in just 200 years, where are they going to be just 10 years from now? What if they don't find us for 50 or 100 years, Jesus, and marry our lead? They would be gods. She was silent. I heard only my own breath. I almost considered asking her to switch to hot mic so I could hear her breathing as well. But I couldn't afford to lose control now, not when I had troops depending on me. Above all else, I had to demonstrate competence and confidence. Are they really called the newbies? Yes, except it's N-E-W. N-E-W-B-I-E-S. Not N-O-O-B. That's too lead speak. Fly, she said at last. I don't like this. I'm getting scared. She wrapped her arms around her chest and shivered, as if feeling a chill wind or someone walking across her grave. Yes, it's finally getting spooky. Maybe we can pick up some trays from orbit. After 40 years? Maybe Sears and Roebuck has some idea. Yeah, right. Sears and Roebuck never even heard of the newbies until just now. And if they had... A and if they had that hard a time understanding us and our evolutionary rate, geez, how could they even imagine the newbies and what they might mutate into? Let's head back. I decided... We're not doing anything out here but scaring the pants off of each other. Arlene nodded gravely. Kinky, she judged. Ugh. When was this novel published? 96. 1996. I heard a strange, faint buzz in my earpiece as we headed back towards the ship. Sounds. Voices, almost. I could nearly believe they were whispers from the Fred ghosts, desperately trying to communicate perhaps still fighting the final battle that had destroyed them. I was now convinced that there was not a single artichoke-headed Fred left intact on that planet, except for the corpses we brought with us, corpses we would never revive. In fact, I decided to leave them behind on Fred World. Semicolon. The temptation to wake the dead, just for someone to talk to, might be too great, overwhelming our common sense and self-preservation. But the notion of ghosts wasn't that far-fetched. Since their spirits never died, where did they go? I began to feel little stabs of cold on the back of my neck, icy fingers poking and prodding me. Jesus, shut off that imagination, I commanded myself. Huh? Arlena asked, jumping guiltily. Criminy, Fly, are you a mind reader now? Criminy. I said nothing. Hadn't even been aware I spoke that last thought out loud. Curious coincidence that it turned out to be perfectly appropriate. The ship was so huge that it was hard to recognize it as mobile. It looked like an artificial mountain, three-eighths of a kilometer high, over a hundred stories, taller than the Hyundai building in Nuevo Angeles. Huh? And stretching to the vanishing point in either direction. The landing pad was barely larger than the footprint of the ship, clearly built to order. Weird markings surrounded the LZ, the landing zone, burned into the glass-hard surface by an etching laser. Either landing instructions or ritual hieroglyphs. They looked like they once had been pictograms, now stylized beyond recognition. Is he talking about the ship that they're in? Yes, three-eighths of a kilometer high. That's what he said. The most American division of a metric unit? <laughs> uh, say half, whatever. You know, Fly, we've never actually walked around... We, you know, Fly, we've never actually walked all the way around this puppy. I know, I've been avoiding it. I don't like thinking of how big this damn ship really is. Arlene sounded pensive, even through the radio. Honey, Sergeant, I've had this burning feeling. Try penicillin. Yeah. God, why did she call him honey? Please don't tell me she's getting horny. I don't want that. 
I can't wait for Fly to turn her down. It's going to be the author's true revenge against all the women that never had sex with him. This is super cool. Totally elite, rad, military man protagonist is not going to dick down this, this poor girl. Anyway. I've had this burning feeling that we have to walk this path. Walk all the way around what's going to be our world for the next nine weeks. However long it takes us until we finally get home. I stared back and forth between the obsidian LZ and the ship door, torn. You're right, I sighed. We ought to reconnoiter. Arlene, take point. Aye, aye, Skipper, she said, voice containing an odd mixture of elation and anxiety. She unslung her RK-150 and I flexed my grip on the old reliable standard, the Marine Issue M14, which contrary to the design or to the designator was more like an updated Browning automatic rifle than the Micronic series of M7, 8, 10, and 12. These were heavy lifting small arms and the Freds were pretty pathetic when not surrounded by their demonic war machines. I don't know what we expected to run into on Fred World. Nothing good, I suspected. I thought about calling Sears and Roebuck and telling them what we were doing, but we were, but we were right outside. If they wanted us, they could call their own damn selves. Still feeling that chill on the nape of my neck, I followed Arlene at a safe 25 meters. It was not hard to be awestruck next to that ship. It was hard to credit. The Freds could do this, and they couldn't even conquer a low-tech race like humanity. They always taught us at Paris Island that heart and morale mattered more than tanks and air support in combat. Look at the mu Mujahideen in Afghanistan and Bosnia, at the Scythe of Glory in Kafiristan. You fucking watched Rambo 3, that son of a bitch. God damn it. But this was the first time I really believed that line. We really wanted the fight, and the Freds were unprepared for resistance. The ship was gunmetal gray along most of its flank, except where micro meteorite micrometeorites had scored the surface or punctured it. Thank God for self-sealing architecture. At the speeds we traversed the galaxy, cosmic dust sprayed through the ship like bullets through cheese. We reached the aft end and stared up at the single, staggeringly huge thruster. The ship was a ramjet, according to the specs. As it moved at increasing velocity relative to the interstellar hydrogen? Yeah? The ship was a ramjet, according to the specs. As it moved at increasing velocity relative to the interstellar hydrogen, an electromagnetic net spread out in front of the boat, scooping up protons and alpha particles, scoop, I don't know, scoop, and funneling them into the jets, where the heat from direct conversion of matter to energy turned the hydrogen into a stream of plasma out the ass end. No other way we could accelerate so near to the speed of light in only three to four days. Yes, Mom did her best. Currently reading the fourth Doom novel. Ugh. The thruster at the back looked exactly like a standpipe. I kid you not, I caught myself looking for the faucet that would turn on the water. We rounded the stern and headed forward again. About a kilometer from the stern, we found it. We found our first and only newbie body. Arlene saw something and jogged forward. I dropped to one knee and covered her, watched her through my snap-up rifle scope. She ran under the ship, finally having to crouch and skitter sideways for the last couple score meters. This close to the ship, the underside looked like a building overhang where it rose slightly away from the cup-shaped LZ. Jesus, she muttered. Sergeant Fly, get your butt up here while I and eyeball this thing. What is it? I asked, trotting towards her position at port arms. I'd rather you saw it for yourself without preconceptions. She sounded tense and excited. I double-timed the pace. By the time I approached, I was panting. Jeez. What adding another stripe does to Armin's physical fitness? Arlene didn't look tense. Her RK-150 hung off her back, totally casual. She was staring at something underneath the ship, where you'd have to crawl on your hands and knees to see it. She shone a pencil light on the thing. Looked like a body of some sort, or was once, but definitely not a Fred. Hold my rifle, I said, handing it to her. I'm going under to take a look. She eyed the overhang ship uneasily. You sure this thing isn't going to roll over on you? If and it do, little lady, I said, doing my gunny go-forth imitation. We all gonna be in a heap of troubles.
Fuck, man. Why? It's always got to be something like that. Guan. Shit. The ship overhung us even where we stood, stretching a good 50 meters beyond us. If it chose to roll over, we'd be squashed like a bug on a bullet anyway, no matter where we stood. I sure didn't, but I sure didn't feel like crawling under the thing. I could feel the mass of immensity over my back. I got about 10 meters in when I experienced a rush of utter, total panic. I'd never felt claustrophobic before. Why then? The ship felt like an upside-down mountain balanced on its peak, ready to topple over and crush me. I froze, unable to move, while waves of panic battered me. The only thing that kept me from turning around and crab crawling back out of there was the fact that Arlene was staring at me and I would rather die than have her think a sergeant in the Marine Corps was a screaming coward. After a minute, the panic subsided into a gripping anxiety. It was still horrible, but now bearable. Are you alright? Arlene called out from behind me. Uh, y yeah, just trying to figure out what the thing is. Gotta, gotta get a, get a little closer. I forced myself to crawl until I was as close as I could get. I set up my surefire flashlight lantern to illuminate the body while I inched forward until my head was caught between the spongy material and the ship's hull. It was amazing. A scene straight out of The Wizard of Oz. When the Fred ship touched it down, it landed right on top of a dead alien. Definitely wasn't a Fred. This creature looked more like an alien is supposed to look. White skin, long multiple articulated arms, and legs, fingers like tendrils. Not like the Fred's chopsticks or the Sears and Roebuck's cilia. Damn. Rannick. Thank you very much for gifting five subs. Getting us closer to yet more of this horrific novel. I swear to God, this thing actually has antenna even. The eyes were huge, big as the cross-section on an F-99 landing flare, and Coca-Cola red. I couldn't quite see, but I think they continued around the backside of the head. The face was turned down towards me, and I got hot and cold chills running up and down my spine, like it was staring at me and demanding why. The mouth was a red slit, and there was no nose. Dark lines on the side of the face where the cheeks would be on a human might have been air filters. My heart started pounding again. Another wave of panic. I was staring at my first newbie. I just knew. After I calmed down a bit, I slithered sideways through my light. Ah. Oh. Hold on. Okay, after I calmed down a bit, I slithered sideways through my light. It was a bad moment when I eclipsed the light, casting the newbie into total shadow. God only knew what it was doing in the dark. I got far enough to the side to see the body and legs. You know, I yelled back, my voice still shaky. This thing doesn't look half bad. It's crushed a little, but I think it could be salvageable. Arlene yelled something back that I couldn't hear, and she got smart and spoke it into her throat mic instead. Can you drag it out if I throw you a rope? I bet I can, I responded. I was never a rodeo roper, but I'd been around a calf or two in my day. I grew up on a farm and worked the McDonald's ranch when I was a kid. What does that mean? The McDonald's ranch. Is that like a reference to the song? Throw me the rope, eh? Yes, I bet I can lasso that thing and drag it into the light of day. Kiddo, I think we may have gotten our first lucky break on this operation. That actually ends the fourth chapter. They found a newbie, and I guess they're going to plug it into the machines on the ship and ask it what's going on? So, alright. We have our new villains. And a science fiction twist of the millennium, when they got to the planet of the evil aliens, they found that it was already conquered by more evil aliens. But they found one of them, so now they're going to interrogate it. Cool. Cool. Alright, let's get back to Doom Eternal. I'm going to take a moment to thank everyone for watching and for contributing subs so far. Very much appreciate it. I'm going to take a quick uh, bathroom break and get some water. We'll be right back with more Doom Eternal! Yeah, VIP... VIP used to, I think it lets you use the, yeah, you get a little icon. VIP gives you a little icon. 
I think you can use the emotes too, even if you're not subbed. But yeah, it really means nothing. That that's really what makes like the stakes were higher when VIP actually meant that you uh, you were basically a sub, which meant you didn't have to see ads. But now it it, it very it means very very little. I mean, something does VIP ears. Sorry, if you are VIP, it's the most important thing in the world. But it is arbitrary. Yeah. Oh, White Rabbit just gifted 20 subs. Holy cow. Oh, White Rabbit, you got us like basically halfway to the next chapter already. Whoa, dang is correct. We've got to finish this novel. We do. We do got to finish this novel. What do you think about the new ad revenue splits Twitch is offering? There, it's, it's been noticeable for me. The, uh, the ad revenue has gone up for me. Um, I kind of, I'm kind of situated in the best possible spot though. I don't make enough money from sub revenue to get hit by their like revenue split adjustment. And also I'm benefiting from ad revenue. So once we hit 100 VIPs, there will be a battle royale to find who is the supreme VIP. Ooh, I wonder what I could award a supreme VIP. Which was trying to cram in six minutes of ads an hour. That's so you're allowed to pick how many ads run on your channel and six minutes is on the high end. The I do three minutes of ads an hour, which is the lowest like ad thingy that I can pick. Um, there are higher ones that are worth more money, but I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I, this is weird because it's more of a philo philosophical thing for me. It has less to do with what I think people will tolerate and more what I think is fair. And I think like, so let's see here. Three minutes for three minutes out of 60. Damn, there's math there that makes sense. That's like one fifth, right? Yeah. So it's 5% ads. I feel like for the effort I put into the stream and how much fun I get out of it, 5% ads isn't the worst. Anyway, but yeah, Twitch Turbo's right there. Um, or use an ad blocker, whatever, man. Uh, Twitch just gives me like a little, a little sack of money for running, running that amount. Anyway, chapter five. Chapter five. We carried our gruesome trophy back into the ship, plopping it down on the table right behind Sears and Roebuck. When they turned, they stared, eyes almost popping out of their skulls. What that is? I was hoping you could tell us, I grumbled. I'd gotten used to Sears and Roebuck's galaxy weary, we've seen everything twice pose. I was even more shocked than the Megillas themselves at their confusion. Are you saying this is an entirely new race of beings you've never even seen before? No, they said. And whatever disgusting is, it is. The color is all wrong and the eyes are something horrible. Where did you get it? Ship fell on it, explained Arlene. Could, could this be a newbie? The race Rumple Stillskin was on about? The guys that wiped out the Freds? Well, something outwiped the Fred, that is sure, said Sears and Roebuck. If there are no other life forms of life here, then is logically that this is newbie. Great, fine, cool, I interrupted. But can you revive the bloody thing? I jabbed a meaty finger at them. And don't hack off any arms or legs this time. You turned my stomach with what you did to Rumple Stillskin. Sears and Roebuck didn't answer. Instead, they grabbed an ultrasound and an x-ray and began mapping the gross anatomy of the newbie. After half an hour of building up a reasonable 3D model in the data stack, they dragged the heavy corpse into a ring that looked like it was made of bamboo. Probably some sort of CAT scan or Kronky mapper that the Fred doctors used. Arlene and I kicked back and talked about old sci-fi movies we had watched. She thought the creature looked like the aliens in Communion, but I held out for a giant-sized version of the things from E.T. Finally, an hour and ten minutes into the examination, Sears and Roebuck suddenly answered, Yes! It took me a moment to figure out they were answering my original question. Say again? You're saying you can revive it? We can revive them if the other half you find. 
Other half? SNR, this thing was alone under there. That's all there is. It's not a double entity like you. They stared at me for a few moments, but I'm not sure they really got it. Sears and Roebuck were clave, and the clave were always paired. Always paired. Normally, they couldn't even deal with individuals. They literally couldn't see them. If you were alone, they wouldn't usually see a phantom sec- Wait. If you were alone, they would usually see a phantom second person. If you showed up as part of a triad, A, B, and C, the clave would see three pairs. A and B, B and C, C, and A and C. Something we found out before Hidalgo brought them- Wait. Something we found out before Hidalgo brought it on the beam in. B oh. Something we found out before Hidalgo bought it on the beam in. Right. He died in teleporter. The guy who hated his stupid wife for getting an abortion. God, these books are weird. But Sears and Roebuck were, was, an ambassador of sorts, and lately they'd gotten much practice coping with singles. Even so, they sometimes forgot. They looked offended and pained. They lugged the corpse to the operating table and began the process of first figuring out what had killed the newbie, then fixing it. That was all it took to revive anything in the galaxy, except a human being. Sears and Roebuck spent a long time hunting for the organic... Spent a long time hunting for organic damage, finding nothing. At last, they announced the mystery solved. The newbie had died of malnutrition. Evidently, it had been left behind accidentally in it eventually ran out of dietary supplement pills. As its last action, it went and laid down right on the LZ, hoping to be found and revived. And that was what nearly got the thing scrunched flatter than an armadillo on a tank tread. Another few meters to one side, and splat. Alas, that was a tough problem to cure. None of us had any idea how malnutrition affected newbies. Sears and Roebuck did a biochemical analysis and thought they'd isolated the essential nutrients... They compared them to what you could find on Fred World, figuring out what was missing, then they had to guess what systems that would destroy. The upshot was that Arlene and I were ordered to take a hike for a day or two. We spent it exploring the ship, mapping the object-oriented divisions of the ultra-individualist Freds. Strange. I never in my wildest nightmares thought I would be fighting alongside the, ultra, the ultimate collectivist clave to defeat the ultra-individualist Freds. But a marine's not there to make policy, just enforce it. Jesus. We checked back frequently. I wouldn't put it past Sears and Roebuck to revive the newbie without bothering to wait for me and Arlene. But at last, they said they were ready. They had been washing various organ-like ob objects in a nutrient bath, running a low-level elect electrical current through them for two days. Now they jump-started the hearts with big jolts of electricity, and the damned thing moaned, flapped its arms, and sat up, alive again. Oorah! Uh, the newbie slowly stared at each of us, especially curious about Sears and Roebuck. It made no attempt to escape, attack, or even step off the operating table. I guess it figured we were unknown quantities, best not to rile us just yet. The thing started picking up our language from the moment we revived it. I asked Arlene whether she had me covered, and the newbie had all the vocabulary I used. Arlene, name, you, me, pronouns, covered, guarded with a gun. And half our language structure, interrogative, exposition, down cold in six seconds. I started asking it simple questions. After the second or third one, it was answering in good English a lot better than Sears and Roebuck had ever managed to learn. An hour after reviving, we were having an animated conversation. What is your name? I asked. Newbies. Thanks a lump. Not you as a species, you as an individual. What is your name? Newbies. I shook my head. There was some sort of confusion, but maybe it was just the language. All right, newbie. What did you do to the Freds, the ones who were here before you? They were broken, but we couldn't fix them. How were they broken? The newbie started unanswering for a moment. I figured he was calculating the time factor. Eleven decades elapsed between contacts by the Freds, and they had not grown to meet the circumstances. We expected to surrender and seek fixing, but they were broken and had to be fixed. We found a Fred here who said you destroyed them, wiped them off the face of the planet. Why did you kill him and his buddies? What is a Fred? A Fred! The Freds! I waved my arm in exasperation. Why did you kill them? We are not familiar with a Fred. 
The Freds were broken. They did not grow to meet the circumstances. We attempted to fix them, but it was beyond our capabilities. We eliminated them from the mix while we studied the problem. The next time we encounter such a breakage, we shall have grown. The newbie sat rigidly on the operating table, arms hanging limply at its sides, almost as if they were barely usable. Probably the result of being dead and imperfectly revived. Reviv revivified. He doesn't say revived, he says revivified. Revivified. Yep, I guessed. Do you attempt to fix all races that don't, uh, grow to meet the circumstances? We have never encountered other races before. Until we grew, we did not realize we were a planet. We thought we were the world. Why did the newbies leave you behind? We are the newbies. We don't understand the question. We require further growth or fixing. Why are you, you personally, still here on Fred World? Why aren't you with the newbies? Your syntax is confusing us. We are here and we are there. Oh, criminy. Another freaking hive culture. The clave were bad enough, being able to only see pairs and powers of two, pairs of pairs of pairs. Now these newbies didn't even understand the concept of individual members of a species. We must, we must withdraw to consider your information, I said. Newbies, please wait on this table and elsewhere. Newbies will wait. The newbie closed its eyes, and all life signs ceased. The machines giving their steady thuds with every beat of each heart. Three, one in the groin area, one in the stomach and a smaller one circulating blood through the head, fell silent, and a rasping buzz sounded as respiration and body temperature plunged. I stared. Had something inside the newbie's stomach moved? I leaned close, staring. Then I thought about that grotesque movie from the late 1900s, and the thing popping out of the chest, so I stepped back warily. He couldn't say alien. Not allowed to say alien. That movie with the thing popping out of the chest. Hey, what's up, Kozchuk? Ugh. But something inside the newbie was definitely on the move. It rippled across the alien's belly from east to west, slithering around. Sears and Roebuck, I called. Did you pick up any large parasites or symbiotes that might be using the newbie as a host? Sears and Roebuck looked at each other, hands on heads in agitation. No, they said. Definitely nothing there that produces such a motion could be produced. Jesus, Fly, what's happening to it? It looks like it's being eaten alive. Is it dying? Arlene and I split, stepping to either side of the newbie, weapons at the ready. The snake or worm or whatever it was pressed up against the newbie's stomach, bulging out the flesh. Arlene and I backed up a step. Thank God. When the belly burst, a blue-gray newbie... Wait. When the belly burst, blue-gray newbie blood or fluid sprayed across the sick bay, splashing the wall and even spotting my uniform slightly. <laughs> How dare they? A gray serpent slithered through the opening, but the true horror was that the serpent had six heads. Then I blinked. The scene abruptly changed. It wasn't a six-headed serpent. It was a tentacle with six prongs or fingers at the end, falling limp at last. The newbie opened his eyes. Are you finished considering our information? He seemed not at all perturbed by the new addition to his anatomy. In fact, he didn't even remark on it. I tried to think of a subtle way of asking what the hell was going on, but Arlene beat me to the line, demanding, How the hell did you grow a tentacle out of your gut? The newbie looked down in obvious surprise. We aren't sure what, to, we aren't sure what event has stimulated this growth. It'll come to you, I'm sure. I muttered. But we're not quite finished considering your information. Please excuse us. The newbie became rigid again, and its vital signs dropped away to zero. <laughs> I stepped back and spoke for Arlene's ears only, presuming that the newbie hadn't evolved super sensitive hearing in the last five minutes. We are in deep, deep kimchi, kiddo. She looked up and down. Oh, come on, we can still take it. Her red brows furrowed, then raised. Oh, you mean we earthlings? Yeah... I hadn't even thought of that. Damn. Newbies. Hundreds of millions of newbies scouring the galaxy looking for races to fix. Evolving so rapidly that they were a whole different species from one battle to the next. Newbies with a violent streak sufficient to wipe the Freds from the face of their home planet. Newbies discovering the embryonic human race just beginning to poke our noses 
into the intergalactic fray. These were frightening thoughts. Arlene grimaced and absently tugged at her ear, following her own agitated turn of thought. Why, we have to find them. We have to find which way they're headed and warn Earth. What is Earth by now? Maybe we deserve wiping out. Who knows? Now she turned the brunt of her blue-eyed... Blue? Blue? I'm pretty sure they said she had green eyes before. Maybe I'm making that part up. Red hair, blue eyes? Yeah, right. Anyway, she turned the brunt of her blue-eyed icy anger on me. I don't think I follow you, Sergeant. Yeah, she's evolving, maybe? Just thinking out loud. Don't pay attention. Of course we're going to warn the country or what's left of it, whoever's in charge. I just wonder. It's been 200 odd years back home. It'll maybe be another two centuries before we can get back. Maybe longer, depending on where the newbies lead us. I just wonder whether there's still anything left worth warning. I didn't know how much of the conversation Sears and Roebuck had heard. Little, I hoped. I stepped forward and spoke aloud, rousing the newbie. Newbies, attention please. Take us to your... To the rest of you, please. Can you do that? It opened its eyes and spoke, but did not otherwise move. We can take you to us if you have not changed our plan for exploration. We are going to... It says unintelligible in brackets, by the way. But we do not know where we will go from there. If we leave now, Arlene whispered in my ear, we can still arrive about 40 years after the newbies arrived, no matter where it is. Can you give, uh, the clave bearing a distance to your location? The newbie turned to Sears and Roebuck and spoke in a different language, and the latter responded in the same tongue. Arlene and I started... Arlene and I stared at each other. One had the newbie learned to speak clavish. Then she rolled her eyes and solved the mystery. Learned it from the Freds, of course. It probably wasn't clavish, actually, just some common language the two sides... The hyper-realists and the deconstructionists used for inter inter-party negotiation. Ah, Chaim, yes, thank you. It's going to be 420 somewhere in about two minutes. Sears and Roebuck turned back to the local navigation system. Evidently, in the absence of conflicting orders from any other section of the ship, any one station was sufficient to pilot the entire vessel. Voyage is taking us another eight of weeks. It will? It announced the pair of... Announced the pair of clave. There we go. External times in the hundred and twenty of years. Eight more long weeks of... God. Just what I wanted. I took a deep breath. Push the button, Max. I said. Arlene gave me a swift kick in the ankle. The lift sequence was bizarre. It took a full day, much of which was a carefully calculated refueling that the ship carried out automatically after Sears and Roebuck planned the course. Arlene interrogated the clave extensively on just how the launch itself worked and then briefed me like a good junior NCO. On their home world, the Freds used something Arlene called a pinwheel launcher, which she described as a huge asterisk in orbit around the planet. Each limb of the asterisk was a boom with a hook attached. The diameter of the asterisk, counting the booms, was something on the order of 7,000 kilometers. The whole, pinwheel the whole pinwheel affair rotated directly opposite the day-night rotation of the planet. The spokes of the pinwheel descended from the sky and just kissed the ground. At that precise point, ground and boom were moving exactly the same speed and direction. So from the viewpoint of the ship on the runway, our ship, the boom appeared to hesitate motionless for a moment. That was the moment that our ship attached itself to the boom. In that fraction of a second, the Fred ship transformed itself from being a member of the Fred world system to a member of the pinwheel system. Then, as the pinwheel continued to rotate, it pulled our ship up with it. Gently at first, it felt like zero G for a few moments. Then we felt the centrifugal tug as we were yanked in a different direction than the planetary rotation. The G-force increased rapidly, then just as suddenly it decreased as the inertial dampeners kicked online. Still, my stomach flew south while the rest of me wanted, or while the rest of me went north, and I longed for the comfortable, familiar disorientation of mere zero-G. 
That was a first. I was absolutely convinced. Fly Taggart longing for freefall. That's kind of a neat idea, I guess. Oh, it's 420. Nice for you and Loof in your respective home countries. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, smoke him if you got him. Damn right. The pinwheel carried us up and around. Then at our pedigree, the highest point of our little mini orbit around the center of mass of the rotating asterisk, the ship decoupled, launching us into space. We were once again at free fall, and I regretted my earlier wish for it. But the ship immediately started spinning up, eventually hitting 0.8G again. Meanwhile, the engines began to whine and moan and loudly groan. And we felt the hard backward push that indicated we had started our long acceleration prior to the seven week drift, culminating with a hard deceleration at the other end, dropping us into. Into what? It was a frightening thought, and we would have 58 creeping days to think about it. We fell into a standardized shipboard routine training, mess, watch standing, strategic mental improvement. We played chess and go. An endless worrying, discussing, theorizing, emotional reminisce. Emotional reminiscence of all that was best on Earth before this whole horrible nightmare started. Once again, I took walking the long, wet, slimy, hot corridors, but this time with Arlene at my side. Everything we saw reminded us of the monsters that Fred created for us. They drew heavily from their own world. They loved dark alcoves, doors that opened suddenly with only a hiss for a warning. I couldn't count how many times I whirled around, drawing down on a frigging door. Horrible Ba Relief faces. Baz Relief? Ba Relief faces adorned every flat surface. Then, right in the middle of a passageway on a spaceship for Pete's sake, we'd run into a fountain of some dark red fluid that sure as hell looked like blood. The walls never seemed quite straight. Maybe the straight lines and right angle turns bothered the Freds as much as the crazy geometry set my neck hairs upright. Huh. Take a look, Arlene said, pointing at a door through which we had to pass. I sucked in a breath. The mouth of Moloch. Jesus, Albert should be here. Oh, that's real. That's real sensitive. I looked sharply over at her, but she wasn't torqued by the reference to her one and only. She nodded slowly. Albert would have loved this spread. That was Arlene Sanders, her response to grief and fear with literal irony. A perfect Marine. Jesus, I felt homesick. Just a few months ago, my time. I was wasting my life at Camp Pendleton, loafing and pulling at the occasional watch, thinking of not re-upping and dropping back into the world instead. I had a fiancé, now deceased. What? Doom guy had a fiance? I had a fiance, now deceased. I had parents and high school friends. I had the expectation that the world would look pretty much the same 20 years later. Then we got to Kafiristan. But even that was alright. It was crap, but it was the crap I'd always known was possible in my chosen profession. The fiance was mentioned in a previous book. Oh, really? Man. Slipped out of my head. James Fisto, thanks for gifting three subs. Appreciate it. I had the expectation that the world... Yeah, yeah, We got to Kafir's dad. But when they yanked us out of the Pearl Triangle and boosted Fox Company up to Phobos, well, they yanked me out of my comfortable reality and threw me into primordial chaos. So now I was jogging the length and circumference of an alien ship, hurling towards an unknown star at nearly light speed, with a plural alien as an ally and a mutable thing for a guide. The only, con the only constancy was Arlene Sanders, now my last and only friend. It's not just a job, man. It's an adventure. The weeks crawled past like worms on a wet sidewalk. <laughs> Every few days, the newbie mutated, evolved, or whatever you call it, slowly transforming from the roughly humanoid shape we first found into a truly alien form with a distended stomach, a pushed-in jaw, and longer arms. If I, I found the change fascinating and a little scary. It was to say it wouldn't evolve into something we couldn't handle. But a queer thing happened. 
The closer we got to the planetary system, which Nick, which we nicknamed Skinwalker, because it was right where we found the. Wait. All right, but a queer thing happened. The closer we got to the planetary system, which we nicknamed Skinwalker, because it was where we would find the shapeshifters. They named it for something that happened after they got there? Whatever. I guess they're supposing they're going to find shapeshifters. The more frightened the newbie became, he was scared, terrified. Yondo, thank you for gifting a sub. I asked what he was so frightened of, and he answered, We are subject to different stimuli. We are frightened of how we have grown to adapt to the native circumstances. You're scared you're no longer the same species, I accused. The newbie said nothing, going limp again. Its usual response to information... Wait. Oh, its usual response to information it could not handle. Of course it couldn't. I just suggested that unity was bifurcated. That what had been one was now, was now two. Oh my god. The newbie had no words inside of its head to explain that concept. It conceived of itself as everything and nothing. All of the newbie's species at once and nothing of itself. How can you divide everything into two piles, one of which is still labeled everything? Oh. Kafir is the Arabic word for a non-believer? I think it's K-I-F-I-R. But I... Wait, hold on. Next time they reference it. Hey, what's up, Tilting Gamer? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Uh, da -da. The newbie was starting to realize that whatever was waiting for us on Skinwalker was not the newbie race. Not anymore. It was terrified of what its own people had become, just as Arlene and I were terrified of what Earth would look like when we finally returned. We hawk-watched the newbie for the first couple of weeks, but it never did anything but sit on the table, unmoving, and answer questions we asked it. It never initiated conversations or tried to move. We surveilled it, watching through an air circulation grate, to see what it did when it thought no one was around. Either it didn't do anything, or else it knew somehow that we were there. Sears and Roebuck told me that there was a hidden video system aboard the ship, used by the captain to spy on the rest of his crew, but we couldn't find it. We had thrown most of the Freds overboard on Fred World, so we couldn't revive the captain to tell us himself. Or himself. Even if the idea weren't so utterly stupid that I wouldn't even mention it to my Lance. Gradually, we came to accept the immobile, silent alien in the sick bay. Then we started to even forget he was there at all. I found myself and Arlene casually talking in front of him about stuff he really wasn't clear to hear. After all, he was still a representative of the enemy, even if he and they had evolved in separate directions for 40 years, which was the equivalent of possibly 40 million dog years. Sick reference. Five weeks into the eight-week voyage, Arlene experienced every Marine's worst nightmare. Something terrible happened on her watch. The first I knew about it was three hours later when she shook me awake out of a fitful sleep where I dreamed we landed in a sea that turned out to be one humongous newbie circling the planet, waiting to fold us gently in arms like mountains and drag us to a watery grave 50 fathoms down. <sighs> Get up, get up, fly, she said urgently. Battle stations! In an eye blink, I was out of my bed, stark naked, with a forty cal pistol in my hands. What? Where? I demanded, looking for the enemy. We were alone in the room we called the barracks. Even Sears and Roebuck were missing, though they'd been there when I went to sleep. Fly, I screwed the pooch real bad. She looked so pale and stricken that I almost reached out to hug her. It wouldn't have been appreciated. It wouldn't have been appreciated. There were times she was a friend and times she was a Marine Corps Lance Corporal. What did you do, Lance? Her face took on the mask, what we wear when we have to report a dereliction of duty, our own, to the XO. 
stone cold and icy white, lips as taut as strings stretched on their stretched to their breaking point. Sergeant, I was on watch at 0322. I went to check on the perimeter at sickbay, but he was gone. It took a moment for the intel to sink in. Gone? What the hell do you mean? Where did he go? I glanced at my watch. The only thing I wore. 0745. The newbie had been missing for at least four hours and twenty minutes. A nice. I can't find him, Sarge. I've looked. Sears and Roebuck and I have crawled this entire freaking ship up one side and down the other. And we can't find a shred of evidence that he was ever here. Where are the clave? They're still looking, but I think if we were going to find the newbie, we'd have found traces at least by now. She lowered her voice and looked truly ashamed. It's the first time I'd ever seen her like that, and I didn't like it. I think he's, uh, been planning this break for a long, long time. Weeks, probably. I pulled on my camis, t-shirt, and jacket while she talked. God, Arlene. Wait, he didn't say pants. I guess that's maybe what camis are. God, Arlene, you're asking me to believe that the newbie sat utterly still without moving for five weeks to lull us into a false sense of security? Christ, do you realize how ridiculous that sounds? It's what he did, Fly. I just know it. We conducted a rigorous search, but of course, if the person sought... If the person being sought doesn't want to be found, it's not difficult to avoid four people, well, three actually, since Sears and Roebuck are inseparable by nature, on a ship with 50 square kilometers of deck space. We finally gave into exhaustion at 1310 after more than five hours of continuous searching. The son of a bitch didn't want to be found, and by God, we weren't going to find him. If he was still a him, or a newbie, for that matter, what weird mutation had he undergone this time? I shuddered at the horrific... Hieronymus Bosch images that con conjured up in my mind. Okay. Then abruptly, the ship's gravity, the acceleration down toward the outside hull, shifted radically. Suddenly, down was not just out, but forward as well. Only one event could have caused that effect, and it meant that we had found our elusive gremlin, sort of. Criminalities? Criminalities. That's a word. How? Automod. Automod grabbed Bosch is a crazy word. Bosch must be a... Maybe I shouldn't say it like that, but it must be some kind of bad thing in some language. Jeez, weird. Uh, Automod, you wacky boy. Um... Criminalities. He's found. He's made his way to another set of controls. I shouted in Arlene's ear. He was slowing us down or turning us, driving us away from Skinwalker and sabotaging the mission. This newbie had evolved an independent personality, and he was determined not to risk contact with a tribe, no matter what the cost to the rest of the galaxy. And thus ends chapter five. Holy crap! This is getting weird. So. Okay. So the race that beat the demons, the Freds, excuse me, left behind a survivor that they revived and has now evolved into a separate race that now fears his original race. So maybe this dude will team up with our ragtag group of freedom fighters and turn on his own species. I don't know what's going on. I don't know where this book is going. It's just the most unhinged sci-fi at this point. Did I miss why they're called Freds? No. I don't think it's ever actually explained. And if it was, it was like one sentence that came and went and I forgot. Yes, revivified. Excuse me. All right. I'm going to take a food break. I'm going to take a little food break. A wee food break. I'm going for... I guess I had a slice of banana bread a while ago, but yeah, I need to take a, a food break. So I'll come back. Don't worry, though. When I come back, I'll put some, some time on the... I'll put some subs in the meter to make up for it. But yeah, Nummy Nom's time. See you guys in a bit. Okay. I'm trying to think of how best to... I think if I just do this, it'll give me more light. Alright. Whoa! Bunked my desk pretty hard. 
Oh, and you guys are even boost training me right now. <clears throat> boost training audiobooks on Twitch. Now that's that's real Chad business right there. What happens when you run out of Doom novels? I have other novels. I have a lot of other novels. Uh, I have an, the novelization of the movie Batman and Robin. I think that might be next. Might be fun to cycle back to something like that. Christian, don't. Thanks for gifting a sub. It would be nice to know more about the uh, the motivations. Yes, with Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy and Bane and Batgirl. Yes. Even more, even more. Hey, look at that. The Batman gif over there. I keep remembering it's reversed. <clears throat> okay. Chapter six. Christ, H&R, do something. Having issued my first military command in a week, I did what any good military man does when confronted with an invisible enemy. I ran in circles, screaming and shouting. Sears and Roebuck look frustrated, being con con constitutionally unable to follow the order. Do something. Let me, uh... Thank you all very much for the, uh, the burst of generosity, y'all. Oh, Jay Borden! Jay Borden with the pog, the 30 pog. And Crab Foam gifting another sub. Tell you what, I'll just let the meters and the clock go for now. This is great, though. Thank you all very much. Then Arlene, whirling rapidly in every direction with her magazine-fed shotgun, thought of the obvious. Why? Isn't this stupid Fred ship steered by consensus? Yes, I don't know what that means. Maybe SNR should hump over to another nav center and issue another vote for our course. Oh, Faceless, thanks for the cheer. Wonder if it'll play. Sears and Roebuck started to run, but I grabbed one of their arms. Wait, before you go, set up a computer loop that continually issues the command to get us back on course. Run from nav to nav, setting the same order wherever you can. Go! Okay, I think I wasn't on the right tab. Hold on a minute. Playing there? Gosh, what is with? Every time I try to do this. Sorry, keeps popping up. I don't like. Sometimes it just doesn't play. You're not on. gonna kill me that easily. Okay. Thanks, Barney. <clears throat> That's how many how many attempts it took. I don't know what's going on with those stupid alerts. They're so unreliable. Hey, Thrill House. And Faceless, thanks for gifting a sub. I'm glad you caught the stream too, big era bonus. Welcome everyone. We got more lore coming down, and it's weird. I gestured Arlene to me. Okay, Lance, you and I are going hunting. She licked her lips. Sometimes that girl is just a little too marine. The gravity stopped, then reversed. We had outvoted the newbie. But while we broke out into one of the outdoor corridors and ran the length of the ship, the situation reversed, and again we started slowing. The damn newbie was doing the same thing we were. Arlene, how many navigational centers? Uh, 41 that I counted. Corporal, that thing has evolved intelligence beyond ours. We can't outthink him, so there's only one thing to do. We have to drag him down to our level by attacking without thought or planning, purely chance encounters and brute force. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yes. That makes total sense. <laughs> we bolted through the corridors lit only by our own flashes. Dancing from nav to nav at random. Random as a human brain can do. Desperately hoping to catch the newbie as he visited nav after nav. We ran into Sears and Roebuck twice, but the newbie remained as elusive as ever. The third time we bumped into the clave and nearly blew them away, I'd had enough. Screw it, A.S. Just start pounding a shell into each nav. Center as we find it. It was time to reduce the choices. We went methodically from center to center, and in every room, Arlene raised her semi-auto shotgun and pumped three or four shells into the delicate programming equipment. Everywhere we went, we tripped over dead Freds that we didn't even remember killing and hadn't gotten around to dumping. So intense had been that firefight when we first took over the ship. The one that they just completely didn't... They just completely skipped. God damn. Uh, we had destroyed more than half the navs and had been hurled 
to the ground a dozen times by radical acceleration changes when we finally kicked a door and saw our enemy. The newbie had his head buried in the guts of one of the destroyed navs, trying to repair it enough to cast another vote for slowdown. He jerked his new triple heads up as we entered. His tentacle arms snaked down the circuitry, bypassing the damage. There is no need for violence, one of the heads said, speaking in calm, measured tones. We must join forces against the Freds. The newbies have decided they cannot coexist with the deconstructionists. If you continue on the present course, we will be wiped out by the newbies who have their own agenda. Please, just listen to us. He started to make a whole lot of sense. Arlene lowered her shotgun, hesitantly waiting to hear him out. Alright. So I sh So I shot the friggin' bastard before he could utter another syllable. Nice, Doom guy. I raised my M14 and squeezed off a burst of four. The big rifle kicking against my shoulder like a Missouri mule. Disemboweling the newbie where he stood. Arlene stared. Jesus, fly. Was all she could- was all she said. Her voice tentative and questioning. The newbie staggered back against a hydraulic pump. God only knows what use the Freds had for hydraulics in a spaceship. But it didn't clutch its belly or moan or gasp. You got me. Or anything. It, it bled. The blood being pinkish white. Like pale Pepto-Bismol. Yes, Marzar. The newbie is an enemy now. The newbie is a hive mind that actually defeated the Freds who were the demons. The Freds had bioengineered a demon army to attack the human race because the Freds thought that the human beings were still stuck at the stage of evolution that they were around the 1400s, and I guess they thought that the monsters styled as they are in Doom would be extra effective against, like, superstitious Dark Ages folks. You know, it's still a very Eurocentric way of looking at human history, but... Are we surprised? Anyway. All... Yeah. All right. This is the correct, correct way to deal with the lore of this stupid book. So anyway, there's another race that beat the demon race before Doom Guy could even get there. Because of time dilation and relativistic flight. Through space. A bulge started in its side. I understood immediately. It was evolving more organs to relink around the damage. I blasted them too, and at last the damn thing truly died, as nearly dead as the living dead could ever be. It bubbled softly, leaning back against the bul bulkhead, then nothing. Yeah, but I'd seen that act before. I unloaded the rest of the magazine into him, hitting every major bio biological system I could imagine. I guess maybe I went a little overkill, but criminy. What else could I do? He says criminy a lot now. That was Bayo 3. I really liked it. I'm really, really enjoying it. Uh, I, I'm excited to get it working on an emulator. Hey, yes. I explained guiltily. He was getting under our skin. I had to do it. If I had let him speak, Lance, he would have had us eating solid waste in five minutes flat. I understand, but Jesus fly. The newbie slid slowly to the ground, staring at me with such intensity, I almost reloaded it and shot another burst into its face just to shut those eyes. I didn't, but for the first time, I really understood the protagonist of Poe's telltale heart. He turned his head to the side, staring down at the deck. I think he was already dead, unable to control his neck and eye muscles. But I still know what he saw. They all did. Jesus was a man of action, Corporal. I was getting a bit offended at her taking of the Lord's name in vain. He just compared himself to Jesus, opening fire on an alien creature that he barely understood and plowing it into the <laughs> Jesus would have shot it too is what he's saying he reads Poe what a scholar yeah Flynn Taggart is a real uh, warrior poet that's for sure like that's what I mean though I mean like this but but better like self aware which is what Wolfenstein was that would be my doom novel is, is a warrior poet who's constantly like quoting 
scripture and religious texts, many, not just the Bible, religious texts, like works of philosophy, like doing all these things just while just tearing demons in half. It would be a philosophical treatise and then just like very vivid descriptions of sweet demon busting action. That would be my doom novel. It'd be like a treatise on on the nature of conflict or some shit. I would I would make it so heady. All right, uh, Christ Almighty. Jesus was a man of action. Yep. Maybe I was just a bit worried that Jesus might not have liked what I had just done. I had no choice. His tongue was silver. She just stared, shaking her head. The ship continued to accelerate back to cruising speed giving us two down directions, outboard and aft. I felt sick, but I didn't know whether it was from the weird gravity or being sick at heart about what I had just done. Excuse me. Blown away the only representative we had met from an entirely new alien species. We found Sears and Roebuck and told them they could stop programming navigational centers. We were alone. The newbie's ghost could join that of Rumpelstiltskin and every other dead Fred on board. We picked up the creature's body, bearing him aft to the bridge, just about midway along the ship's body, actually. This bridge was just one among many. We set him up in the co-pilot's chair, where the Fred captain had been slain. Enemies in battle, they could be fast allies in guiding the ship of death with spectral hands. The newbie weighed more than I would have expected, about twice what Arlene weighed. I wish the nav cabins were closer to the central core of the ship so we wouldn't have to lug the dead thing through a nearly full G of acceleration. This marked the second time in living memory when Fly Taggart ever wished for zero G. We ramped up to speed again, but the monkeying around had cost us 10 days of travel and a dreadful amount of fuel. I didn't understand how two hours of space jockeying could cost us 10 days until Arlene explained the fuel problem. The fuel was calculated on two assisted accelerations, ramping up at the beginning of the journey, afterward being launched by the pinwheel launcher from Fred World, and slowing down at the end, but all by our lonesome. I mostly nodded and said, uh-huh, whenever she paused to wait for my response, but I was really only interested in one aspect, which she finally disgorged. The ram scoop only worked at a certain speed, and you had to accelerate to that speed by other means, hence the hydrogen and liquid oxygen fuel we carried. The hydrogen was no problem. The ship replenished a store as a byproduct of fusion. I guess not all hydrogen fused or something. But the LOX, as Arlene called it, was irreplaceable. Once it was gone, it was gone. I think I can... Okay. I'm going to take a pause here to update the goals. Oh, you guys are already just about halfway to the next, the next chapter. I love it. Okay. Add that hour. Yes. Okay. The bastard newbie had used a lot of it trying to slow us down. We didn't have enough left to do a 100G burn for three days and match our orbits with Skinwalker. We would have to start slowing a subjective week earlier by shutting down the ramjet fusion entirely and just letting the friction of interstellar hydrogen against the ram scoop slow us some. Then we would manually burn at lower thrust, conserving our fuel and hopefully matching velocities. If not, we would either stop short, dead in space, drifting at whatever velocity relative to the planet we find until we finally ran out of fuel. Ah. Until we finally ran out of fuel, sailing on past the planet and waving bye-bye in the rear windshield. Or else we might plow into the hunk of rock at a couple hundred kilometers per second, punching out a crater the size of the Gulf of Mexico, and incidentally atomizing us and the ship. Okay. So this maybe is the prologue. You think the 2100 warrior poet would drop memes from the early 2000s? I think they would wax philosophic on the nature of early 2000s memes. Or probably not individual memes, no. Oh, I'm going to crack a cold one. Hold on. They would have something profound. Like they would be making a grand statement about the like the progression of the human race and the internet, and they would do it by referencing a single meme that's extraordinarily poignant to that fact. 
Oh! That one was violent. It seemed like a... It seemed like a splorp of fluid came... Oh yeah, it landed on the book. Alright, well... This book has now been... Has been <laughs> yeah, that was a wild crack. It really was. This book has now been initiated into the weekend. <laughs> the beer crack to prove a point? Yeah, this beer crack got something to say. <laughs> yeah, there's the dream. Something important. It's gone when I wake up. No time for dreams, I guess. The monster never dies, no matter how many times you kill it. It just sheds its skin and, uh, and changes form. I can feel the weight of the world pushing me down. I try to carry it nonetheless. One last time, and then I can rest. Yes, exactly. The fucking... <sighs> Gotta carry that weight, brother. Yes. Uh, Machine Games BJ Blazkowicz is like, might be the best boomer shooter protagonist ever. Wait, what? I was talking about a. Fr I was talking to a friend at the party. Told her about No More Heroes, your stream, and how I won the plunger. She said she heard about someone winning a plunger as her 14-year-old sister told her about it? Oh, well, maybe. Could have been somebody else winning a plunger. But that's interesting. That probably doesn't happen too often. Caroline. So good. I want to play those games again. And me your wings. Uh, Where were we? Oh yeah, talking about how to decelerate. It all depended on Sears and Roebuck. Arlene and I offered to help. We told them about our brilliant piloting of the makeshift mail rocket coming down from the relocated Deimos moon above Earth's surface. But the clave just looked at each other, each putting his gorilla-sized hand on the other's head and pumping their crania up and down. We took it to be laughter that time, derisive laughter. I had no idea how good a pilot Sears and Roebuck were, but I had a bad feeling it was like the president taking the stick of Air Force One when the pilots had a heart attack. Better than giving it to the presidential janitor, though, which was basically where Arlene and I stood in the pecking order. God, how I wish we hadn't left Commander Taylor back at the hyper-realist military base. That babe could fly anything. I don't even remember Commander Taylor. The other big problem was that unlike back at Fred World, we had no friendly pinwheel launcher to catch us here and lower us more, more or less gently to the surface. We were entirely on our own. The rest of the journey was uneventful, including the extra 10 days of grace. We trained and practiced various emergency drills just for something to do. One of the biggest problems with spaceflight is the incredible relentless boredom. But if there's one thing the Marine Corps teaches you to handle, it's ennui. We were always sitting on our hands, waiting for somebody further up the food chain to finish a mysterious errand, while the rest of us jarheads, men with stripes on our sleeves, waited for the word. It wasn't like they let any grass grow under our feet. There's always something to do around a military base, even if it's just putting a nice polish on the brass cannon, on the stone steps at Pensacola, or scrubbing the base's CO hardwood office floor with your toothbrushes. You manage to miss your gunny or your top, you might find yourself with a whole afternoon free. There was always the NCO club to soak up any extra dollars. On the Fred ship, it was both more and less difficult to find something to do for weeks and weeks. Harder because there weren't any butter bars, silver bells, or railroad tracks to tell us what to do, but easier because we were on an alien spaceship full of strange and wonderful things to poke and monkey with. Three main corridors of 3.7 kilometers each and 0 0.8 G. Oh. With three main corridors of 3.7 kilometers each at 0.8 G and one at 0 G. I actually learned to tolerate 0 G for several hours at a time with only slight floaty feeling in my stomach. Arlene loved it, naturally. The central shaft that I called the 0 G corridor was a doodecahedral or was doodecahedral according to AS. It had 12 sides, but the corners weren't sharp, they were rounded off, and the sides were not very symmetrical in any case. Like everything else in Fredland, the entire corridor disoriented me. Like looking at one of those paintings by Picasso where the eyes are head-on, but the nose is in profile. 
Just grab your cubes in. There was a totally cool red pulse that traveled the length of the shaft, from back to front, oddly enough. It reminded me so much of an old sci-fi flick that we dubbed it the Warp Coil Pulse. The thing is, they name-dropped Star Trek multiple times in the previous book, and now they're not. Uh. The walls must have been lit panels or LEDs or something. I don't know where the illumination came from. There was no source that we ever found. We invented a few reindeer games to play when we got tired of training, marching, and drilling. I made sure Arlene and I kept up on our parade and close, close order drill. We may have been lost in space, but we were still the United States freaking Marine Corps, goddammit. One Arlene got... wait. Okay, I don't understand this sentence. One Arlene got from an old sci-fi book by Heinlein. Heinlein. You start at one end of the corridor and... Oh, this is one of the reindeer games. Okay. You start at one end of the corridor and dive toward the other end, doing flips or spins or butterflies or some other gymnastic feat, seeing how far you can get and how many maneuvers you can perform before you crash against the side. She never did get all the way, but after the first couple of weeks, I always did, much to Arlene's annoyance. I thought Sears and Roebuck would be too staid and respectable to join in any reindeer games. Ha! They were always the first to get tired of the mil-spec crap and demand we go play. I guess decadence is more than anything else. I guess decadence is more than anything else the need to play games to drive away the boredom demon. Having demonstrated their insanity by volunteering to go on our expedition, far away from any possibility of resurrection if they should die, Sears and Roebuck proved their fearlessness in the risks they would take just for a thrill. Once they put on spacesuits from their fanny packs, climbed outside the ship, and played like monkeys on the outer skin. They dangled from the spinning hull, swinging from handhold to handhold with their feet, dangling over an infinite abyss. One slip, and we would have lost one if not both of our pilots. Probably if one had gone, the other would have been unable to contemplate living and would have followed the first loyally to a horrible doom. Ah, damn. Crab Foam, thanks for gifting a sub. <sighs> but all good things must end. The time rolled by at last, and Sears and Roebuck suddenly turned deadly serious. We shut down the ram scoop and I felt a slight gravity push forward as we plowed into interstellar hydrogen dust and slowed. We did this for about a week, then Sears and Robux started the thrusters at a lower and more efficient level of acceleration than what our ship originally had planned. It made no difference to us, it was still far beyond the fatal crushing level, so the inertial dampeners kept, a damp or kept it down to the same level we had felt ramping up. My reindeer games stopped. We had no more zero-g shaft. <laughs> Suddenly heavy again after weeks of deceleration ranging from 0.8g down to zero, I dragged every footstep and my legs and back ached. Arlene didn't have it so bad. She didn't have as much mass as I. She still had a spring in her step and an increasingly grim smile on her face. I knew the feeling. It had been months since I killed anything. After what the Freds had done to my life and my world, I developed a taste for blood. Now that the newbies had deprived me of my rightful revenge, I was prepared to transfer all that wrath to the new threat. In short, I wanted to pump a few rounds into a nice, smooth, newbie chest. <laughs> Fucking Christ, bro. Just wanted to squeeze off a couple of pumps on some newbie faces, you know? Just marine shit. Phrasing. Yeah, the Star Trek cease and desist letter came in. I didn't stop it though. Hoorah! <laughs> Carrying around a full clip. Ugh. I just gotta unload, baby. Ugh. Give him a box of Crayolas. Yeah, this dude needs to do some push ups. But, 
I was also starting to get very, very nervous about what they had managed to evolve into in the four decades they had been down on the planet we approached, assuming they were still there. I saw a number of possible outcomes, none of them pleasant. The frustration of finding no one, the humiliation of capture, the agony of us being annihilated. Then, su then without warning one day, the reactor breaking suddenly stopped. Sending Arlene and me flying, literally, the forward bulkhead that had been a deck became a wall instantaneously, dropping us to the outer bulkhead, which was now our only floor. We're coming and down to landing, Sears and Roebuck soberly informed us, then used the last of the hydrogen peroxide retros over the space of an hour to cut the ship's rotation, leaving us in orbit that would take us directly into the planet's atmosphere at about Mach 70. That's Earth's... That's Earth sea level dry air Mach speed of 70, about 23 kilometers per second. Thanks for the translation, Doom Guy. Appreciate that. This entire book also has been from the perspective of Doom Guy so far. So I don't know. I think the author might be done jumping around. Maybe. Trying to land at such a speed would kill us as surely as blowing up the reactor pile, but we were rapidly running out of options. When Sears and Roebuck killed the main thrusters, they did so with only a tiny bit of locks remaining. How much we got left? Arlene asked. Approximately, it is left. 650 seconds is, they answered. But only at three gravities of Fred World for using the maneuver's rockets. Arlene and I looked at each other. That was less than 11 minutes of burn and without even using the huge main thrusters. Arlene tapped rapidly on her risk calculator and her wrist calculator and frowned and tried the calculation again. SNR, she said, broadcasting through her throat mic into the ship's radio communication system. I get a net drop of about Mach 50. That is correct in essential. Arlene lowered her orange brows and spoke slowly like a child answering what she thinks might be a trick classroom question. Sears and Roebuck, if we're doing Mach 70 now and we drop it by Mach 50, doesn't that mean we're still doing Mach 20? Yes, the math are simplicity. Now we both looked back and forth in confusion. I took over the interrogation now that I understood the situation. SNR, you brain dead morons, we'll be splattered across the deck like a box load of metallic atoms. Long pause. Maybe they were manipulating each other's head in that faintly obscene form of laughter that the clave use. No, my children's. But for we shall use air braking to reduceify the rest of the speed. A terrible pit opened in my stomach. Even I knew that a Fred ship was not, repeat, not designed to be abused in such a fashion. It was designed to dock with a pinwheel launcher and to even land gently using the main thrusters to slow all the way ne to next to nothing. Ah. Ah. God, that fucking sentence. I'll try it again. It was designed to dock with a pinwheel launcher and even to land gently using the main thrusters to slow all the way to next to nothing. Not to belly flop into the atmosphere like a disoriented driver burning off excess speed by turning its huge surface area directly into the onrushing air. We would burn to a crisp. That is if the ship didn't tear itself into constituent parts first. Hang on to yourselves and things suggested our Mondo weird binary pilots. We're burning away the fuel starting now. And that ends chapter six. Chapter six complete. Okay, now we're gonna get to that exciting re-entry sequence when a ship busts into pieces. And they're gonna somehow survive, I guess, or they'll just die. <laughs> and somehow the book will continue. I don't know. Ah, shucks, I didn't record that part. All right, hold on. I'm going to write this down. They blacked out last time they re-entered atmosphere. Yeah. <clears throat> in their own little dinky rocket. Or you're right. Yeah. Even in the... Even in the... Well, no. When, the, when they were in the... Um, the ship they're in now. It just kind of stopped. Any chance you'll make these reads into some YouTube playlist? They're all on YouTube. They're condensed into, uh, they're condensed into bigger videos. But they are there. They knew you would come as you 
Right. Update that timer too. Where's my oh there we go. Okay, chapter seven. The ship jerked, shimmied like a garden hose, jerked again. Where the hell's that crazy mofo? I demanded. Eileen was knocked away from her perch by another sudden earthquake. I caught her by the arm so she didn't karam across the zero G ship. Christ, I think he said he was headed toward nav room one, right inside the engine compartment. Did he say that? Whatever. The ship twirled like a chandelier, or so it felt. We dangled from handholds, feeling sudden acceleration trying to yank us free to fling us into God knows where. Nearly 11 minutes later, the acceleration vanished as abruptly as it began. Sears and Roebuck finished the final burn. We were dead sticking it the rest of the way in. And that would be the end of the Fred ship, and possibly of us, too. Then the atmosphere thickened enough that we started feeling a real push. The bow of the ship became down, the stern up. I drifted against the forward bulkhead, now floor, with about 0.2 G, which quickly escalated to full, then more than one gravity, two, three times our normal G. The inertial dampeners were offline, probably out of juice. We suffered through the full deceleration phase, four G's, four and a half. The air braking went on forever. I was crushed to the deck by about 800 pounds of weight. And the gravity began to slide along the deck toward the ventral bulkhead. Sears and Roebuck were pinching the nose, or pitching the nose upward to expose, expose more of the hull to the atmosphere. We shed airspeed even as we gained more weight. I heard a horrific uh, I heard a horrific explosion astern of us. The ship swerved violently, hurling us across the new floor. Arlene fell against me, but I was stunned. I just shook my head. What the freaking hell? She stared out a porthole, face ashen. Jesus fly! Freaking ship splitting! She slid her hand along the deck and pointed. I just barely saw a huge piece of the Fred ship below us tumbling end over end, shattering into tiny splinters scores of meters long. It was getting hard to talk. We needed all our breath to bear down, forcing blood back into our heads. Thank God we were lying down. Now at six G's, sitting up, we might have passed out. I knew what was happening. The Fred ship, strong as it was, was never intended to burn through the atmosphere like this. It was fracturing along heat seams, separating into components that had been attached by the Freds when they assembled the vehicle. Probably in orbit, the damn thing was way too long for this sort of monkey crap. Forward, I shouted, nearly blacking out with the effort. Arlene star stared, confused. Lack of oxygen bearing blood in her brain, maybe, or so... So I repeated, Forward, nav room one. If any component of the ship was to survive the fiery re-entry, it would be the biggest, strongest section. The decks and compartments where the engines actually burned, shook, and vibrated. Besides, if that section went, we would all die anyway. No pilot. We weren't far from it, maybe a couple of hundred meters, but it was a marathon. Arlene strained and slithered forward like a snake. I tried to follow suit, but the best I could do was humping, was a humping motion that wrenched my back something fierce. God, to be young again and supple. The monstrous gravity squeezed us to the ventral deck plates like an enormous boot stamping on our backs. Each compartment was connected to the next by a flexible rubble, rubber bottleneck that could easily be sealed to isolate a puncture. The rubber mouths became jaws of death, smothering and suffocating us as we wriggled through them. We could have used some petroleum jelly. I had plenty, about a kilometer behind us in my sea bag. After the first four rooms, my muscles were so sore, I grunted with pain every meter crawled. Arlene was crying. I had almost never seen her cry before, and never from sheer physical pain. It scared me. The world was ending. The groans from the ship as it tore itself apart sure as hell sounded like the end of the world. The universe grinding down noisily, long drawn out moans, a loud noise like the cry of humpbacked whales. Loud noise like, wait, 
Loud noise like the cry of humpbacked whale. Shrieks and sobs. The wailing of the damned in hell gnashing their teeth. The devil himself danced around me in hooves and pointed tail. Laughing and capering, pointing at me in my mortal distress. Or was it a hell prince minotaur? A horrible hallucination. My lord, I surely did see him. And a flesh of red reeking of sulfur in the grave. Then a steam demon and a bony leapt through the walls. Old home weak for Fred monsters. I don't understand old home weak. But I knew where salvation lay. Forward and forward to Navroom 1. When Arlene faltered and tried to lie down and die in front of me, I put my hand on her flattened derriere and shoved with a strength I'd never felt before. The handful of ass moved ahead, dragging the girl along with it. <laughs> That's actually a pretty funny s sentence. That one is pretty good. Yeah, this is the deep lore. This is what we needed. Another, f another four rooms, only two left. <clears throat> my belly and chest were scraped raw and my groin ached with the agony of a well-placed jackboot. Spittle ran down my chin, smearing the deck and dehydrating me. We suffered under a full eight Gs then, according to my wrist accelerometer, and even my eyeballs throbbed with pain, horribly distended towards the deck. Color had long since disappeared, and even the black and white images I could still see narrowed to a tunnel of light. Blurry outlines bent and twisted under force. Again, the ship skewed, spun out of control until Seals and Sears and Roebuck gained control. How the hell were they flying the ship? Were there even any control surfaces left? We shoved through the last two rubber collars. I almost died in the second when my bulk stuck fast. And I couldn't breathe for the clingy seal across my mouth and nose. Arlene saved my life then, reaching back into the bottleneck, somehow mustering the strength to drag me forward by my hair a meter, clearing the rubber from my face. At last we lay on the floor of Nav Room 1, broken and bleeding from nose and ears, unable to see, hugging the deck like drunks at the end of a spree. I heard sounds above the shredding of the ship... Er, I heard sounds above, the shredding of the ship behind us. Words. Sears and Roebuck saying something. Desperately, I focused. Being shot! They gasped. Shot at down. Defenders shooting. Ship breaking into part. Losing. Controlling. Shot. Shot at? What the hell was this outrage? It was just too much. On top of the agony of re-entry, I'd have to put up with this weaponry BS as well. Kill. Bastards. I wheezed. Oh, fat chance. More likely, we would all die before the ship even hit the ground, blown apart by relentless defenders with particle beam cannons. I passed out. Only for a moment. I woke to hear Sears and Roebuck repeating over and over, Dirt alert! Dirt alert! I opened my eyes, focused just long enough to see the ground rushing up like a freight train, then went limp and dark again. I composed my epitaph. Goodbye, cruel alien world. Sears and Roebuck must have flared out at the last moment, for I felt the nose rise majestically. Then the remaining tail section of the Fred ship, whatever was left, struck the ground with particular savagery, and the ship slammed belly first into what turned out to be silica sand. A miracle that proved my faith. Had it been granite or water, we would have been atomized. We were still traveling at, at, least, mo at least Mach 4 when we painted the desert and when we plowed a 27-kilometer furrow across the sand or across the surface of the planet, kicking up sandy rooster tails taller than the Buchanan building in the 40 seconds it took us to slide to a stop. <sighs> when the landing was over, we lay on the deck panting and gasping. Sears and Roebuck were out. They were used to a lot heavier gravitation than we, but that shock was a bit much even for them, being seated in the pilot's chair. The ship's safety procedures performed as advertised, shedding pieces of ship well back over the horizon to dissipate the energy while protecting the forward compartments of the ship where the most precious intelligent cargo would have clustered. Arlene was already sitting up on her butt when I awoke. Her head was back as she tried to staunch a pretty bad nosebleed. I tasted a lot of blood. 
but it was a few seconds before I realized I had lost my left, upper, outermost incisor. I vaguely looked for it, still somewhat groggy, but it was nowhere to be seen. I started to blink back to conscious awareness. Arlene saw that I was awake. Without lowering her head, she croaked. I guess that wasn't the world's greatest landing. Holding my jaw, which had started to throb, I had time to mutter a marine definition. A good landing is anything you walk away from. Then the pain really hit me all over, and I was busy gritting my teeth and stifling screams till Arlene kindly injected me with a pain suppressor and a stimulant from her combat armor medipouch. Oh, see ya. See ya, Avro. Thank you very much for the, the gift subs. I appreciate that. Have a good, have a good weekend. Sears and Roebuck woke up. Little the worse for wear. Shall we to outgo and face the new brave world? They cheerfully asked. It was the closest I'd ever come to fragging two of my own men. Chapter 7 complete. Alright, they've made it. They've made it to Skinwalker. Somehow, in Doom novels, it's totally okay to just fly your ship directly into stuff. But it keeps working out. <sighs> okay. Let's get back to... Yes, last we left, our heroes... They had flown across space and crashed on the newbie planet. The newbies being the race that has actually exterminated the demon race, or the race that was using the demons in their invasion of Earth, somehow, some for some reason, called the Freds. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why any of this. Okay. Clock reloaded. Thank you very much. Very appreciative of that. Chapter 8. Made an inordinate amount of sexual innu innuendo to describe a ship crash. Yeah. Arlene and Doomguy dragged themselves across the deck of a ship at like 8 Gs. Doomguy scraped a tooth off. So that's cool. Chapter 8. But they're, they're down on the planet now. They crashed into some sand. Everything's fine. Livable? asked Arlene, her voice hoarse and painful to hear. Sears and Roebuck grunted. Justice a minute, justice a minute. They tapped at several keys on the command console, humming and humming as the few sensors that had not burned off in the crash sampled the air, the radiation levels, the temperature, and looked for any dangerous bacteria, viruses, mold, or... Excuse me. A white Claw coming up. Chug Tungus. Thanks for the sub. Or thanks for gifting a sub. That's a good name. Chug Tungus. <sighs> Any dangerous bacteria, viruses, molds, or other microorganisms? Not to kill, they announced at last. Healthy? I gasped. Not to kill. Yeah, convenient answer incoming, right? Their irritating evasiveness put me on my guard, but what could we do? The ship's air seal was ruptured, and we would soon be sucking down Skinwalker's air, whether we wanted to or not. The machinery that manufactured the or, yeah, the machinery that manufactured the nutrition pills was back a kilometer in the ship and was probably smeared across the landscape. So we would be soon enough eating local food and drinking local water, if there was any, or dying of thirst and hunger. Our combat suits would serve as a limited shield against radiation, but they would only mitigate, not negate, the ill effects. For good or for ill, we were cast upon the shores of Skinwalker, afforded on offered only a wayfarer's bounty. God, how poetic. We would either be able to digest the local produce or die trying. We picked ourselves up off the floor, painstakingly peeling the deck plates away from our skin. Arlene wasn't hit as hard as I, less mass per surface area. Our armor was pounded hard, protective, protective value probably compromised, but still better than zip. Despite their chipper words, Sears and Roebuck had a hard time peeling themselves out of the command chair, which had survived remarkably intact. 
Arlene let me lean on her shoulders and our pilots supported each other as we limped to the emergency hatch. I pulled the activation lever. Explosive bolts blew outward, taking the hatch cover with them. Shaking, we climbed down the ladder, 200 meters or more. It was a straight shot, not staggered the way human ladders generally are. If one of us were to slip... I nervously watched Sears and Roebuck above me, but shouldn't have worried. Their legs may have been ridiculously short, but they were powerful, all due to the high gravity of the Clave homeworld. Arlene and I were more likely to slip and fall in the relatively modest gravity of the planet, about 0.7 g. The world looked like the Mojave Desert, or maybe we just happened to land in a desert area. I hadn't gotten much of a look during the crash. I looked up. The sky was too pale, but I saw an oddly but I saw oddly square clouds, almost crystalline. We had weather, evidently. Bending down, grimacing, I lifted a handful of sand. The grains were finer than earth sand, fine enough that I decided Arlene and I should wear our bio filters. Really, really fine silica can clog up your aviola and give you something like black lung disease. Thereafter, we spoke through throat mics into our lozenge receivers. I don't know what Sears and Roebuck did when I pointed out the problem. They had their own radio. The brownish-gray sandscape depressed me. Under a pale sky, the only spots of color were the green and black of our standard-issue combat suits and Sears and Roebuck's muted orange flight suits, which they had worn ever since the mission began. Everything else was the color of dingy gray socks that hadn't been washed in a month. Okay, SNR, what the hell did you mean about getting shot at? My tongue couldn't help exploring the new hole in my mouth where the tooth had been. The hole still throbbed, but the sharp pain was gone. Gotta get SNR to fix this, I promised. Meaned what was said. They were firing shots from cannons. Energy weapons, artillery shells, what? Extracting usable information from Sears and Roebuck was worse than sitting through a briefing by Lieutenant Weems. May he rest in peace for a good long time. I do like that we're still going back to, to Duncan on Weems. We got to bring that back. Did we get through the soundtrack? No. No, we did. Just between tracks. We're firing these slugs from the electromagnetic accelerating gun. Uh, a rail gun? Asked Arlene, picking up on the answer faster than I. Anything to do with exotic technology or weaponry was AS's subject. She could lecture for hours on ogre tanks and orbiting smart spears, and she sometimes did. Yes, the rail gun, confirmed Sears and Roebuck. I sort of knew what a railgun was. You took slugs of depleted uranium, encased them in ferromagnetic shell casing, and accelerated them to sever several kilometers per second velocity using electromagnets. The resulting gun could damn near put shells into any. The ah, the resulting gun could damn near put shells into orbit. They moved so fast they punched through any sort of imaginable armor like a bullet through thin glass. It was a horrific weapon we never had been able to make work properly. The first shot always destroyed the target, but also generally our railgun prototype. I licked dry lips. If the enemies, newbies, or Freds could build tactical-sized versions, our combat armor would be utterly useless, even if we took a shot, or if we ever took a shot, we'd be toast. The desert was evidently deserted. But the solitude did not begin to compare to the vast loneliness of the starry void. I stared at the desolation, taking some comfort in the feel of ground beneath my feet, the breath of wind against my armor. The air smelled tangy, ozone. But so far as I was bre or, but so far I was breathing all right. Hey, S and R, I called softly under such a sky. Is that ozone from our ship, or is it natural to the atmosphere? We didn't detect it orbally. Or, uh, orbitally, they said, uh, in unison. I shrugged. If any of us had asthma, it might have been a problem, but I never had any. Arlene's was cured by the doctors at NAMI, and Sears and Roebuck could take care of themselves. Okay. 
Which way towards the dinks who were shooting at us? Arlene asked. Sears and Roebuck turned slowly through the entire 360-degree panorama, then they pointed basically along the 27-kilometer trench our ship had dug. Arlene turned towards me, raising her brows like a pair of question marks. Toward or away from danger? Didn't seem to be much of a choice. SNR had detected no signs of civilization on the planet. No power lines, power plants, canals, or structures larger than two or three stories. If there was anything smaller, it wouldn't have shown up on their quick microwave scan. So far as I could tell, the only sign of intelligent life was the gun battery that had pounded our ship into rubble. Oh, what the hell. Let's at least eyeball the wogs and see who they are. That seems like a slur, but it's for aliens. How could it be? Uh, my guess is they don't belong here any more than we do. The air temp on the desert Arlene dubbed the Anvil of God was livable. Sears and Roebuck hadn't lied. They never claimed it was comfortable, and 60 degrees centigrade certainly didn't qualify. Isn't so interesting. Autobot caught that word. W-O-G-S. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> alien slurs. Yikes. Yeah, I'm going to get... I'm going to get canceled off alien slurs tonight. 60 degrees centigrade sounds like it's not livable, though. Yeah, it's 140 degrees. I guess you can survive at that temperature. Fahrenheit. Oh, it's a common slur in Australia to refer to most European immigrants. Ah, okay. Aren't Australians all European immigrants? I mean, yeah, I get it. Uh, I guess Americans don't think we're, we don't think we're British. Okay, let's see. Our helmets kept the direct sunlight off our heads, and we had several days' worth of water if we used the re recirc option, pissing into a tube and recycling it back into the drinking nipple. Arlene was not happy about doing that. Being a female, this means she had to strip and pee into a bedpan-like device, whereas I just wore a sheath. There were no trees, so no privacy. She could have turned her back, but in a typical act of defiance, AS just did it right in front of me and the clave. I pretended nonchalance, as if women urinated in front of me all the time. I hadn't done it before anyway in combat situations, but in reality, I was shocked and embarrassed every damn time. I wasn't sh but I sure wasn't about to let Arlene know that. I would never hear the end of it. Damn. Alpha pissing? So Arlene is like out chatting Doom Guy right now by just whole ass popping a piss squat right in front of him on an alien planet. I'm glad they're, they're writing through that. This is really important that they're describing all this. Wait, what is that, Demi? I'm worried now. It doesn't feel good to see it in chat. Even if I don't think it's a... Oh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> exactly, Dark. A whole paragraph about this woman taking a piss. <laughs> but how she does it defiantly because she's so strong and tough. We cut off the furrow about two clicks laterally and paralleled it, figuring that whoever was shooting at us would follow the skid marks to see where he had shot down. Or see what he had shot down. The armor monitored the outside air, regulating heat venting to prevent us showing a hot signature on an infrared optical device. And we kept the mics cold and ultra short range. And we kept, oh, outside of five to seven meters, the fuzzy signal attenuated into the black background noise. We had a reasonably good chance of not getting caught, and damn it, I wanted to see those bastards with their itchy trigger fingers see them up close and personal. Ah, oh, Google says the maximum body temperature human can survive is 108.14 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess the body can sweat, and I guess they have suits. They have protective suits that are protecting them from heat. Let's see. We had passed directly over the battery about 50 clicks back. The journey would take us at least two days in some, but after only 10 kilometers, we ran into a scouting party 
from the uh from the wogs driving some kind of land cart not literally ran into we picked them up when they were still five clicks range tracking directly along our ship's wake thrusting trusting to our electronic countermeasures we lopped toward them until we were within half a click at that point, we dropped to our bellies and crawled the remaining distance while the bad guys broke for lunch. Arlene and I were both hungry, but we were rationing our Fred food, and especially our Fred pills. We got within 100 meters, easily within range of my M14 bar and the lever-action 45 caliber rifle that Arlene toted for these occasions, where a shotgun just wouldn't do. We watched them through our scopes, trying to figure out who they were. They looked oddly human, but their heads and bodies were covered by thick pressure suits that might have battlefield capability. Their proportions were humanoid. There were four scouts and one supervisory type with a notepad built into his wrist armor. I can smell an officious jerky sergeant a click off. Sarge, Arlene said faintly over the radio. There's no cover, but we can pop most of them before they burrow into the sand. We can take them before they know what hit. They might not even get off a message. I hesitated. Not a good move for a battlefield non-com. But sometimes you really don't have enough intel. Hold your fire, AS. Let's see if we can hear them first. I programmed my electronic ears to scan sequentially all 64 million channels looking for anything non-random. I got a few tiny bursts of information, but nothing, lasted the long nothing that lasted longer than 0.02 seconds, according to the log. You pick up anything? I asked. Fly, I'm getting bursts of pattern from channel 23, 18, 190 that last about 0.02. They all last about that long. Are you seeing that? Now that you mention it. I think whoever they are, they use much, narrow frequency, much narrower frequency channels than we can use. We're kind of scanning past them by scanning up and down within the channel. Let me small this thing down and just scan up and down that frequency. Stand by. I would have done the same thing, except I hadn't exactly paid attention during my techie classes in radio comm. I waited, fuming, while Arlene made the necessary software adjustments. I kept the aliens in my scope following their progress up the road formed by our long skid to, the, to rest. Finally, she finished tapping at her wrist and came back to me. Here, plug into me. I fitted my female connector over her wrist prongs. A couple of seconds later, I started hearing what were obviously I started hearing what obviously were words and recognizable sentences. There was something damnably familiar about the rhythms and pauses in the speech. I was sure I had heard it before. Even the words sounded tantalizingly close to something I could understand. A little clearer than Dutch, I reckoned. If I strained, I could almost make out what they were saying. I realized with a chill that there was no almost about it. I did understand them. They were speaking English. But it was a harsher, colder kind of English, peppered with utilitarian grunt-like words that I had never heard. I could even tell who was speaking by the odd mannerisms they used when they made a point. Now that I knew they were human, I could even see their body language expressions, that they held themselves with a studied limpness that irritated me. With omissions, I heard an exchange between the sergeant and one of the scouts. Are... Okay, so there's a lot of... Christ. There's a lot of, like, words in brackets here. Uh, It says, like, new word in brackets. A lot. Because instead of just making up new words, I guess they just described the fact that they were hearing new words. So I'll just say new word, and every time, instead of them actually saying new word, they're saying some new word that doom guy doesn't understand and the way that they're representing that here is by saying new word in brackets okay okay our new word new word destroyed ship officer two carried it new word sub sir saw it new word was fred pattern match was new word old ship from new word should have new word shot back don't like this. Something new word. New word circle around impact. New word and new word from another different quarter. Power emissions? Moving infrareds? 
radio or radioisotope. New word, subsur, new word, dead cold. Don't new word circle, approach new word, but cautiously. I could follow their conversation despite missing every third or fourth word. They debated, they debated whether we had been destroyed or not. Their voices were distant and cold, as if they were discussing an advertising campaign instead of military campaign. They sounded totally dispassionate, like perfect soldiers. I tried to hate them because of what they had done to us, shooting us down and nearly killing us all, but I just couldn't. Right or wrong, they were ours, and Marines always believe in pulling a buddy out of the crossfire. Besides, they had obviously thought we were Fred's. Arlene gripped my upper arm so intensely she left indentations that would probably remain for hours. Evidently, she figured it out at the same time I did. We didn't talk. Knowing they were English-speaking humans made us too nervous to rely on the short, effective range of our mics. I spoke to her in hand signals. Circle around. Isolate one. Capture alive. I wanted to get that sergeant. I pointed to the stripes on my left shoulder and Arlene nodded. Before she could move out, the prey moved away on foot this time. Hey, what's up, Seismic? Welcome. This book has to be a troll. Something like this can't be real. Oh, it's real. Four novels of this trash. It's incredible. I'm going to guess that the humans actually won. Like the humans somehow evolved and won and now they're encountering like advanced humans. And now they're the aliens. Caged Money, thanks for gifting out five subs. Ah, sorry, I bonked my mic. Uh, thank you, thank you. We paralleled them, following them back the way we had come. Arlene and I skulked, but Sears and Roebuck simply walked normally. I made them follow about 250 meters back and hope they had different... Decent infrared jamming. I was desperately hungry for the sergeant, but when one of the humans fell behind, it was one of the scouts instead. Well, if beggars were horses, choosers would, wi choosers would wish. Huh? If beggars were horses, horses, if beggars were horses, choosers would wish. Around the other side, I signaled to Corporal Sanders. She shuffled silently through the sand, cutting around behind the straggler. Three, I signaled. Two, one, now! Arlene and I charged forward from the dink's left and right rear quarters, tackling him before he even saw us. I pushed my forearm against his throat and leaned hard, cutting off any sound he might try to make, while Arlene ripped away every wire and fiber optic cable she could find. The prisoner stared at me. Eyes as big as dinner plates. He clawed at my arm, trying to pull it loose so that he could suck in a breath of air, but I wasn't budging. Arlene ran her receiver antenna all across the body, along every limb, and even up his crotch. She found two transceivers, two tiny, fragile nodules sewn inside his uniform. She plucked them free and destroyed them by crushing them between her thumb and middle finger. I let loose on his throat just in time. He sucked in huge lungfuls of air, trying to breathe through the ozone. I grabbed him under his arms. Arlene got his feet and we ran, carrying him between us for about half a click. We pushed him into the dust and lay next to him. Arlene cuffed him with a plastic tie. She had plastic ties? How did she have plastic ties? They've been on an alien ship for months that just crashed it. Whatever. While I lay across him and watched his pals through the scope. It took them another 200 meters before they realized he had been picked off, and they backtracked. But by then, the fickle wind had blown the ultra-fine sand around, obliterating our tracks. As they began to fan out for a spiral search, calling him repeatedly over the radio, A.S., Sears, and Roebuck, and I withdrew far from the canyon carved by the Fred ship, and even that gouge was filling, starting to be hard to spot. At two kilometers, directly perpendicular to our trail, I called a halt. A halt. I figured we were far enough along now that they weren't likely to find us anytime soon, now that we had destroyed all the prisoners' electronic tells, we hoped. I knelt down next to the guy. He looked vaguely Mongolian and vaguely Mediterranean, a perfectly normal human with black hair and dark brown eyes. Dark complected, with a slight with slight oriental folds over his eyes. But from when? 
How far advanced was he over us? What had left Earth some three or four hundred years ago? I wasn't really sure of the conversion factor, but when did he leave? I drew my boot knife and rested it alongside his neck. Chill, brother, I said, then thought better of it. Language had evidently changed in several centuries, best to avoid expressions as much as possible and stick to basic English. We are humans. Jeez. I'm having to poke a lot of holes in auto mod today. I said, okay. We need information. Why are you here? The moment he felt my knife, the prisoner relaxed. He seemed to resign to his fate, whether it was death or release. He listened intently, then nodded a few seconds after I finished. Yes. Y yes, he said, with a strange pronunciation of the vowel. It came out like yows. Okay, never mind. Yows. No, you don't understand, I persisted. Why are you here? Yows. We came from Earthground Planet. I can tell. Cut the crap, Arlene snarled. I drew my finger across my throat and she shut up. What was the reason for you to come? I tried again. My prisoner seemed only too eager to talk, something which always sets off alarm bells in my head. I mean, why should he want to help us? Yes, yes. We have arrived. Unintelligible. To chase. What are you chasing? New word. Aliens. When you come from. I told him the year we left, and his brows shot up instantly. He didn't take time to calculate what that was a dog year, so I presumed when he left, people still used the same calendar we did. Taggart, Sanders, I said, introducing us. They are Sears and Roebuck, but don't ask me which is which. Or even if the concept had meaning to the binary clave. Joe's pays? Ho Jose Paze? He's saying his name, I think. The alien guy. We'll say Jose Paze. Jose Paze. Papo Handos. New word. Fine, new word. Jose Paze? It's J O S C P A Z E. J O S E P A Z E. Joe's pays. Jose Paze. I don't know. I don't know, dude. This must be what people who had a stroke hear when other people speak. <laughs> it's just like, it sounds like words, but there's no meaning there. It's not, it's not spaced out either. This is one, that's his first name. Papu Hondas is his last, last name. P-A-P-O-U-L-H-A-N-D-E-S. Papulhandes. Yeah, I could use a semicolon, couldn't it? He looked down for a moment. It was ritualized, and I figured it probably meant what nodding your head meant in our time. Jose Pause. What aliens did you chase here? He struggled, obviously trying to avoid any new expressions that would confuse me. I was still suspicious of his level of cooperation, but he seemed to have given up any concern about his duty, his unit, even his own life. It was like everything had lost all meaning now that I had a blade against his carteroid artery. I was used to people relaxing if they thought they were about to die, but this was entirely too apathetic. Aliens evolved fast, he said at last. Conquered Earth, killed, left, followed here. Arlene and I looked up at each other, and I swallowed hard. Newbies? How the hell had they gotten all the way to Earth and back? The evil chill settled across my back and camped there for the night. And that ends chapter, chapter 8. Phew! Jose Paze, a new character, has entered the ring. A hyper-evolved human from hundreds of years in the future that barely speaks English, I guess. Yeah, I guess if, if you tried to talk to somebody from the 1600s, it'd be a little awkward. Oh, it's nearly 420 for our friends in Queensland, Australia. 
Delightful. There's a few Australian viewers. Phew. All right, let's get back to Doom. That was a handful of a chapter. Yeah, it, uh, only a little bit racist. A little rough, though. Less crackling than VHS. Yeah, the VHS had, like, fun little noise spurts. All right. Chapter 9. The evil ice that gripped me around my lower back was a premonition of horrors to come. While I straddled that doofus, holding my commando knife to his throat and wondering why in the hell he didn't make even a pretense of resisting the interrogation, I suddenly noticed an unaccustomed quiet. I looked up. Lance, what aren't I hearing? She stared around, puzzled. Where the freak are those freaks? Sears and Roebuck. The clave. Oh, oh yeah, here, let me, uh. Let me reset the, uh. Goals and stuff here. Update the clock. We got a little low there. I don't want to freak anyone out. Right. There we go. All right. The clave, binary to the root, never managed to keep perfectly silent. All the stray little thoughts that run through a human's head run back and forth between the two parts of a clave pair. Either spoken directly out loud or at least sub-vocalized. They never stopped. It got on my nerves for the first few weeks I knew them, then I pretty much forgot all about it, never even noticing when they muttered back and forth to each other. Just as I couldn't tell Sears from Roebuck, even if that concept made sense. Did they have separate names? I don't think they did. Sears and Roebuck being the single name of the single pair. And I couldn't tell one voice from the other. Eventually I dismissed all the muttering like I would a marine who just couldn't stop mumbling to himself. I hushed them when necessary for an ambush. Otherwise, I ignored it as their unique craziness. Maybe it was ordinary among Clave. Maybe they were considered loony even among others of their kind. Hell, I knew they were. They volunteered to accompany us, far away from anyone to resurrect them if they died. I didn't notice the constant rumbling until it suddenly vanished, replaced by the eerie silence of the uninhabited planet we all hunted across for trace of the newbies. The sifting sand was so fine it made no whisper as one grain brushed against another, and there were no trees to sigh in the persistent wind. Every sound from Arlene and me was magnified a thousand times by the surrounding silence. I should have heard Sears and Roebuck as if they were half a click of- wait. I should have heard Sears and Roebuck if they were half a click away. Where the hell did they- Arlene and I stared around wildly. I felt the prick of eyeballs on the back of my neck, whichever way I turned. Long ago, I learned to trust my fly stinked. I pointed to my own eyes and hooked a thumb over my shoulder. Arlene nodded, picked up her lever action, and braced it against the crook of her arm. The bastard must have had a homing device we couldn't pick up with our own receivers. I knew it couldn't be that easy, but well, the, where the hell were they? I pointed my boot on the prisoner's chest and stared past Arlene. We each took half the clock. I glanced down at the human. He wasn't going anywhere, so I lifted my foot and slid sideways to get a better scan. My foot slipped in the sand and my heart stopped. But I recovered my balance with the loss... With... I recovered my balance with the loss only of my dignity. Flynn stinked? It was right there. Nope, fly stinked. Yeah, F-L-Y dash S-T-I-N-C-T. Fly stinked. Arlene got the 45 up against her chest, ready to rock and roll, but not up to her eye. She didn't want to start focusing on sand dunes or heat reflections and miss something move. I knew my rifle was cocked with a... I knew my rifle was cocked with a round in the chamber, but I had an almost irresistible urge to run the bolt once more. I fought the compulsion. Last thing I wanted was to look nervous in front of my man. I should have worried about, or I should have worried instead about, wait. I should have worried instead about looking dead. I heard the crack of the firearm exactly the same moment I felt the kick in the back of my vest. Not quite a perfect shot, a little high, but with a rifle, you don't need to be perfect. 
The round delivered enough energy to kick me forward onto my face and send my own M14 flying into the sand, where it promptly buried itself. It didn't matter. I was too busy fighting blackness and the pain. I was too busy fighting blackness and the pain in my shoulder, which even in my state, I could tell was blown all to hell to worry about grabbing for my gun. Dim and distant, I heard Arlene's rifle barking again and again as she sprayed the area where the shot had come from. Then she went down hard, but held onto her piece. I guess the shot that hit me must have snuck right past my armor to take out my left shoulder. I rolled over onto my right side to get away from the pain, but it followed me, and blood dribbled across my helmet faceplate. This was bad. Really bad. I've never... I'd never been shot this bad before. Isn't that perverse? First time, on a planet hundreds of light years or more from Earth, in the desert sand with only my loving friend, Lance Corporal Arlene Sanders, to watch me die on foreign shores. Now, I was babbling. So the, the semicolons have backed off. Not nearly as many M dashes either. Still a fair amount though. Just interesting to notice. Maybe AS wouldn't be seeing anything anyway. She was down pretty bad too. <laughs> she was down bad. Not enough to stop shooting, but I figured she was aiming by instinct now. Our prisoner was screaming in utter terror, louder than even Arlene's rifle. Jesus, what a weenie. Show some freaking backbone. Take it like a man. Arlene took it like a man. She couldn't see for crap because she'd taken another shot. This one off the faceplate of her helmet. Cracking it like a spider web. Must have missed her brain because she held her forty-five rifle up and tried to shoot over me. She couldn't see. I kept telling myself she couldn't see, even when one of her shots hit me in the freaking hip. I didn't feel it by then. I was screaming myself now, screaming about all the evil crap I was going to do to the sons of bitches who were plinking us from God knows where, to them and their freaking mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and neighbors, and burn all their houses down and sow their fields with salt. Arlene was screaming, fly, fly, fly! Letting fly until she burned right through the mag. Okay. Doom soundtrack is over. Going back to Doom. <sighs> okay, things are bad. Precious red stuff poured out of my uniform now, finding the cracks in the armor. Arlene took one in the belly, and even with the flak jacket, she doubled over gasping and sucking for air. Just before I went black to cro- Wait. Just before I went black to cross the river sticks with pennies on my eyes, I felt hands grab me by the bad arm and yank me over. I think I screamed with pain again, but I couldn't match the utterly terror-stricken stri shrieks of the prisoner. God, what a wiener. God, what a wiener. Really says that. Awesome. So long, Arlene. Semicolon. So long, Fly Taggart. Semicolon. Semper Fi, Mac. Semicolon. It sure was nice to wear the eagle and anchor for so many years. Damn, I was glad to die a sergeant instead of a corporal. I drifted through black storm clouds, feeling like I was falling endlessly backwards, dizzy with vertigo. I kept jerking, trying to jerk awake, like you do when you're in a horrid nightmare and you know you're just under the surface between sleep and wake. Dark dementia and the cold light of dawn. But I couldn't do it. I hovered there grabbing for the surface, but it was just out of my grasp. My brain would not reboot. I felt the pain, but from outside. When I was a kid, I used to watch the X-rated pictures over at the Cover Girl Drive-In. I could see them from a treetop in the woods between our farmhouse and the town outside of Bartleston. I couldn't hear the sound, and the picture was shaky in my binoculars, but there it was. Sex on the screen. Bigger than I ever wanted in real life. Or, sorry. Bigger than I ever wanted real life to be. That was me in my blackness, feeling my pain but a distance, not quite reconnected with myself.
Okay, fly. Right. I can see how being in a coma would be like watching porn from a tree. Yeah. Yes. That is, in fact, the first thing I would think of. The most understandable and relatable analogy, certainly. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, Doom Guy is a lover and a poet. Warrior poet. <sighs> I slowly swam back. I gathered I wasn't dead, unless the penguins were all wrong about everything and hell was repeating the fallen world endlessly. Penguins? I don't understand. I blinked awake and felt the agony for real at last. Plunging my teeth against the ripping pain, I pulled against my restraints, but by God, I was not going to give those bastards a scream. Plunging all my teeth? Jeez, they'd fixed my mouth. Arlene lay mostly in a field of vision. Er, Arlene lay mostly in my field of vision. I blinked away the tears and noticed the pallor of her skin. She had lost a lot of blood, probably more than I had, and she was white as the cliffs of Dover overlooking the English Channel. I watched closely. I could ignore the pain if I had something else to draw my attention. Her chest rose and fell regularly, and every so often she moved her, fleet, her feet slightly. Arlene Sanders was alive, but by how much? We were both strapped down to gurneys in, gun, in a gunmetal gray room fitted with couches and what might have been a sink, but without any visible faucet. I leaned back, silently sobbing, and stared at the overhead. A darker version of the bulkhead color without thousands of t hmm. wait what? A darker version of the bulkhead color with thousands of tiny bright holes. Some sort of light source, I reckoned. The door opened, and the clipboard sergeant we'd spotted earlier entered, probably in response to my neural rhythms changing with coming awake. He walked all around me in a counterclockwise circle, looking at dials and readouts and scribbling on his clipboard. He didn't say a word, even when I talked to him. Hey, you, where am I? Am I aboard your ship? We're not the aliens you're looking for, but we're looking for them too. Can you hear me? I'm a human from Earth like you, from about two centuries before your time. He left without a second glance at me, the puke. But about ten minutes of agony later, his boss arrived. This guy was tall and thin, about my height, but twenty kilos lighter, and had sandy hair and a beard with carefully shaven stripes of bare skin in it. He wore a form-fitting t-shirt that made him look ridiculous. No muscle. A total pencil neck dweeb. Tweety black with a red spiral coiled around his forearm. Possibly a rank insignia? He walked like a commissioned officer. They make my neck hair stand on end, and I never know how to react to one. He spoke to me, slowly, and I got most of the words. You are human. Harry Papers showing you are... Unknown word. United States Marine Sergeant America. Unknown word. Taggart Flynn. I am... Am over Captain Raul Tokugawa... Toku... Gavita. Like he's just smashing a Japanese and an Indian word together. Ru Ruol Toku Gavita. People's Democratic Defense Forces. Are trapped out of time like you. Pursuing mutates here. To keep them off Earth. How long, sir? Hundred and seven years. He seemed emotionally detached. But he watched me narrowly. He hadn't been away as long as Arlene and I had, but a century wasn't a fortnight, like us, over Captain Togu Gavita, would return to a different world than he had left. He left his world behind, where it never would be found. <laughs> Glad we said that twice. I felt an immediate sympathy for the over-captain, but I wasn't sure I trusted those alien eyes. Sir, is there a United States of America still? Are we the last Marines? No, Sergeant. 
but people state of earth. Is there a constitution? The people need no pact against themselves. Live each for the commons. Live for each other. Crap, 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 crap. So in the end, we finally lost the battle for individual sovereignty. Oh no, space Reaganism is dead. No. In their dark hour, humanity turned to communism. Oh, this author is seething. They're the one writing the story, though. They keep remarking how hyper-individualism isn't working out. Weird. Keep changing... Keep changing teams, really. Ah, okay. I lay back, grimacing, but it wasn't the shoulder pain. I could stand that. Now, not only... Wait. Now, not only didn't I know where and when we were, I didn't even know what we were. I wasn't sure that we were U.S. Marine Corps anymore. I didn't think I'd make much of a fast fashion splash with a blue helmet and a patch that read People's Army of Socialist Liberation or whatever the hell they were. <laughs> like, oh, these fucking dweebs aren't going to wear cool clothes, but they don't have fun guns. Yeah, right away, he was like, look at this pencil neck dweeb. Some kind of communist bullshit. God. Oh, great. Uh, you can't go home again, as old Thomas Wolfe said. Fine, I thought. Screw you and your whole people's state of everything. No matter who was in charge or what they called themselves, by God, there was one U.S. Marine left alive still. Two Marines. I knew damned well that Lance Corporal Arlene Sanders stood with me on this one. If the only humans left were weirdo socialists, then we would sign up to help. Oh, then we would sign up to help the socialists. Jesus, what else could we do? All right, good. Good job, Doom Guy. You got around to it eventually. <sighs> oh, sorry. Arlene. He's remembering. Yeah. He was, he was that close to forgetting Arlene. He really was. It says Arlene in all italics. He's like, oh. Is the other all right? I said, my voice growing hoarse with the effort. Over Captain Toku Gavita looked over at her, reading invisible readings. Damn it, sorry. It's weird in my eye. Ah, I'm just getting torn up about this book. Maybe they were projected... Wait. Oh yeah, the invisible readings. Maybe they were projected somewhere and you needed a contact lens filter to see them. I don't know, but he was definitely reading them from something right over her bed. And I couldn't see anything. Is alive and progressing. Sad you had to shoot, but didn't know who you were and what you wanted. Oh, sad had to shoot. My bad. So he's saying they're sad they had to shoot her. Sad had to shoot, but didn't know who you were, what you wanted, came in enemy ship, in league with enemy. I grunted noncommittally. It was a screw up all the way around. They shot at the Fred ship, then we grabbed one of them in response, then they opened fire on the people who'd kidnapped one of their troopers. Man. Something irrational inside me insisted that I would forgive them for shooting me. Hell, I already forgave Arlene for shooting me. But I would never forgive them for shooting my buddy. But there was nothing I could do about my anger. Not now, not ever. Not if I wanted to make the best of a bad situation and return the overcaptain's or return to the overcaptain's earth. I let the overcaptain apologize and made him feel like I was willing to let the dead past. I was willing to let the dead past bury its dead, even if I decided to do something to him later. It was still best to make nice, if only to lull him into a false sense of security. It's all right, I said carefully. I understand why you shot. I won't mention it again. The overcaptain smiled. The interview was proceeding nicely, but only because I let it. The overcaptain stared at me for a long time, so long that I started to fidget. I didn't know what he wanted. At last, he cleared his throat and spoke again. We're in imminent fear of death? Huh? 
You were afraid you were going to die when we were shooting. Couldn't he leave ill enough alone? Uh, yes, sir. We figured we were going to buy it. He started to break down. He mumbled and looked at his notes and then cleared his throat again and flushed, or he cleared his throat again and flushed red. Why did you stand fight? How could you? How could I? What else would you expect a marine to do, sir? If I were going down, I wanted to take a few of the bastards with me. Uh, no offense, sir. So wait a minute. I think I know where this is going. Is Doom Guy, with his fiercely Reaganomic and, and libertarian principles, going to teach a pussified, na a pussified, like, hyper-evolved human race how to fight? Because he was, like, noticing how much that dude gave up as soon as he was about to get stabbed. This captain's like, how could you do it? He's just going to teach them how to be, like, fucking badass. He's going to show them, like, four John Wayne movies. Yeah, Demolition Man, exactly. They need his, uh, his ancient and primal nature. They're too, they're too evolved. Oh my god, it is Demolition Man. Wait, when did Demolition Man come out? Oh shit. Because this book came out in 96. Oh, that was 93. Okay. It took the writers a while to get here. Clearly that movie was, was long out before these books were written. Demolition Man is total recall for conservatives. <laughs> I never realized like what a what like a, a red state fantasy Demolition Man is. Yeah, because he like he teaches them how to fuck and then he joins up with like the underground resistance. Except they're all like underground hippies. He's not supposed to like them. He just beats up everything. Wait. Getting Taco Bell? Oh, <laughs> that's not failure. We all backslided to Taco Bell. <sighs> okay, all right, all right, all right. God damn it. I'm assuming a lot. This book never goes where I'm thinking it is, so, so maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. Yeah. Oh, jeez. The overcaptain grunted and scribbled in his gouge book. But after years in the field under fire, I can always tell when somebody is scared. And over Captain Tokugavita was hiding terror behind that mask of objectivity. Terror about what? I glanced to my right and saw that Arlene was awake, lying on her own side and following the exchange. It emboldened me, her being there. Sir, wait. Who's, who's talking? I think this is Doom Guy talking. Sir, can you tell me why Jose Paze just fell apart when we captured him? He sounded like he thought dying was the worst possible thing he could think of. As a soldier, don't you accept death as a possibility? Bad mistake. I already had to listen to a 20-minute lecture on what I already knew, that Homo Sap was the only race in the galaxy anyone had discovered who could actually die. But the more we talked about death and dying, the more agitated he became until his skin was pale. He was sweating, and his eyes darted left and right instead of fixing on me, as they had at the beginning of the interview. I suddenly realized the blindingly obvious. Over-Captain Tokugavita suffered, suffered from necrophobia, the irrational fear of death. He was asking how Arlene and I had managed not to panic under fire. Are, are they all necrophobic? I began to get very uneasy, squirming around on my table. How could a soldier with a morbid fear of dying rise to such a high rank? He, quest he asked a couple of wind-down questions designed to relax me. What battles I had fought in and something about types of food. The last reminded me of the pills that we needed to survive on somebody else's. Planet, I guess? That word's not there. The last reminded me of the pills we needed to survive on somebody else's, semicolon. But I figured that since they were human like us, we could probably eat their food directly. Then he left me alone to wonder how humans like... Then he left me alone to wonder how humans just like me, the over-captain and my erstwhile prisoner, so obviously could have no courage at all when it came to risking their lives. Arlene sat up on her table, grimacing and involuntarily clutching her stomach. Christ, she said, 
Are we the only humans left who still believe in honor and duty even unto death? Semper Fi and all that? I shook my head, lying back down against the hard, cold cushion. We've only had two examples. I'll bet seven to two that we'll eventually find that Toku Gavita is pretty, up is pretty unrepresentative of the soldiers even in his era. Well, Arlene should have taken those odds. Over the next four days, while my arm was still immobilized and Arlene slowly healed up, seven more soldiers wandered in to talk to me about death and ended up shaking like a leaf in a lawn blower. By the time I was ready for transport and my broken clavicle and arm joint were nearly mended, I had figured out that this entire band of humans were so paranoid with necrophobia that they fell all to pieces at even the thought of death. On the fifth day, I was up and about. They didn't rub my face into it during that convalescence that I was a prisoner. I had the run of their ship parked in the sand except for certain restricted areas around the engines and computer stacks. Parked in the sand? Okay. I didn't realize my life was about to take a hellish turn. Arlene and I were both summoned to separate but adjoining cabins in the stern of the human ship. Someone had suddenly decided that he simply couldn't live without knowing all about our ability to transcend the fear of death and dying. He decided to give us a little test. And that ends the ninth chapter. Where the hell are we going with this? What is this? What is this? What's going on? I really do hope it ends up with Doom Guy teaching the future human race how to not be pussies. And I'm using, like, I'm using that. I don't like using fe female pejoratives, really. Uh, but I feel like it's totally appropriate in this context because that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what this is. So, I'm using, it's the red state version of the word, which is still, it's still uh, misogynistic at its core, I think. But only, only, only a fun size amount. Ah, uh, all right. I'm going to get up and get some water. Then we'll get back to playing some Doom Eternal now that we're not on a green filter. It should be exciting. See you in just a second. All weapons freed. All right. Let's get this next chapter out of here. Oh, see you, DeVille. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Catch you next time. AI story generator activate? No, this is definitely going somewhere. Definitely. There's no chance it's not going somewhere. Do you hear me? No chance. Chapter 10. The human ship looked roughly like the Fred ship, except scaled down by a factor of four or five. They walked me up a bunch of spiral stairwells and into a small cabin, and suddenly the best buds routine ended. Before I could struggle or fight back, three guys grabbed me and forced me into a chair, then cuffed both ankles and my left wrist with plastic straps embedded in the seat. A wall suddenly paled and turned transparent, and I saw into the adjacent room where they'd taken Arlene. She was trussed up just as I was, two Christmas turkeys staring at each other through a bulkhead that had suddenly turned into a window. A large clock, the old-fashioned kind, faced me below the window. It was marked up to 60 by fives with a needle or and a needle was set at the far end of the scale. Next to the clock was a tube that looked disturbingly like the business end of a large bore rifle, something ghastly like 75 caliber. I did not like the looks. The overcaptain stood where I could see him. Have 60 seconds before the gun fires. Whoever moves lever first will live. Other will die. If no one moves, lever before time limit, both die. Oh, geez. He's, he's going to trolley problem these guys. Through the window, I saw another man talking to Arlene. From the same way she paled, I figured she had received the same instructions. Starts now, declared that malevolent thug, Toku Gavita, pressing a button on the top of the clock. The hand began to sweep downward, and I felt every orifice contract and clench. My mouth was dry. Even my tongue was sandpaper when I tried to lick my lips. Christ. Oh, Christ. Oh, see ya. See ya, Rox Teddy. 
See ya. Thanks for watching. <sighs> Christ, oh Christ. My right hand was free. The lever that would kill Arlene in easy reach. I made no move towards it. Through the glass or whatever it was, I could see Arlene equally miserable, equally immobile. I turned to the over-captain who watched with curious dispassion. I will kill you for this. You, as God and Jesus, are my witness. You will never live another day without looking over shoulder for me. Have 35 seconds, he declared, starting to look pale. Must push lever to live. Can't kill me if you're dead. My eyes bored back into his skull so hard he flinched and looked away. Ah, he looked away. My soul will return as a ghost and hound you into your grave. I promised my voice so low he could barely hear it. He began to shake and sat down abruptly on a chair, staring at my right hand. I deliberately clenched it into a fist and left it just barely touching the lever, but not moving it. Watch how a man dies. I promised, for the core in God we trust. What is this God? I curled my lip. If you don't know, I don't think I can tell you in 20 seconds. What is God? He demanded, practically screaming. Ugh. Faceless, thank you for gifting a sub. God is faith. Without faith, man is a beast. I looked at the clock. Ten seconds of life remained. So long, beast. Other will kill you. No, she won't. How do you know? Must, pu must push lever. Save yourself. I don't know. I have faith. Oh, sir. What? What? Screw you, sir. You're a walking dead man. The second hand swept through the last few seconds into the red. I closed my eyes and clenched my teeth, preparing for the blow that would open a hole in my chest the size of the Great Martian Rift. But instead of the explosion, I heard a loud snap. When I blinked my eyes open, I saw over Captain Toku Gavita, face wild and eyes staring, his hand still clutching the button at the top of the clock. He has no will, I realized. I've beaten the bastard. I deliberately slowed my breathing, trying to calm my pounding heart. Arlene's face was florid, the normally pale skin flushing deep pink, but her expression made me shudder. I had never seen my bud with such a cold, buried rage. The overcaptain unlocked me and the... The overcaptain unlocked me as the other man on the other side unlocked Arlene. I made no mention of my decision. I never go back on my word, and I had sworn to kill him. But that didn't mean I had to remind my target in case he had forgotten or not believed me. I noticed one strange thing. Back in the Corps, an officer might be in charge of an op and do most of the planning, but even have a batch of enlisted men do the actual physical grunt work, which is why they call us grunts. But here, aside from the initial strap-down, which required several helpers for a man my size, over Captain Tokugavita had done everything himself, despite the fact that there were numerous people around obviously of lower rank. Jesus, didn't they even have the concept of chain of command anymore? I rose, matching Arlene. Both of us marched from our staterooms angry and hot, and rejoined each other in the passageway. We said not a word all the way back to our quarters, then Arlene did something she only rarely does. She wrapped both arms around me and held tight for several minutes, reassuring herself I was still there. I stroked the shaved back of her head. After all these years, Lance Corporal Arlene Sanders had maintained that same high and tight she'd worn the first day I saw her, when she and Sergeant Gunnery, or Gunnery Sergeant Goforth played William Tell. When she was certain I wasn't going anywhere, she unburied her face and grabbed my uniform by the lapels. Fly, she said. These people are nearly starved to death for faith. You're an atheist, I pointed out. Doesn't just have to be faith in God. Is faith in anything outside and higher than themselves, like the core or honor or anything. They got the words. They talk about the commons as if that meant something to them. But it's just words. They don't really act like it. 
They act like they're totally individualist pigs. Social atoms, I agreed. The church always warned about the danger of social atomism, where you think only about yourself as an individual, not about your community, country, society. These so-called communists are the most socially atomist people I've ever seen. I see what you mean. They don't believe in anything, really. They're so communist, they're not communist? You don't say. Okay. Fly, there's something weird going on here with these people. I have a terrible feeling we're missing something big. Or something really, really small. But if we can get a hold of the fate lever... Women's intuition... Arlene rolled her eyes. All right, sure, call it that. But it doesn't change the fact that there's something hidden here. And by God, we're going to find it, bud. I mean, Sergeant, if we can get a hold of the faith lever somehow, I think we can move this mountain to Mohammed. Wow, okay. I blinked at the metaphor food processor action, but I got the general drift. That was what we call a high-level strategic victory condition. A blue sky goal. But at least it was something to shoot at. The holding cell was pretty civilized as far as those things go. We had a nice bunk. Arlene and I didn't mind shacking up. To sleep, that is. There was a fold-down toilet and sink, a table, even a terminal, except we couldn't figure out how to crack the security system around the local net. In fact, we couldn't get away from the initial set of menus which seemed to display informative non-authorized purrs as 3D letters floating above the keypad whenever we got far enough along any route. Our uniforms were starting to stink, but when you live in a ditch in Kefiristan... Oh, so it is K-E-F-I-R-I-S-T-A-N. Kefir. For eight months, you're thankful for any pair of trousers or camouflage jacket that doesn't actually get up and crawl away under its own mode of force. Arlene had more pressing needs as a woman, but she managed to explain enough to the guard that he brought some cotton, which she wrapped in a cloth torn from the tail of her shirt. God only knew what she was going to do tomorrow. Okay. I sat down on my bunk, flexing the arm that by all rights, flexing the arm that by all rights should be, should have been broken and immobilized for months. Hey, AS, you notice anything remarkable here? She barely glanced up from the terminal, trying yet again. You mean besides our miraculous medical cure? I meant the medical. I was pretty damn shot up. You even. I paused. I had been about to tell her that she even shot me once herself, but I decided there was no point. Why make her feel like crap? Even you should have had some really bad bruises, even if your armor took all the shots. But I know I had at least four bullets in my arm and one in my leg, and one of the ones in my arm took out my rotator cuff. Oh, Brad, I don't know if it's a really bad slur. Somebody, it is a, it's not a nice term. Somebody said it stood for unbeliever, I believe. But it's K-E-F-I-R. Kef here. But maybe, I don't know. I'm, I'm culturally ignorant there. I really don't know. Oh, it's something different in South Africa? Ah, okay. Not a slur, just someone who doesn't believe. Hey, what's up, Chronicle? Yeah, this is, this is some casual doom, and we're reading the Doom novel. Oh. Oh. The slur for a black person, especially in Africa. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, it's technically, that's not what it is. I'll try to be a little more explicit about the pronunciation. Phoenix Orion, thanks for the sub. Oh, Chronicle, thanks for gifting five subs. Oh, you guys are going to get another chapter, huh? You guys are going to get another chapter, huh? Let's see. I stood, moving my arm in a slow but steady circular arc. So how come I could do all this? I winced, but the point was that I could do it at all. She shrugged. Fly, there's 200 years, 
They are 200 years more advanced than we are. Wouldn't you expect them to be able to perform medical miracles? I'm more surprised by something you haven't even noticed yet, Sarge. I waited. When she didn't continue, I growled. Ah, look at the ship, she said hastily. I looked around our jail cell. For what? Everything's pretty ship shape. As what's his face, that CPO out of point Mogu would say. What? Okay. Squared away, sharp corners, nice right angles, everything our size, sink and toilet perfectly fitting us humans, and obviously integral to the ship, not an add on. Oh. Light began to draw. Light began to dawn on Marblehead. You mean this ship was built by humans? Sarge, this ship was built by humans. She stood, making a wide gesture that included the entire ship, not just our little white cell. All of it, the whole ship, was built by human beings. And I'll bet if we looked at the engines, they would say Pratt and Whitney or Northrip. Jesus, so we're out in space on our own now. Not just piggybacking on a clave ship or hijacking some Freds. I stared. Everywhere I looked... Now that I was looking for it, the decor screamed Western European American human. Even the language was basically English with a lot of slang words we didn't know. All right, so the Earth had become some sort of social, welfare, semi-capitalist, worldwide government. But it was still ours. We had won the freaking battle. Oorah! Notice something else about the ship, Sarge? Look, knock it off with the Sarge stuff. I'd rather be fly when we're alone. Save it for the troops. What else about the ship? Sorry, fly. Uh, oh, that's right. You weren't conscious when they load us ab loaded us aboard. Fact is, I thought... Sure, you were dead. I was barely awake myself, and after they got me here, they shot me full of tranks. And I was out until I woke up with you. She leaned towards me, tapping her eyes. But I wasn't completely unconscious when they scooped us up after the Battle of Quicksand Hill. I pretended to be, but I got an earful. Or she got an eyeful, excuse me. What had the Earth become? A social welfare, semi-capitalist, worldwide government. That's what the Earth is now, I guess, according to Doom Guy. All right, spit it out, Lance. What did you see? Huh. Now you're the one with the rank things, Sergeant Fly. I got a good look at the outside of the ship. Two things. First, there are English language markings on it. Or at least they're using our alphabet. This thing is designated TA-303. Does that mean there are several hundred ships in the human fleet? I scratched my head and shrugged. I don't know how the Navy numbers ships read. If it still even is the Navy. But you're probably right that they won't be numbering in the hundreds if there were only three or four of them. And second, fly dude, the thing was tiny. Barely 350 meters long and no wider than an aircraft carrier from our era. I thought about the Fred ship. Ah. Uh, 3.7 kilometers long and almost half a click in diameter. Most of that was engine, which meant... Arlene, are you saying this ship is much more advanced than the Fred ship? Not just an engineering tech fly. Did you notice when they took us up to the torture theater, we went up a long series of spiral ladderways? Yeah, so... We went up about eight flights. Yeah, so? Why, that's more than the diameter of the ship. Yeah, so? I froze in mid-dismissal. The significance suddenly struck me. If you ascended past the center line of the Fred ship while the ship was parked on the tarmac, suddenly all the decks would be upside down. The Fred's induced acceleration that functioned like gravity by spinning the circular ship so that the outer deck had the heaviest gravity and the inner core was zero G. But the ship was built like a building. They never intended gravity to pull in any direction but one. Christ, girl, we've got artificial gravity. Real artificial gravity, like in Star Trek. Okay, so now they're saying it. Ugh. I sat down and thought for a moment. Arlene, didn't Sears and Roebuck say that the gravity zones left behind by the first ones, the guys who built st the stuff on Phobos and Deimos, the gates and stuff, couldn't possibly work on a ship? Not even theoretically? She nodded gravely. Yep, obviously this ship is more advanced than the ones the first ones built. Fly, I've been trying to reconcile all of this. Oh! 
Dimmy gifting out 10 subs. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I have been trying to reconcile all this with the pace of the of human technological development. And maybe I'm just getting cynical in my old age. I don't think so. I still think we can take control here and win this thing, but criminy fly. So many criminies. Ah, interstellar travel and artificial gravity and extraordinary medical advances all in a couple of hundred years. Starting from a completely destroyed civilization? I stared, saying nothing. The creepiest feeling was dawning across me. Fly, does that sound reasonable to you? Even considering that we evolved so much faster than the clave or the Freds? I slowly shook my head. When we left Earth, we were fighting for our lives. Humanity had been set back at least 50 or 75 years. Our cities destroyed, nuked, bacteriophages sweeping the globe. The Freds had just perfected their ultimate terror weapon, genetically engineered monsters that looked just like human beings until they opened fire on you. The aliens had the power to move entire planets around like bowling balls. And they had what we called the Fred Ray, an immensely powerful blob of energy that cut down everything in its path. Bayonetta's pink sweater from the beginning of Bayonetta 3 has become a trans meme. Really? Like wearing the sweater? That's pretty great. It was a good sweater. I love the more casual 60s wear in Bayonetta 3. <sighs> Arlene was right. It was pretty freaking hard to believe that in only two centuries we'd move from that to this. In fact, Arlene... I know of only one race that moves that fast. You and me both, Sarge. I mean, fly. I looked around, feeling my stomach, stomach clench. These guys are newbies, not humans. She shook her head. No. Why would the newbies evolve into human-looking critters? They go forward, not back. Look, we know these guys left Earth a hundred years ago, two centuries after we did, but we don't know when or if they encountered the newbies, or when they suddenly got this explosive burst of technological creativity. What if? What if I took over for her? The newbies ran into humans decades ago. Look, we don't know where the newbie homeworld is. Maybe it's closer to Earth than the Fred base we went to first. Less than 60 light years away. What if somehow they met us and influenced us to evolve more at the newbie rate than our normal rate, fast though it was? Arlene leaned close. Not that it would help if there were sensitive dish mics trained on us to pick up every sound. What if the newbies are here after all? Here with the humans, but we just can't see them for some reason. I told her about the overcaptain reading invisible readouts from somewhere above Arlene's prostate form in sick bay. This ain't good, Lance. I don't like the idea of invisible newbies running around like ghosts in the machine. That's not what ghosts in the machine means, you asshole. God damn it. <laughs> Maybe if they are in the systems, I guess. I mean, that newbie on the ship disappeared. But no, they found him. They found him and they shot him with real-life bullets. Never mind. Ah. <sighs> God. She sat down on the hard bunk, closing her eyes to the relentlessly white bulkheads. I don't like any of this fly. I don't like the idea that faith, not brain power, turns out to be our weapon. I'm on shakier ground than there than you or Albert would have been. She put her hand to her chest. She'd twice, been an en She'd twice had an engagement ring from her beloved, and she wore the ring on her dog tag chain. Then we went through one of the gates built by the first ones, and of course the ring vanished with everything else. Then the clave recreated it for her, and she was happier than she had been since the jump. But we jumped again, and it was gone again now. <laughs> She often put her hand where the ring used to hang, remembering it as vividly as if it were there. 
It represented Albert's offer that Arlene never had time to accept. I put my arm around her. On Earth, it had been over 300 years, 340 to be exact, adding up all our trips. But still, for us, it had been only four months since we went on without Albert and only five months since we saw Jill, whatever her last name was. They never got her last name. Didn't matter. It was all pretty damn confusing. I just couldn't seem to wrap my brain around all this relativistic bouncing around the galaxy. And we were at least another hundred years away from home, even if we started today and headed straight back. Fly, Arlene said. Let's keep a good watch tonight when we're in Let's keep a good watch tonight when we interact with these people. Maybe we'll pick up on some intel that will either blow this theory away or confirm it. I held up a fist gently. She wrapped it with her own. But the normal Arlene Sanders would have smacked it so hard a big marine fist salute that my knuckles would have been ringing for several minutes. That evening, we followed the officious jerk of a clipboard sergeant to the mess. People stopped talking when we approached and cringed as we brushed or bumped them. We were celebrities, but celebrities on a freak show. See the monsters, beware, for their F-A-I-T-H may be infectious. This time, I paid particular attention. We definitely climbed higher than the midpoint of the ship could possibly be, so Orlean was right. The ship was built for gravity always being the same direction. They must have an artificial gravity generator. The mess hall was actually a long, narrow room, almost like a corridor, with a center table along which people sat in individual chairs. With a guard holding each of my arms, the overcaptain walked us downstream right on top of the table itself. I labored not to step in anyone's plate of food or kick over any wine glasses. The pair of guards slapped me down in a central chair and locked a metal band around my waist like a seatbelt. I didn't try to tug at it. It was pretty clear I wasn't going anywhere. They plopped Arlene down in the chair directly opposite me, locking her in as well with a resounding click. The room was darker than I preferred, but after the Fred bases and Fred world, we gotten pretty used to darkness. Each person had a different set of plates and silverware, and when they ate, they hunched forward and hooked one arm around their plates, as if worried the guy on the other side was going to steal their food, a lot like a former convict my father used to employ when he worked managing at the Angerton's farm. Equal number of guys and gals. Now that I looked close, I noticed that nobody wore exactly the same uniform. Like in the United, like in the United States Army before the 20th century, everyone had his own variation on a common theme. Over Captain Toku Gavita to my immediate right wore dark blue trim around the seven pockets on the front of his uniform blouse. The woman sitting next to him had no trim, and the two guys opposite us had five and six pockets instead of seven. The farther away from the overcaptain down the table, the wilder the variation. I saw a hat that was a cross between the Revolutionary War tricorner and a Texas 10 gallon. One woman had mini wings stuck, sticking out the backs of her shoulders. The uniforms, is that the right word when they're not uniform? tended towards red and burnt umber at the extreme left of the table, where the hats flattened out and looked like berets with spikes. Jeez. All right, see ya. Have a good night, Christian. Thanks for watching. Suddenly, I noticed Sears and Roebuck at the leftmost end of the table, but they didn't look at me. They must have known we were here. Nobody could have missed our ceremonial entrance walking along the tabletop. Nobody else entered that way. People trickled in and out all throughout the meal. I began to get the idea these humans made virtually a fetish of individualism, verging on the solipistic. Each person lived in his own little world, almost unaware of anyone else except when he needed something from outside. The food was different for each person too. None of it very appetizing from my point of view. My main course tasted like boiled steak and suitcase sauce, but it was better than the Fred food, even the blue squares, and I was reasonably sure that humans couldn't have changed so much biochemically in only 200 years, so the food was probably nutritious enough to, nutritious enough to keep me and Arlene alive. Once someone dropped a knife with a clatter and a whole section of a table panicked, and when they saw it hadn't killed anyone, they returned to their meals if nothing happened. During the meal... 
Oh, Aqua Fox, thanks for the raid. Hey, everybody. And take a minute to explain what the hell's going on here. I am currently in the process of reading this Doom novel. I'm in the middle of, of a subathon with uh, 32 minutes left. But if in those 32 minutes we get four more subs, then not only do I read another chapter from this stupid, stupid novel, but the stream goes on for another hour. When I'm not reading this book, I'm playing through Doom Eternal. I want to get through the game and the two DLCs tonight if I can, this stream. But we'll see. We'll see. I'll probably just do it in another stream if I don't do it tonight. But anyway, welcome, Raiders. Welcome to literature. This chapter is almost over for now. But NB's just gifted five more subs. So there you go. So uh, after I finish this chapter, I'm going to take a quick break, probably order some food, and then get into this next chapter. Oh, yeah. Still here, Marzard. Welcome back, by the way. Welcome back from your hour-long ban. <laughs> your ritualistic ban. Oh, God. How to summarize this? Fuck. Uh try to catch people up on the story uh doom guy and his f total friend no no uh no i am like it's not really that kind of timer it counts down to a to an ending so there's really no there's really no pausing i just have to like keep track and then bump out the the timer to an arbitrary and then if i add an hour i'd have to like have that arbitrary amount always on the end Ugh, it doesn't work out anyway Doom guy and and lady, which is Vasquez from Aliens, really, have gone on multiple uh, near the speed of light travels around the galaxy to try to fight the demons. But it turns out the demons were conquered by another race before they could get there to fight them because of time dilation. So now they've gone to another planet where they ran into what seem to be evolved humans. So they're walking around, they're trying to like integrate into this advanced human society that makes no sense to them. They're just describing this future human society. The book's actually kind of been like that so far. It's almost becoming like Gulliver's Travels where Doomguy and Arlene just kind of drop into random situations and spend some time there and then get out and then drop into another random situation. Oh, okay. Now they're all having, they're having dinner in this alien, but apparently human setup. Jeez. During the meal, there was certainly a lot of intel to pick up. In fact, it seemed these humans didn't even have the concept of classified data or even personal discretion. Arlene was right. All the big bursts in creativity occurred just about 60 years ago, but there were no newbies that they reported. Sears and Roebuck didn't say a word to us. They acted as if they'd never seen us before and weren't particularly interested now. I took the hint and left them alone, hoping that they hadn't abandoned us and were just playing some game to get us to get on the human's good side. The crew of the ship, called different names by different crewmen, of course, but mostly called disrespect to death bringing deconstructionists. That's all italicized. Okay. Still seemed fascinated by our faith, me and God, Arlene and her fellow man. They inched toward us as if afraid to touch, still worrying about catching faith. You bet your ass it's infectious, I thought. I made as much contact as I could, putting my hands on people's shoulders, shaking hands. They knew what it meant, but they didn't like doing it. It meant recognizing the existence of other people. Kissing the girls? I got about as much response from the latter as you would expect. It was like kissing nuns. So Doom Guy's going around kissing like evolved babes and they're not reacting? Yeah. Yeah. All right, chapter 11. Moving right into it. Here, actually, I'm going to take a quick get up and walk around break and I'm going to get some water. I'm going to probably put in an order for a late night burger. But I'll be right back. I'll be back with more of this hideous, hideous book. See you soon. Okay. Back, 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 back. Let's get it going. Chapter 11. The crew mobbed us, asking all sorts of basic questions. Baby questions about faith and hope. What if faith... What if have faith in something and doesn't happen? Can hope for someone to suffer? 
Does it matter if faith in yourself, but not an external God? I sensed a purposefulness sweeping the room, centering first in one person, then in another, almost as if an inquisitive intelligence were flitting from brain to brain, asking a question, then moving on to the next person. First over Captain Tokugavita asked, How can still have faith in basic goodness of humans if personal experience tells otherwise? Arlene surprised me by taking that one. I'd always thought she was the cynic. It doesn't matter what some people do, or even like most people. I mean, sure, a lot of people, maybe most of them, will do bad stuff when they think no one's looking. But if you've ever known someone who won't, someone who really practices his moral system all the time, and I have known someone like that, then maybe you'll know what we're capable of. Maybe we don't always live up to it, but the basic decency and goodness is still in our design specs. We just need some technical work. Then the overcaptain's face softened. Actually studied first mission in school. Strange to meet legends in flesh. You read about it? I asked. There's a book? Two books. Many books, but two originals. Knee Deep in the Dead and Hell on Earth. Woman named Lovelace Jill wrote them and was on mission with you. Jill, so that was her name. Jill Lovelace? Oh, they, I think they did say that. Jesus, said Arlene. Talk about tilting at windmills. What? That doesn't make any sense. Huh? It was another one of those patented Arlene non sequiturs void of any and all meaning. What does that have to do with Don Quixote? Like at all. She wrote books. What? He probed us about our adventures. I was still stunned at the thought of Jill publishing a pair of books. It all seemed so recent to me, to me and Arlene, I had to keep reminding myself that Jill would have had her whole life to research and write the books. Then the sergeant leaned forward, interrupting the over-captain. I waited in vain for fireworks. Not only had they lost their notions of chain of command, but they were so individualistic they didn't seem to even have the concept of manners, respect, and politeness. Do moral thing? Because fear divine retribution? No, I said. That's a complete misreading. The nuns had discussed this exact point with us many times in catechism class. Whatever your morality, if you're just doing the right thing because you're afraid of getting caught, that's not ethics, it's extortion. Why do right thing when can secretly profit? You do the right thing because humans have an inner sense of morality, right and wrong, conscience, whatever, that tells them what is right. If you ignore it, you feel like crap because you're not living up to... to your design specs, like Arlene says. Then the light of extreme intelligence faded from the sergeant's eyes, and he sat back, listening while Arlene, Arlene gave a highly exaggerated account of our trip up to Mars. She even went into the first entry to the UAC facility and the attack by the monsters that later turned out to be genetic and cyborg constructs of the Freds. I listened closely. Strange as it may seem, I'd never heard that part of the story before. I was in the brig being guarded by two guards named, or two guys named Ron, an interesting precursor to Sears and Roebuck now that I thought about it. Then an unnamed person asked, what this moral force felt like. Then it was back to Toku Gavita to ask how we knew whether someone else we met was moral and so on. A whole damned theology les lesson. The particular questioner changed, but the voice was so similar, I began to get suspicious. Not voice as in the sound of it as coming from their throats. I mean the way they strung the words together, diction, whatever that's called, and the intelligence behind the questions. Most of the time, these guys were conceited, social atomist trogs, except when one would lean forward, cut off whoever was speaking, and ask the question. I decided early in the evening on 99% honesty. I only lie when I see a clear-cut advantage to it, and I try to keep my lies as close to the truth as possible. That way I don't get confused. In this case, my only lie was to imply that all humans had some sort of faith back in our time. Arlene took her cue from me, playing it safe until she figured out what I was pulling on them. 
than backing me up. It was a fascinating evening and I didn't even care about the lousy food. They hustled us back to the cell and dumped us. We feigned sleep until we were fairly sure the overt obvious guards were gone. If they got the room wired, Arlene said in my ear pretending to be romantic, we're already screwed. What? Why would she pre be pretending to be romantic? Uh. I grunted and got up. Let's assume they don't. But don't plot any plots out loud, just in case. Arlene sat up, looked around, and gave a little gasp of astonishment. Why, look at the terminal. Or where it used to be, I mean. In place of the magic keyboard that projected 3D images was a simple translucent green sphere like a crystal ball. Flickers of electrical impulses kissed the inside surface. We walked over and stared down at it. Cripes, said my Lance Corporal. What in the hell are we supposed to do with this? I could understand them taking away our computer, I said. But they went to some trouble to put this here. Ah, an intelligence test? We poked at it, prodded at it, even kicked it. An hour later, we were hot and sweaty, but no closer to figuring out what we were supposed to do with a glowing green bowling ball glued to the floor. Then Arlene had one of her serendipitous strokes of unconscious genius. She leaned over and snarled at the thing. Why the hell don't you say something? Because I haven't been asked a question, it answered reasonably enough. We jumped back. Then I approached cautiously. Did the humans who own this ship put you here? How well, should I know? It asked. We weren't here when I was activated. You were the first people I've seen. What's your name? Asked Arlene. I have no name. What should we call you? Address me directly, second person. I looked at Arlene and grinned. My turn, as I recall. Your turn for what? Oh, she rolled her eyes. Go for it, fly. When we first ran into the Freds, their demon-shaped machines, actually the ones they sent for the invasion, we took turns naming the critters as we ran across them. I wasn't sure whose turn it really was, but I had a good name in mind. I christened the Nine Pin, I said. Arlene snorted, and Nine Pin didn't respond. Nine Pin, are there any more like you? Others like me, not like me, it answered cryptically. I am prototype, far advanced over other systems on ship or on other ships. Oh, it's Vega, right? When were you created? Asked my comrade. Was first activated 4 hours 17 minutes ago. Construction time 6 hours 11 minutes. Design first logged into ship system 38 minutes before construction began. You uh, say you're far advanced over the other ship systems? I asked. Aren't there any prototypes, intermediate steps, trial runs? No. Nothing? They just stru jump straight to you from that terminal you used to have here to you? Yes, unless secret experiments unlogged. What are the odds of that? Arlena asked. Infinitesimal! Less than 0.00001% probability! Arlene, looked, Arlene and I looked at each other. Kiddo, I said. This goes too far. This is exactly the sort of thing we associate with the newbies. I've been thinking. You know you're Edgar Allan Poe. What's the best place to hide something? In plain view, she said, drawing her red eyebrows together and frowning. What could be plainer than looking right at these humans? Why, we already decided that they really were humans, not newbies in disguise. I smiled as she started to catch on. Yes, those... Are humans, A.S., but what's inside them? Now her brow shot up towards her hairline. You're saying the newbies have implanted themselves inside the humans? What? It's a possibility, right? They evolve smaller and smaller, and eventually they wriggle into their host to... What did the newbies say? To fix them. Maybe they figured we were closer to proper functioning than any of the other races in the galaxy because our rate of technological and social evolution... It's so much closer to the newbies. <laughs> Punk Rock Devil Doc, thank you for the sub. Uh, nine Pin, I said. Have you been following our conversation? Do you know who the newbies are? Yes and no. I scratched my head and looked at Arlene, who grinned. 
You ask two questions. Fly, yes to the first, no to the second. Ninepin, are there any other species on this ship besides human? Yes, two. Arlene spoke up. It's one of those two species, a paired group of bilaterally symmetric bipedal creatures with short legs and pointy heads. Yes, others call them Clave. Sears and Roebuck, Arlene muttered. I licked my lips. Can you describe the third species? No. Call that species the newbies. Where are the newbies right now? On the ship. Yes, but where on the ship? Everywhere. I looked around. My stomach opened up, like when you reach the top of the big hill on a roller coaster. Everywhere, meaning what? In this room? Yes. In you? Yes. I hesitated. I didn't really want to know the obvious next question, but the mission came before my squeamishness. In me and Arlene. A slight hesitation. Not likely. Cannot examine to make certain. I exhaled, not even realize I was holding my breath until I let it out. How about in the other humans, Arlene asked. Yes, Nine Pid said nonchalantly. Microscopic, I guessed. Yes, but cannot determine the exact size without direct examination or dissection. I sat down next to the bowling ball. Jesus, I swore. They do evolve pretty quickly. It was an inane comment. I just thought I had to say something. Oh, Pro Gamer 13, thanks for the sub. They're even a nine pin, said my Lance. Should we trust him? Well, the newbies haven't shown any technology, or the newbies haven't shown any tendency towards secrecy or disinformation. All that non authorized PERS stuff was probably stuck in by the humans. I don't think we have a choice. She sat next to me, stretching out her hard muscled legs, ugh, and leaning forward to loosen the tendons in her knees and ankles. Next question, Sarge. How are we going to examine somebody here to find these newbies? I looked at her dead serious. Why don't we just ask permission? You're joking. You have a better plan? Excuse me, Overcaptain, but I was really interested in the stitch work on your uniform. You mind laying here under this microscope so I can examine it more closely? <sighs> Arlene thought for a long time but was unable to come up with a sneaky, devious way to get one of the crew to submit to an examination. Three hours later, we decided to give my own plan a try. Ninepin, can you tap into the ship's communication systems, whatever it is? I asked. It's subchronal messaging network, yes, can tap into. Arlene, what sort of message will we send the overcaptain running back here? Or, what sort of message will send the overcaptain running back here? I don't want to let him know about Ninepin just yet. And in case they don't realize he's helping us. And that's an interesting question. Why is he helping us? She thought for a moment, leaning back, her breasts stretching the fabric of her uniform blouse. It's been a grip of pages since the author has explicitly noticed her breasts for no reason. I suppose it's been a while. <laughs> nice. Yeah, okay. I started having very unmilitary thoughts. It had been a long time since I held a woman in my arms. I turned away to stifle the images, or at least convert them to someone else, someone safe, like Midge Garadon or Jane Mansfield. Tell him to send the message that the prisoners are escaping. If these guys really evolve as fast as they seem, he probably won't even know what security systems are in place these days anyway. Do it, Ninepin, I commanded. Three minutes, eleven seconds later. Now that was some valuable intel. The overcaptain and two guards came running up with weird weapons out. They looked pretty put out when they saw me sitting on the floor playing solitaire in with playing solitaire with my emergency deck and Arlene asleep on the bunk. His emergency deck of cards? How does he have a deck of cards? I wanna know. After everything they've been through, he has a deck of normal human playing cards? Did he keister it this whole time? Come on. What is going on here? Toku Gavita shouted. What? 
are escaping. Where? The overcaptain suddenly turned into a logic man again, like a light switch. And now we knew why. That was when the newbies that infected his body took over. Security system reported prisoners escaping. When? C system was an error. We'll return to rest. Why? Why what? Why do you have to return to your nap? I asked. Don't you want to stay in chat a while now that you woke up Arlene? On cue, AS blinked and flopped her arms around. The sleeper awakes. She sat up yawning. Even though it was fake, it made me yawn too. Seeing someone yawn always has the effect on me. This time it made the illusion that much better. Over Captain to Toku Kavita pondered for a moment, his dark brown eyes flickering back and forth from me to Arlene. I noticed with relief that he never glanced down at Ninepin and probably didn't even notice him. We'll stay, Toku Kavita decided. Arlene tossed in her two cents. But send those gorillas away, they give me the creeps. Toku Kavita squinted and cocked his head, evidently not understanding the word creeps. Arlene waited a beat. When it was obvious he wasn't sending them away, she tried again. They're always looking at me in a, you know, sexual way. And I have to get undressed to wash my shirt. I don't want them to see me naked. She's got a thing about her privacy, I explained. Ah, 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 privacy. The overcaptain nodded, making a fetish of individualism as they did. Privacy was a concept he understood well. He gestured the two apes away. They did not leave immediately, however. They moved close and whispered among each other, evidently discussing whether they were going to obey the order. Yeesh, I was glad I didn't have them in my platoon. We wouldn't have lasted five minutes in Kefiristan or... Ke... 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 Kefiristan or Marvin or Duck. Uh. Oh god. We wouldn't have lasted five minutes in Kefiristan if Marvin or Duck had to conference before they decided to do what the gunny ordered. At last, the goons reluctantly decided that this time they would go ahead and obey their superior officer. They shuffled off with many a backwards glance, probably hoping to see Arlene undressing. Gross. As soon as they were gone, she unabashedly stripped to the waist and set about washing her jacket and shirt in the sink, a move I heartily endorsed even if we hadn't needed it to get rid of the backup. As she must have expected, even while Toku Gavita talked to me, he wasted 75% of his attention on the beautiful redhead with her bare chest, which allowed me to maneuver around behind him without his noticing it. An alien infested, 200 years evolved military commander is getting distracted by some titties. This is awesome. I had seen her nakeder than that many a time. I was able to concentrate on the upcoming fight. It took longer than I thought. I grabbed Toku Kavita in a wrestling hold from behind, but the slippery, slippery little devil pulled some move I recognized as traditional judo and slipped my hold. I managed to tag him in the knee with the heel of my palm, though. Wait, what? What did you do with your palm in the knee? I cha Johnny karate chopping the dude in the knee. Did <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. What kind of whatever? All right, karate chopped him in the knee. <laughs> it's like the discombobulate from uh from uh Sherlock Holmes. He gave him the old discombobulate. All right. He went down hard, starting to yell and scream in a terror that he didn't want to die. He sounded like a sinner who'd suddenly realized that death means hell for him. Arlene grabbed him from behind, pressing her forearm against his windpipe and shutting off the scream before it leaked out. But the bastard fell backward on her, taking her down and laying on top of her. Then he lashed out with his feet and caught me right in the jewels. Dude, guy just got kicked in the balls. Hell yeah. The pain was excruciating. It was almost worse than when I was getting shot up, shot up down on the planet's surface. But when you're in country, the first thing you learn is to suck it up and not let the pain stop you. It's better to be hurting than dying. 
I clenched my teeth and somehow forced out of my head the ability to comprehend agony. How the hell is this guy fighting so effectively while in such terror? He seems supernaturally strong and fast. They must feel this kind of terror so often anytime something threatens their life, they just learn to live with it. I hooked one leg of his with my arm, but I missed the other. It didn't miss me. Koku Toku Kavita kicked his knee up and around, catching me just below the left eye. I swear to God, I actually saw fireflies orbiting my head. I thought the move was pure kickboxing. This guy was the bomb. With a capital B, the bomb. But he was starting to weaken from lack of oxygen. I'd kept him so busy, kicking his foot with my groin, beating on his knee with my face, that he didn't have time or muscle to break Arlene's chokehold. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. <laughs> Alright, now turning blue, he had both hands under her wrist, was trying to wrench it free, but she caught her fist in the other hand and pulled it as tight as she could. While they danced their little pavane, I caught his other leg and rolled on top of him. Both of us were atop Arlene, and under other circumstances, she would have loved being naked underneath two big, beefy guys. Once I had the overcaptain pinned, I grabbed his hands and yanked them off Arlene's arm, and the fight was over. A minute and a half later, AS figured he was definitely out, not just faking, and she let him go. I checked him carefully. He was breathing again, and his color was coming back. I've been worried sometimes a chokehold can actually crush a man's windpipe, killing him. No wonder he was frightened. We set him upright and I tied his hands and feet with my bootlaces. We thought about gagging him, but if his screams of mortal terror didn't attract anyone, his buddies were all deaf or they didn't care. Then we waited for him to come around. Oh, Meek Shonos. Thank you very much for the sub. It was time to grab the bull by the tail and look the facts square in the face. Time to see how much he really knew about the aliens he had been pursuing and if he had now the aliens he'd been pursuing and now caught the way you'd catch a flu virus. All right. I'm new to Doom and want to make YouTube and Twitch content out of it. Do you have any advice on how to start doing this? Huh. I guess the easiest way to start if you really have no idea what to do is just imitate what you like. Copy it. Do that thing. Uh, and then if you do it for a long time, over time, it'll eventually morph into something that is uniquely yours just because you change it a little bit over time without noticing it. Or in the process of doing that, you'll come up with ideas for other things to do. So that would be my advice. Find something you like. Make that. Try to make it. I think you'll find that making it, you'll learn a lot. I'm trying to imitate it. Anyway, all right. right, I'm. Let's see here. I think my food is here. Maybe? Oh, almost. All right. Let's get back to Doom. Well, actually, I need to take a restroom break. Then we're going to get back to Doom Eternal until my burger gets here. So be right back. Thank you for watching so far. Hey. It's time to re-enter the world of Doom. Chapter 12. <clears throat> okay. There's a bowling ball. It's telling them all the lore. They named it Nine Pin. That's what we gotta know leading into this chapter. Nine Pin, what sensory apparatus do you have here? Can you do a microscopic examination of over Captain Toku Gavita? I asked. Cannot said the green glowing sphere. Crap, muttered Arlene, speaking for both of us. All right, you useless bowling ball. Where is the nearest lab on the ship with a microscope? And what did I have to eat? Overnight oats that I had sitting in the fridge for two overnights. So we'll see if it burns a hole in my stomach. And then I had like a tiny bag of uh, Cheetos puffs. So very exciting. I feel like I... <coughs> Excuse me. I feel like I wanted something bad. Ah, uh, welcome back to Ville. A 3D diagram appeared floating in the air between us. A cabin flashed red and a labeled arrow pointing 
at it read R here. A couple of hundred meters for Ard and a deck down, another cabin flashed, green this time. The best route between the two locations was marked in yellow brick. Evidently, Ninepit had a sense of history and a sense of humor. Raylene tried to pick him up, but had no better luck than I. Tokuvita started moaning, still not fully conscious. Just as I crept forward and tried the door, it opened. The idiot must have assumed he could handle us. Maybe he was so fixated on individuality that it never occurred to him that Arlene and, Arlene and I might cooperate and deck him. Did the book really say for Ard? Yes. It says F-O-R apostrophe A-R-D. For Ard. It keeps saying that. It said it on the last ship, and I thought when that ship was destroyed and crashed into this planet, that we wouldn't have to hear it anymore. But then they immediately went to another ship, where he keeps saying it. <clears throat> so I get to keep reading it. <sighs> deck him. Uh, okay. Might never occur to him that Arlene and I might cooperate and deck him when either one of us alone would have had his or her butt kicked. Shutting the door, I returned and searched Tokugavita. Toku I found a device in a boot draw that looked suspiciously like a weapon. Ninepin told me how to set it to deliver electricity in high enough amperage to incapacitate a normal human for a few minutes. Arlene, I explained. I can't just bring myself to start blowing away humans. Not now. Not when I know we're what we're really up against in the war of galactic schools of criticism. Yeah, I know what you mean, Sarge. She brushed a wet streak of hair from her face. Her hair turned rust-colored when it was soaked. I wish we had phasers or something. I'm really starting to get homesick. I want... I want to see... You want to see where Albert lived and what happened to him? She smiled and nodded. I have a thought, kiddo. Turning to the ball, I asked, Do you have any records on the life of P Albert Galatin? I have several, he said. Presume what Galatin Albert, who accompanied you on expedition. Highlights follow. Dates supplied upon request. Galatin returned to Earth after wounded in assault on Fred Base. Remained in United States Marine Corps for two years until disbanded in favor of People's Democratic Defense Forces. Honorable discharge, promotion to gunnery sergeant, awarded hero of United Earth People. Jeez, I mumbled. The guy would have left too. Arlene grunted. She was more interested in Nine Pins information than my smart-ass comments. <clears throat> Fred still controlled most land assets. Banned education, literacy, technological development among humans under purview. Galatin attended hedge school, studied biophysics, specifically cryogenics and suspension techniques. Developed techniques for suspending life process for long periods. Spent last 38 years of life in Salt Lake Grand researching life stasis. I really hope that we find his head in a jar and he gets on like a mech body or something. <laughs> Oh my god, she said. He was trying to figure out how to wait for me. I got a chill thinking about it. It was creepy hearing about the futile efforts of a man to hang on for the, for the hundreds of years it would take for his beloved to return to him. A love that would last until the stars grew cold. I presumed it was futile. Otherwise, the bowling ball would have told us he was still alive. Galatin contributed work on life stasis, published first theoretical description of hypothetical processes effect on neural tissue, award of Nobel Prize transmitted on sneaker net. What? I've only ever heard that word from specifically dudes that worked in tech in the 90s. Sneaker net. <clears throat> it's what they call, like, the real life. Like, walking around and handing things to people. It's sneaker net. You can send somebody files on sneaker net. It basically means you're handing them, like, printouts and stuff. I don't know what that means in, in the book, though. Ugh. <sighs> 
All right, sneaker net. Clandestine encrypted network founded by Galatin, Albert, and six other scientists. Okay. Sneaker net. Clandestine encrypted network founded by Galatin, Albert, and six other scientists tracked by scientists, engineers, military, and political leaders. Several million others. Sidebar. Fred's tried repeatedly to take down sneaker net for 74 years until Fred's defeated Driven from planet, never succeeded in taking down entire net, eventually played role in defeat. Great. Go, Albert, go, whispered Arlene, eyes closed, as if the resistance were still ongoing instead of a part of history. A tear rolled down her cheek. I looked away, a bit embarrassed. Yeah, you're jealous, dog. Galatin Albert pushed... Published 20 articles on SneakerNet describing still uninvented life stasis system. Died in 132nd year of life. Year 31 PGL Salt Lake grad. Currently interred in rebuilt tabernacle of people's faith of Latter-day Saints. PGL, I acquired. People's glorious liberation. Over Captain Tokugavita answered. <clears throat> ah, sorry, somebody else is talking now. People's glorious liberation. Over Captain Tokugavita answered. <sighs> we all jumped. The human had come around while we listened to Albert's life story and none of us had noticed. Could have told you Gallatin's bio, continued the over captain. Well known to whole community of persons. Studied in school, hero of people, body displayed in hall of heroes. We heard, I said. He got a medal. Then he's dead, said my lance, sitting hard on the bunk. She placed her hands on her knees and bowed her head. I did the same, keeping an eye on Toku Govita. After one full minute, another skill we learned... Another skill we learned in Paris Island? Keeping an accurate internal clock, she rose, hard and determined. Looking back... Or, she looked sad, but relieved. Finding out Albert really and truly was dead was a killing blow, but at least now she knew. No more guessing. Gallatin Albert dead, Nine Pit agreed. Death announced by Lovelace Jill in 30, year 31 PGL. And life stasis? She asked. Prototype on 37 PGL. Full implementation, 50 PGL. Arlene stared at me, a hopeless, frustrated mask of anger on her face. Six years. Six years, and he could have preserved himself at least for the 13 it took before the full implementation was developed. I didn't know what to say, so I said something anyway. Jesus, what a dirty trick. It must have been good words. Arlene relaxed, allowing every emotion she had felt for Albert to wash across her face. Intrigue, exasperation, sexual thrill, love, concern, irritation, and love again. The emotion that struck when others trickled away. She rose light on her feet. I want to get back there, she said. Put a flower or something on his grave. That's what you do, isn't it? Fly, can you get a priest or something to bless Albert's soul so we won't end up in spiritual Okinawa? What? Spiritual Okinawa. <coughs> Uh, Flemmy. Okinawa is what we call Marine Corps hell. Is it? Should it be? Uh. I smiled, but it wasn't a friendly grin, more like a baring my teeth. You put your foot in the middle of my own fear, A.S. If there is no more faith back on Earth, are there any more priests? How am I going to confess ever again? I shut up quick. I didn't want to spell out the full awful truth I had just realized. I was going to die unshriven. If anyone were going to hell, it would be I, a Catholic boy who dies with unconfessed sins on his soul. Come on, you ugly baboon. I said, yanking Togavita to his feet. Let's go see what germs you picked up recently. I opened the door 
and slid out, pulling the overcaptain behind me. Arlene took the rear, holding the back of his shirt and assuring him in soft tones that she could punch him in the back of the neck and break his spine before he got two steps away from her. I was just starting to regret having to leave Ninepin behind, hoping he would be there when we got back, when I stopped too suddenly and felt a thump against my ankle. I looked down, and lo and behold, there was our green glowing bo bowling ball. He rolled along happily right underfoot, getting in the way and thumping down the ladderways like a real ball. I smiled. This was too ridiculous. We had to traverse more than the 200 meters of corridor because we had to track and backtrack. Whenever we got a little lost, not that Marine Corps recons ever really got lost, Ninepin projected a map in the air. Gods know, gods no, God, of course, God knows how he did it. It was 200 years ahead of me. I didn't even know how television worked. Uh, doom guy. We entered a passageway that was long and narrow, like the inside of a tube. Halfway down it, a crewman stepped right in front of us. I was about to bash him or zap him when I realized he wasn't even looking at us. He turned his back to us, whistling some, something tuneless and ghastly and hacking at some electrical circuits. The guy couldn't care less that we were escaping right behind him. Good thing. I'd never seen a bigger man. Probably 7 foot, 140 kilogram black guy with... I ain't lying, straight blonde hair that fell to mid-back. Bro, is this gonna get weird, man? Are you gonna get weird about this shit? You're on an alien craft. Just roll with it. It doesn't have to be weird, doom guy. You don't have to be so fucking weird. Ah, <sighs> uh, anyway, please, dear, dear God, don't get worse than this. He wore a sparkly variation on the uniform that made him look like a Mexican matador. Even his hat had those two bumps on the side. I couldn't resist saying ole as we passed, but he didn't respond. We scurried along the tube, then dropped down an access hatch into pitch blackness. I fell heavily, and my foot slipped out from under me on a pool of oil. I don't know where from. I limped forward. Nine pin glowed brighter to cast some light and bounced down beside me, getting a big juicy oil smear all over one brightly lit face, which didn't seem to bother him. I wished I still had my pack. I had a nice flash that would have brightened things up a bit more than Nine Pin could. I felt my way along, avoiding overhangs that would have cracked my skull open, and I only stumbled over a seam in the metal grating once. Arlene cursed and swore behind me. She had terrible night vision. However bad it was for me, it was probably worse for my lance. I saw a light overhead, just a dim red glow. I hunched over to avoid the overhead and scurried forward, like a locomotive for a two-car train. I saw the light came from around a corner. I slid to my right and found myself nose to nose with another crewman. Unfortunately, this one happened to be one of the two guards that Toku Gavita had originally brought with him. What wonderful luck! The overcaptain was a fast mother, fast thinking and damn quick on his feet. He saw who it was the same time I did, but instead of gawking, he charged me, hitting me in the kidneys and body slamming me forward. Fortunately, the, gar the guard was a dull-witted imbecile. The newbies weren't controlling him at that moment. He stared stupidly, give him another five seconds and he would have snapped out of it, but I wasn't in a charitable mood. I planted my feet, stopping my forward progress, then I leaned back into the staggered or I leaned back and staggered into Toku Gavita. Superior weight and leg power drove the overcaptain back, opening up a good ten meters between us and the guard. Now the soldier woke up and started to respond, trying to dominate the situation, but he was too late. I raised my little zap gun, now that I had the range, and squeezed off a loud, crackling shot. The guard yelled, Hoo! or something, and fell to his knees, not even halfway across the gap to me. He rolled over to one side, body convulsing, eyes rolled up, showing me just the whites, which were burning lava in the red light tubes. Move out, I snarled, stepping over his prostrate figure. Ugh. 
Arlene viciously shoved the panicky Toku Gavita forward, rabbit punching him in the gut a couple of times to teach him a lesson. I've been on the receiving end of a lot of Corporal Sanders beatings during training in Fox Company's bi-monthly boxing matches. I felt his pain. This is very descriptive. Yes, that's one thing that it is. It is descriptive. <clears throat> we dropped down the last ladder way and naturally Ninepin found it absolutely necessary to drop down the hatch directly onto my foot. I bit off a yell of pain, clenching my teeth until I could walk again. Then I waddled down the final passageway, dragging my prisoner. The lab was electronically locked, but a zap from the buzz gun took care of that problem. <clears throat> We entered our and stared around at the maze of machinery, hoping our pet computer knew what the hell to do with it all. He didn't. We hoisted Toku Kavita up to an examination table, and now he was intensely curious about what the hell we were doing. Man, my voice is starting to change. <coughs> I don't know what happened. Like in the last. <coughs> in the last 15 minutes, a lot of phlegm has started. Building up. Oh, is this knee deep in the dead? No. This is Endgame, the fourth book. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of analogies. Yeah, the writer likes doing that. <clears throat> ah, damn. There. It just gets so cloudy in there. Damn. Okay. Okay. We entered and stared at the maze of machinery, hoping our pet computer knew what to, the hell to do with it all. He didn't. <clears throat> we hosted... God. We hosted Toku Gavita up onto an examination table, and now he was intensely curious about what the hell we were doing. I held him down, imagining the little newbie viruses swarming all over him, over my arms, down my throat and lungs. I shuddered, but we just had to know. Arlene made a circuit of the room, reading labels on machines. Vitsinmon, vital signs, no good. Uh, Autosurg, Lays, Clavesep. Hey, Fly, does this thing separate the two binaries of a clave pair? Search me, Arlene. Better yet, keep reading the damned labels. There's got to be a microbiological auto lab somewhere around here. Oh, Tyra Gandio, thank you for the sub. Mike Lab? Asked the over-captain. I'd been thinking of him as our captive for so long that I forgot he was a real person with real concerns. Have something? Am sick? He sounded horrified and jerked against my restraining hold. You might have picked up a bug, I said non-committally. Too much chalance. He panicked, his face turned white, his strength doubled as he frantically tried to buck me off him. I leaned down with all my weight, crushing him to the cushion, crushing him to the cushiony examination table. Hold still, damn you. You want me to clock you upside the head? If that's the only way I can keep you here. <clears throat> yes, welcome. Reading uh, the most recent chapter from Doom Endgame, the fourth novel. Been a ride so far. Good God. At the warning note in my voice, he quieted instantly, but I could feel his heart pounding through my forearm as I held him down. Am I going to die? To die? To die? Not that kind of bug, I growled. You've been hunting the newbies, the aliens that attacked us, the ones that wiped out the Freds. Well, we figure that's how, that's where they went. We figure that's where they went, yeah. Where? How? Van Clyburn, Electro Stim, Arlene Red, Posimit, Posaline, Pos Polar. The aliens, the ones that evolve real fast. We think they've evolved into microscopic form and they're infecting you. All of you. That's why you're sometimes twice as smart as normal. How humans built this ship and other stuff. 
On me? Over Captain Toku Gavita slowly stared down the length of his body. Every muscle tense and trembling. I don't know what he was looking for. If the newbies were large enough to be visible, they'd have been spotted a long time ago. We have to get you under the... What did you call it? My lab is there, he said, looking at the last machine in the semicircle surrounding the tables. Arlene, I shouted, nodding at the identified device. She ran there immediately. My lab, Moleculab, this is it, Fly. Drag it over here. Toku, how do we hook this thing up? We want to examine your tissue to see if they've infected you. He squirmed. Let up, let up. Can take sample myself, examine. Arlene. She gritted her teeth and pulled her lips tight. Jeez, Fly, it's your call. You're the guy with three stripes in your sleeve. Personally, I'd sooner trust a Fred. Man, burned. I slowly relaxed my grip on Toku Gavita. He struggled away from me and sat up. He turned back to look at me, trying to see if I were going to do anything. When I didn't move, he slid to the ground and tried to stand, but his knees were so weak he fell to a squat on the deck. The overcaptain forced himself up right and leaned on the mic lab just as Arlene wheeled it over. He stared at the mass of buttons, obviously unfamiliar with the system. Are you a medical- oh, are you a medical officer? I asked. Toku Gavita shook his head slightly. His pale hand hesitated over the various touchscreen buttons, then finally landed on one marked sample. He inserted his hand into a small shelf that looked like the covered tray that a co- oh, yeah. He inserted his hand into a small shelf that looked like the covered tray that a coffee comes out of in a vending machine. Yeah, that's doing nothing for me. A light flashed and he convulsively jerked his hand away. A small nick was gouged from the heel of his thumb and it bled nicely for a few minutes. You got some way to project the image where we can see it? Asked Darlene. Over, cap Over Captain Toku Gavita just stared at her uncomprehendingly. He seemed more interested in his bleeding hand. Maybe he fretted he was going to bleed to death. It was so weird. When in the slightest danger, they totally freaked. Not just Toku Gavita, but <laughs> Jose Paze when I had the knife to his throat. And even the clowns at the dinner table when a knife flopped into the air. When they saw an injury was not going to lead to death, the one thing they could never fix being human, they shut off the fear like an electrical circuit. Only one explanation I could see. They had somehow come to believe that nothing existed except the material world. The death completely ended everything. No soul, no spirit, no spiritual community higher than lumpen materialism. And maybe that was why they were so dad blammed individualistic dad blammed individualistic holy cow with nothing outside themselves why should they bother believing in society or even their own community so anomie the lack well, lack of higher sense of morality of faith led directly to their ridiculous atomism. If you don't have faith in anything, not even the survival of your own species, then why not every man for himself? Women and children overboard, I'm taking the lifeboat. I realized something. Maybe it was that very lack of faith caused by the discovery that we're, o we're the only race in the galaxy that isn't crudely immortal, that allowed the damn newbies to somehow infest the humans in the first place. The newbies were so frightened of our core faith, it acted like a vaccine against them. So maybe Arlene and I were immune. I shook my head. Too deep for me. I leaned over and stared at the machine myself. It's, it was squat with a video touch panel, like a slot machine. Most of the labels were incomprehensible. Only one... Or one read only DXTXMX, but in the lower left corner was an orange button labeled Viz. On blind faith, I pressed it. Somebody up there, etc. A hunk of cheese suddenly appeared, floating in front of our faces. 
I jumped back, then realized it was a color 3D image of the Nick taken out of Tokugavita's hand, magnified thousands of times. The button below Viz was labeled plus mag minus, so I started pressing the plus and the magnification increased to the outer, the outer edges of the image vanishing to keep it the same overall size. There was probably some way to rotate it, but I hadn't a clue. Eventually, just standing there holding my finger on the plus side of the touch button, the magnification grew so large that we could make out the tiny dots of individual cells. As it got larger, we saw numerous tiny critters. Obviously, his flesh was covered with bacteria, all flesh is, but we were looking for something that would jump out as wrong or alien. Not that that was a given, maybe the newbies evolved into microbes that looked just like everything else. But it was all we had to go on. But the people who've never seen cells in their lives in an alien microscope are trying to find the alien. All right. Several minutes passed and I was still standing there like a dummy, magnifying by holding my numb fingers one by one against the screen. At last, within the individual cell, I started to see chromosomes, but nothing that looked really alien. Deeper and deeper we went, like that old ride that used to be at Disneyland in California when I was a kid. Oh, Jules! His name is Jules. You got a sub from Crab Foam, huh? That's awesome. I know Crab Foam was here pretty recently. I don't know if they might have gone to sleep, but... But yeah, we all remember that one ride in Disneyland, right? That one? That one that goes down? When I was a kid? <laughs> like that one that I used to ride? It's so stupid. The writers just fucking say it whatever they want. It's like, it's funny, all this talk about individualism, because the writer's not considering the reader really at all. Just kind of like rambling. How am I supposed to know what you wrote? As a kid, jeez. Oh. At last, I saw the spiral shades of what must be DNA or RNA or something. So what happened to the color? I mused. Why is it so dark? At this magnification, Arlene said, you can't use visible light to see things. When you get down to individual atoms, you essentially fire electrons at it and look at silhouettes. Nothing else has small enough wavelength to even notice events on the angstrom level. Oh, of course. Actually, I didn't have a clue what she just said. But I caught the important point. The machine wasn't broken. It was doing the best it could for physics reasons. When I blew up the image large enough to see the individual strands of DNA, I finally found what I was looking for. A whole series of elaborate ring-shaped triple helixes. No way was a three-strand helix natural to a human body. I had found my newbies, and my mouth was so dry I couldn't even work up enough spit to swallow. They, there they were, small as life, just not microscopic, but molecule size. And those tiny things were the enemy, controlling the overcaptain's thoughts and actions wherever they chose to... Controlling the overcaptain's thoughts and actions whenever they chose to override his own will. How in God's name were we supposed to fight something that could pass right through a bullet without noticing anything but vast amounts of empty space? I would have been odd, but I was too busy being scared. And thus since chapter 12. So now, the real demons are midi-calorians. Fucking fantastic. Great. The one thing I always said Doom needed was microscopic demons. <laughs>